Section 19 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by Various Authors. Section 19. Selected Excerpts by Charles Farrar Brown, Artemis Ward, 1834-1867, through 1867, by Charles F. Johnson. Charles Farrar Brown, better known to the public of thirty years ago, under his pen name of Artemis Ward, was born in the little village of Waterford, Maine, on the twenty-sixth day of April, 1834. Waterford is a quiet village of about seven hundred inhabitants, lying among the foothills of the White Mountains. When Brown was a child, it was a station on the western stage route, and an important depot for lumbermen's supplies. Since the extension of railroads northerly and westerly from the seaboard, it has, however, shared the fate of many New England villages in being left on one side of the main currents of commercial activity, and gradually assuming a character of repose and leisure, in many regards more attractive than the life and bustle of earlier days. Many persons are still living there who remember the humorist as a quaint and tricksy boy, alternating between laughter and preternatural gravity, and of a surprising ingenuity in devising odd practical jokes in which good nature so far prevailed that even the victims were too much amused to be very angry. On both sides he came from original New England stock, and although he was proud of his descent from a very ancient English family, in deference to whom he wrote his name with the final E, he felt greater pride in his American ancestors, and always said that they were genuine and primitive Yankees, people of intelligence, activity, and integrity in business, but entirely unaffected by new-fangled ideas. It is interesting to notice that Brown's humor was hereditary on the paternal side, his father especially being noted for his quaint sayings and harmless eccentricities. His cousin Daniel, many years later, bore a strong resemblance to what Charles had been, and he too possessed a kindred, humorous faculty and told the story in much the same solemn manner, bringing out the point as if it were something entirely irrelevant and unimportant, and casually remembered. The subject of this sketch, however, was the only member of the family in whom a love for the droll and incongruous was a controlling disposition. As is frequently the case, a family trait was intensified in one individual to the point where talent passes over into genius. On his mother's side, too, Brown was a thoroughbred New Englander. His maternal grandfather, Mr. Calvin Farrar, was a man of influence in town and state, and was able to send two of his sons to Bowdoin College. I have mentioned Brown's parentage, because his humor is so essentially American. Whether this consists in a peculiar gravity in the humorous attitude towards the subject, rather than playfulness, or in a tendency to exaggerated statement, or in a broad humanitarian standpoint, or in a certain flavor given by a blending of all these, it is very difficult to decide. Probably the peculiar standpoint is the distinguishing note, and American humor is a product of democracy. 
humor is as difficult of definition as is poetry it is an intimate quality of the mind which predisposes a man to look for remote and unreal analogies and to present them gravely as if they were valid it sees that many of the objects valued by men are illusions and it expresses this conviction by assuming that other manifest trifles are important it is the deadly enemy of sentimentality and affectation for its vision is clear although it turns everything topsy-turvy in sport its world is not a chaos nor a child's playground for humor is based on keen perception of truth there is no method except the highest poetic treatment which reveals so distinctly the falsehoods and hypocrisies of the social and economic order as the reductio ad absurdum of humor for all human institutions have their ridiculous sides which astonish and amuse us when pointed out but from viewing which we suddenly become aware of relative values before misunderstood but just as poetry may degenerate into a musical collection of words and painting into a decorative association of colors so humor may degenerate into the merely comic or amusing the laugh which true humor arouses is not far removed from tears humor indeed is not always associated with kindliness for we have the sardonic humor of carlyle and the savage humor of swift but it is naturally dissociated from egotism and is never more attractive than when as in the case of charles lamb and oliver goldsmith it is based on a loving and generous interest in humanity humor must rest on a broad human foundation and cannot be narrowed to the notions of a certain class but in most english humor as indeed in all english literature except the very highest the social class to which the writer does not belong is regarded ab extra in punch for instance not only are servants always given a conventional set of features but they are given conventional minds and the jokes are based on a hypothetical conception of personality dickens was a great humorist and understood the nature of the poor because he had been one of them but his gentlemen and ladies are lay figures thackeray's studies of the flunky are capital but he studies him qua flunky as a naturalist might study an animal and hardly ranks him subspecie humanitatis but to the american humorist all men are primarily men the waiter and the prince are equally ridiculous to him because in each he finds similar incongruities between the man and his surroundings but in england there is a deep impassable gulf between the man at the table and the man behind his chair this democratic independence of external and adventitious circumstance sometimes gives a tone of irreverence to american persiflage and the temporary character of class distinctions in america undoubtedly diminishes the amount of literary material in sight but when as in the case of brown and clemens there is in the humorist's mind a basis of reverence for things and persons that are really reverend it gives a breath and freedom to the humorous conception that is distinctively american we put clemens and brown in the same line because in reading a page of either we feel at once the american touch brown of course is not to be compared to clemens in affluence or in range in depicting humorous character types but it must be remembered that clemens has lived thirty active years longer than his predecessor did 
neither has written a line that he would wish to blot for its foul suggestion, or because it ridiculed things that were lovely and of good report. Both were educated in journalism, and came into direct contact with the strenuous and realistic life of labor. And to repeat, though one was born and bred west of the Mississippi, and the other far down east, both are distinctly American. Had either been born and passed his childhood outside our magic line, this resemblance would not have existed. And yet we cannot say precisely wherein this likeness lies, nor what caused it. So deep, so subtle, so pervading is the influence of nationality. But their original expressions of the American humorous tone are worth ten thousand literary echoes of Stern, or Lamb, or Dickens, or Thackeray. The education of young Brown was limited to the strictly preparatory years. At the age of thirteen, he was forced by the death of his father to try to earn his living. When about fourteen, he was apprenticed to a Mr. Rex, who published a paper at Lancaster, New Hampshire. He remained there about a year, then worked on various country papers, and finally passed three years in the printing house of Snow and Wilder, Boston. He then went to Ohio, and after working for some months on the Tiffin Advertiser, went to Toledo, where he remained till the fall of 1857. Thence he went to Cleveland, Ohio, as local editor of the Plain Dealer. Here appeared the humorous letters signed Artemis Ward, and written in the character of an itinerant showman. In 1860, he went to New York as editor of the comic journal Vanity Fair. His reputation grew steadily, and his first volume, Artemis Ward, his book, was brought out in 1862. In 1863, he went to San Francisco by way of the Isthmus and returned overland. This journey was chronicled in a short volume, Artemis Ward, His Travels. He had already undertaken a career of lecturing, and his comic entertainments, given in a style peculiarly his own, became very popular. The mimetic gift is frequently found in the humorist, and Brown's peculiar drawl, his profound gravity, and dreamy, faraway expression, the unexpected character of his jokes, and the surprise with which he seemed to regard the audience, made a combination of a delightfully quaint absurdity. Brown himself was a very winning personality, and never failed to put his audience in good humor. None who knew him, twenty-nine years ago, think of him without tenderness. In 1866 he visited England, and became almost as popular there as a lecturer and writer for Punch. He died from a pulmonary trouble in Southampton, March 6, 1867, being not quite thirty-three years old. He was never married. When we remember that a large part of Brown's mature life was taken up in learning the printer's trade, in which he became a master, we must decide that he had only entered on his career as humorous writer. Much of what he wrote is simply amusing, with little depth or power of suggestion. It is comic, not humorous. He was gaining the ear of the public, and training his powers of expression. What he has left consists of a few collections of sketches written for a daily paper, but the subjoined extracts will show, albeit dimly, that he was more than a joker, as under the cap and bells of the fool in Lear, we catch a glimpse of the face of a tender-hearted and philosophic friend. 
Brown's nature was so kindly and sympathetic, so pure and manly, that after he had achieved a reputation and was relieved from immediate pecuniary pressure, he would have felt an ambition to do some worthy work and take time to bring out the best that was in him. As it is, he had only tried his prentice hand. Still, the figure of the old showman, though not very solidly painted, is admirably done. He is a sort of sublimated and unoffensive Barnum, perfectly consistent, permeated with his professional view of life, yet quite incapable of anything underhand or mean, radically loyal to the Union, appreciative of the nature of his animals, steady in his humorous attitude toward life, and above all, not a composite of shreds and patches, but a personality. Slight as he is, and unconscious and unpracticed, as is the art that went to his creation, he is one of the humorous figures of all literature and old Sir John Falstaff, Sir Roger D. Coverley, Uncle Toby, and Dr. Primrose will not disdain to admit him into their company, for he too is a man, not an abstraction, and need not be ashamed of his parentage nor doubtful of his standing among the children of the men of wit. Edwin Forrest as Othello. During a recent visit to New York, the undersigned went to see Edwin Forrest. As I am into the moral show business myself, I generally go to Barnum's Moral Museum, where only moral people are admitted, particularly on Wednesday afternoons but this time I thought I'd go and see Ed. Ed has been acting out on the stage for many years. There is various opinions about his acting, Englishmen generally believing that he's far superior to Mr. McCready, but on one pint all agree, and that is that Ed draws like a six-ox team. Ed was acting at Niblo's Guarding, which looks considerable more like a parster than a guarding, but let that parse. I sat down in the pit, took out my spectacles, and commenced perusing the evening's bill. The audience was all fired large, and the boxes was full of the Aletti of New York. Several opera glasses was leveled at me by Gotham's fairest darters, but I didn't let on as though I noticed it, though maybe I did take out my sixteen-dollar silver watch and brandish it round more than was necessary. But the best of us has our weaknesses, and if a man has jewelry, let him show it. As I was perusing the bill, a grave young man who sought near me asked me if I'd ever seen Forrest dance the essence of old Virginia. He's immense in that, said the young man. He also does a fair champion jig, the young man contended. But his big thing is the essence of old Virginia. Says I, fair youth. Do you know what I'd do with you if you was my son? No, says he. Wall, says I, I'd appoint your funeral tomorrow afternoon, and the corpse should be ready. You're too smart to live on this earth. He didn't try any more of his capers on me, but another pusillanimous individual in a red vest and patent leather boots told me his name was Bill Astor, and asked me to lend him fifty cents till early in the morning. I told him I'd probably send it round to him before he retired to his 
virtuous couch. But if I didn't, he might look for it next fall, as soon as I'd cut my corn. The orchestra was now fiddling with all their might, and as the people didn't understand anything about it, they applauded vociferously. Presently, old Ed come out. The play was Otheller, or More of Venice. Otheller was writ by Wilm Shakespeare. The scene is laid in Venice. Otheller was a likely man, and was a general in the Venice army. He eloped with Desdemony, a darter of the Honorable Mr. Brabantio, who represented one of the back districts in the Venetian legislator. Old Brabantio was as mad as thunder at this, and tore round considerable, but finally cooled down, telling Othello, howsoever, that Desdemony had come it over her par, and that he had better look out, or she'd come it over him likewise. Mr. and Mrs. Othello get along very comfortable like for a spell. She is sweet-tempered and loving, a nice, sensible female, never going in for he, female conventions, green cotton umbrellas, and pickled beets. Othello is a good provider, and thinks all the world of his wife. She has a lazy time of it, a herd girl doing all the cooking and washing. Desdemony, in fact, don't have to get the water to wash her own hands with. But a low cuss named Iago, who I believe wants to get Othello out of his snug government berth, now goes to work and upsets the Othello family in most outrageous style. Iago falls in with a brainless youth named Roderigo, and wins all his money at poker. Iago allers played foul. He thus got money enough to carry out his unprincipled scheme. Mike Cassio, a Irishman, is selected as a tool by Iago. Mike was a clever feller and a officer in Othello's army. He liked his tods too well, howsoever, and they floored him as they have many other promising young men. Iago induces Mike to drink with him, Iago slyly throwing his whiskey over his shoulder. Mike gets as drunk as a biled owl, and allows that he can lick a yard full of the Venetian fancy before breakfast, without sweating a hair. He meets Roderigo and proceeds for to smash him. A feller named Mentano undertakes to slap Cassio, when that infatuated person runs his sword into him. That miserable man Iago pretends to be very sorry to see Mike conduct himself in this way, and undertakes to smooth the thing over to Othello, who rushes in with a drawn sword, and wants to know what's up. Iago cunningly tells his story, and Othello tells Mike that he thinks a good deal of him, but that he can't train no more in his regiment. Desdemony sympathizes with poor Mike, and intercedes for him with Othello. Iago makes him believe she does this because she thinks more of Mike than she does of his self. Othello swallers Iago's lying tale and goes to making a nuisance of his self generally. He worries poor Desdemony terrible by his vile insinuations, and finally smothers her to death with a pillar. Mrs. Iago comes in just as Othello has finished the foul deed, and gives him fits right and left, showing him 
that he has been orfully gulled by her miserable cuss of a husband. Iago comes in, and his wife commences raking him down also, when he stabs her. Otheller jaws him a spell, and then cuts a small hole in his stomach with his sword. Iago pints to Desdemone's deathbed, and goes off with a sardonic smile onto his countenance. Otheller tells the people that he has done the state some service, and they know it, axes them to do as fair a thing as they can for him under the circumstances, and kills himself with a fish knife, which is the most sensible thing he can do. This is a brief schedule of the synopsis of the play. Edwin Forrest is a great actor. I thought I saw Otheller before me all the time he was acting, and when the curtain fell, I found my spectacles was still missened with salt water, which had run from my eyes while poor Desdemony was dying. Betsy Jane, Betsy Jane, let us pray that our domestic bliss may never be busted up by A. Iago. Edwin Forrest makes money acting out on the stage. He gets five hundred dollars a night and his board and washing. I wish I had such a forest in my garden. Copyrighted by G. W. Dillingham and Company, New York. High Handed Outrage at Utica. In the fall of 1856, I showed my show in Utica, a truly great city in the state of New York. The people gave me a cordial reception. The press was loud in her praises. One day, as I was given a description of my beasts and snakes in my usual flowery style, what was my scorn and disgust to see a big, burly feller walk up to the cage containing my wax figures of the Lord's Last Supper and seize Judas Iscariot by the feet and drag him out on the ground. He then commenced fur to pound him as hard as he could. What under the sun are you about? cried I. Says he, What did you bring this pusillanimous cuss here fur? And he hit the wax figure another tremendous blow on the head. Says I, You egregious ass, that air's a wax figure, a representation of the false apostle. Says he, that's all very well for you to say, but I tell you, old man, that Judas Iscariot can't show hisself in Utica with impunity by a darn sight. With which observation he caved in Judas's head. The young man belonged to one of the first families in Utica. I sued him, and the jury brought in a verdict of arson in the third degree. Copyrighted by G. W. Dillingham and Company, New York. Affairs Round the Village Green And where are the friends of my youth? I have found one of them, certainly. I saw him ride in a circus the other day on a bareback horse, and even now his name stares at me from yonder board fence in green and blue and red and yellow letters. Dashington, the youth with whom I used to read the able orations of Cicero, and who as a declaimer on exhibition days used to wipe the rest of us boys pretty handsomely out. Well, Dashington is identified with the halibut and cod interests. Drives a fish cart, in fact, from a certain town on the coast 
back into the interior. Herbertson, the utterly stupid boy, the lunkhead who never had his lesson, he's about the ablest lawyer a sister state can boast. Mills is a newspaper man and is just now editing a major general down south. Singlingson, the sweet-faced boy, whose face was always washed and who was never rude, he is in the penitentiary for putting his uncle's autograph to a financial document. Hawkins, the clergyman's son, is an actor, and Williamson, the good little boy who divided his bread and butter with the beggar man, is a failing merchant and makes money by it. Tom Slink, who used to smoke short sixes and get acquainted with the little circus boys, is popularly supposed to be the proprietor of a cheap gaming establishment in Boston, where the beautiful but uncertain prop is nightly tossed. Be sure the army is represented by many of the friends of my youth, the most of whom have given a good account of themselves. But Chalmerson hasn't done much. No, Chalmerson is rather of a failure. He plays on the guitar and sings love songs. Not that he is a bad man. A kinder-hearted creature never lived. And they say he hasn't yet got over crying for his little curly-haired sister who died ever so long ago. But he knows nothing about business, politics, the world, and those things. He is dull at trade. Indeed, it is the common remark that everybody cheats Chalmerson. He came to the party the other evening and brought his guitar. They wouldn't have him for a tenor in the opera, certainly for he is shaky in his upper notes. But if his simple melodies didn't gush straight from the heart, why, even my trained eyes were wet. And although some of the girls giggled, and some of the men seemed to pity him, I could not help fancying that poor Charmerson was nearer heaven than any of us all. Copyrighted by G. W. Dillingham and Company Mr. Pepper, from Artemis Ward, His Travels. My arrival at Virginia City was signalized by the following incident. I had no sooner achieved my room in the garret of the International Hotel than I was called upon by an intoxicated man who said he was an editor. Knowing how rare it is for an editor to be under the blighting influence of either spirituous or malt liquors, I received this statement doubtfully. But I said, What name? Wait, he said, and went out. I heard him pacing unsteadily up and down the hall outside. In ten minutes he returned and said, Pepper. Pepper was indeed his name. He had been out to see if he could remember it, and he was so flushed with his success that he repeated it joyously several times, and then, with a short laugh, he went away. I had often heard of a man being so drunk that he didn't know what town he lived in, but here was a man so hideously inebriated that he didn't know what his name was. I saw him no more, but I heard from him, for he published a notice of my lecture, in which he said that I had a dissipated air. Horace Greeley's Ride to Placerville From Artemis Ward, His Travels When Mr. Greeley was in California, ovations awaited him at every town. He had written powerful leaders in the Tribune in favor of the Pacific Railroad, which had greatly endeared him to the citizens of the Golden State, and therefore they made much of him when he went to see them. At one town, 
the enthusiastic populace tore his celebrated white coat to pieces and carried the pieces home to remember him by the citizens of placerville prepared to fete the great journalist and an extra coach with extra relays of horses was chartered of the california stage company to carry him from Folsom to placerville distance forty miles the extra was in some way delayed and did not leave Folsom until late in the afternoon mr greeley was to be feted at seven o'clock that evening by the citizens of placerville and it was altogether necessary that he should be there by that time so the stage company said to henry monk the driver of the extra henry this great man must be there by seven to-night and henry answered the great man shall be there the roads were in an awful state and during the first few miles out of Folsom, slow progress was made sir said mr greeley are you aware that i must be in placerville at seven o'clock to-night i've got my orders laconically replied henry monk still the coach dragged slowly forward sir said mr greeley this is not a trifling matter i must be there at seven again came the answer i've got my orders but the speed was not increased and mr greeley chafed away another half hour when as he was again about to remonstrate with the driver the horses suddenly started into a furious run and all sorts of encouraging yells filled the air from the throat of henry monk that is right my good fellow said mr greeley i'll give you ten dollars when we get to placerville now we are going they were indeed and at a terrible speed crack crack went the whip and again that voice split the air get up hi ye go long yip yip and on they tore over stones and ruts up hill and down at a rate of speed never before achieved by stage horses mr greeley who had been bouncing from one end of the stage to the other like an india rubber ball managed to get his head out of the window when he said don't on't 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 you think we e e shall get there by seven if we don't on't on't go so fast i've got my orders that was all henry monk said and on tore the coach it was becoming serious already the journalist was extremely sore from the terrible jolting and again his head might have been seen from the window sir he said i don't care care air er, if we don't get there at seven i've got my orders fresh horses forward again faster than before over rocks and stumps on one of which the coach narrowly escaped turning a somerset see here shrieked mr greeley i don't care if we don't get there at all i've got my orders i work for the california stage company i do that's what i work fur they said get this man through by seven and this man's going through you bet ger long woo it another frightful jolt and mr greeley's bald head suddenly found its way through the roof of the coach amidst the crash of small timbers and the ripping of strong canvas stop you maniac he roared again answered henry monk i've got my orders keep your seat horace at mud springs a village a few miles from placerville they met a large delegation of the citizens of placerville who had come out to meet the celebrated editor 
and escort him into town. There was a military company, a brass band, and a six-horse wagon-load of beautiful damsels in milk-white dresses, representing all the states in the Union. It was nearly dark now, but the delegation was amply provided with torches, and bonfires blazed all along the road to Placerville. The citizens met the coach in the outskirts of Mud Springs, and Mr. Monk reined in his foam-covered steeds. "'Is Mr. Greeley on board?' asked the chairman of the committee. "'He was a few miles back,' said Mr. Monk. "'Yes,' he added, looking down through the hole which the fearful jolting had made in the coach roof. "'Yes, I can see him. He is there.' "'Mr. Greeley,' said the chairman of the committee, presenting himself at the window of the coach. "'Mr. Greeley, sir, we are come to most cordially welcome you, sir. Why, God bless me, sir, you are bleeding at the nose.' "'I've got my orders,' cried Mr. Monk. "'My orders is as follows. "'Get him there by seven. "'It wants a quarter to seven. "'Stand out of the way.' "'But, sir,' exclaimed the committee man, "'seizing the off-leader by the reins, "'Mr. Monk, we are come to escort him into town. "'Look at the procession, sir, "'and the brass band, and the people.' and the young women, sir. I've got my orders, screamed Mr. Monk. My orders don't say nothing about no brass bands and young women. My orders says, get him there by seven. Let go them lines. Clear the way there. woo ep Keep your seat, Horace. And the coach dashed wildly through the procession, upsetting a portion of the brass band and violently grazing the wagon which contained the beautiful young women in white. Years hence, gray-haired men who were little boys in this procession will tell their grandchildren how this stage tore through mud springs, and how Horace Greeley's bald head, ever and anon, showed itself like a wild apparition above the coach roof. Mr. Monk was on time. There is a tradition that Mr. Greeley was very indignant for a while. Then he laughed and finally presented Mr. Monk with a brand new suit of clothes. Mr. Monk himself is still in the employ of the California Stage Company and is rather fond of relating a story that has made him famous all over the Pacific Coast but he says he yields to no man in his admiration for Horace Greeley. End of section 19《Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors, Section 20, Sir Thomas Brown, by Francis Bacon. — This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Sir Thomas Brown, 1605-1682, by Francis Bacon. — When Sir Thomas Brown, in the last decade of his life, was asked to furnish data for the writing of his memoirs, in Woods, Athenae Oxoniensis, he gave in a letter to his friend Mr. Aubrey, in the fewest words, his birthplace and the places of his education, his admission as Socius Honorarius of the College of Physicians in London, the date of his being knighted, and the titles of the four books or tracts which he had printed, and ended with, have some miscellaneous tracts which may be published. This account of himself, curter than many an epitaph, and scantier in details than the requirements of a census taker's blank, may serve with many other signs that one finds scattered among the pages of this author, to show his rare modesty and effacement of his physical self. He seems 
like some other thoughtful and sensitive natures before and since averse or at least indifferent to being put on record as an eating digesting sleeping and clothes wearing animal of that species of which his contemporary sir samuel pepys stands as the classical instance and which the newspaper interviewer of our own day that fellow who would vulgarise the day of judgment has trained to the most noxious degree of offensiveness sir thomas felt undoubtedly that having admitted that select company fit audience though few who were students of the religio medici to close intimacy with his highest mental processes and conditions his separable accidents affairs of assimilation and secretion as one may say were business between himself and his grocer and tailor his cook and his laundress the industrious research of mr simon wilkin who in eighteen thirty six produced the completest edition william pickering london of the literary remains of sir thomas brown has gathered from all sources his own notebooks domestic and friendly correspondence allusions of contemporary writers and the works of subsequent biographers all that we are likely this side of paradise to know of this great scholar and admirable man the main facts of his life are as follows he was born in the parish of st michael's cheap in london on the nineteenth of october sixteen hundred and five the year of the gunpowder plot his father as is apologetically admitted by granddaughter mrs littleton was a tradesman a mercer though a gentleman of good family in cheshire generosa familia says sir thomas's own epitaph that he was the parent of his son's temperament a devout man with a leaning towards mysticism in religion is shown by the charming story mrs littleton tells of him exhibiting traits worthy of the best stages of faith and more to be expected in the father of a mediaeval saint than in a prosperous cheapside mercer whose son was to become one of the most learned and philosophical physicians of the age of harvey and sydenham his father used to open his breast when he was asleep and kiss it in prayers over him as to said of origins father that the holy ghost would take possession there clearly it was with reverent memory of this good man that sir thomas near the close of his own long life wrote among thy multiplied acknowledgments lift up one hand under heaven that thou wert born of honest parents that modesty humility patience and veracity lay in the same egg and came into the world with thee this loving father of whom one would fain know more died in the early childhood of his son thomas he left a handsome estate of nine thousand pounds and a widow not wholly inconsolable with her third portion and not unduly deferred second marriage to a titled gentleman sir thomas button a knight so scantily and at the same time so variously described as a worthy person who had great places and a bad member of mutinous and unworthy carriage that one is content to leave him as a problematical character the boy thomas brown being left to the care of guardians his estate was despoiled though to what extent does not appear nor can it be considered greatly deplorable since it did not prevent his early schooling at that ancient and noble foundation of winchester nor in sixteen twenty three his entrance into pembroke college oxford and in due course his graduation in sixteen twenty six as bachelor of arts with what special assistance or direction he began his studies in medical science cannot now be ascertained but after taking his degree of master of arts in sixteen twenty nine he practised physic for about two years in some uncertain place in oxfordshire he then began a course of travel unusually extensive for that day 
his stepfather upon occasion of his official duties under the government showed him all ireland in some visitation of the forts and castles it is improbable that ireland at that time long detained a traveller essentially literary in his tastes brown betook himself to france and italy where he appears to have spent about two years residing at montpellier and padua then great centres of medical learning with students drawn from most parts of christendom returning homeward through holland he received the degree of doctor of medicine from the university of leiden in sixteen thirty three and settled in practice at halifax england at this time favoured probably by the leisure which largely attends the beginning of a medical career but which is rarely so laudably or productively employed he wrote the treatise religio medici which more than any other of his works has established his fame and won the affectionate admiration of thoughtful readers this production was not printed until seven years later although some unauthorised manuscript copies more or less faulty were in circulation when in sixteen forty two it arrived in a most depraved copy at the press brown felt it necessary to vindicate himself by publishing a correct edition although he protests its original intention was not public and being a private exercise directed to myself what is delivered therein was rather a memorial unto me than an example of rule unto any other in sixteen thirty six he removed to norwich and permanently established himself there in the practice of physic there in sixteen forty one he married dorothy milam a lady of good family in norfolk thereby not only improving his social connections but securing a wife of such symmetrical proportion to her worthy husband both in the graces of her body and mind that they seemed to come together by a kind of natural magnetism such at least was the view of an intimate friend of more than forty years rev john whitefoot in the minutes which at the request of the widow he drew up after sir thomas's death and which contain the most that is known of his personal appearance and manners evidently the marriage was a happy one for forty-one years when the lady dorothy was left maestissima cognux as her husband's stately epitaph which with many an isimus declares twelve children were born of it and though only four of them survived to their parents such mortality in carefully tended and well circumstanced families was less remarkable than it would be now when two centuries more of progress in medical science have added security and length to human life the good mother had she not endeared herself to the modern reader by the affectionate gentleness and the quaint glimpses of domestic life that her family letters reveal would be irresistible by the ingeniously bad spelling in which she revelled transgressing even the wide limits then allowed to feminine heterography it is noteworthy that dr brown's professional prosperity was not impaired by the suspicion which early attached to him and soon deepened into conviction that he was addicted to literary pursuits he was in high repute as a physician his practice was extensive and he was diligent in it as also in those works of literature and scientific investigation which occupied all snatches of time he says as medical vacations and the fruitless importunity of uroscopy would permit his large family was liberally reared his hospitality and his charities were ample in sixteen forty six he printed his second book the largest and most operous of all his productions the pseudodoxia epidemica or inquiries into vulgar and common errors the work evidently of the orae subsequi of many years in sixteen fifty eight he gave to the public two smaller but important and most characteristic works 
hydriotaphia and the garden of cyrus beside these publications he left many manuscripts which appeared posthumously the most important of them for its size and general interest being christian morals when sir thomas's long life drew to its close it was with all the blessings which should accompany old age his domestic life had been one of felicity his eldest and only surviving son edward brown had become a scholar after his father's own heart and though not inheriting his genius was already renowned in london one of the physicians to the king and in a way to become as afterwards he did president of the college of physicians all his daughters who had attained womanhood were well married he lived in the society of the honourable and learned and had received from the king the honour of knighthood Footnote. as for this business of the knighting one hesitates fully to adopt dr johnson's remark that charles the second had skill to discover excellence and virtue to reward it at least with such honorary distinctions as cost him nothing a candid observer of the walk and conversation of this illustrious monarch finds room for doubt that he was an attentive reader or consistent admirer of the religio medici or christian morals and though his own personal history might have contributed much to a complete catalogue of vulgar errors brown's treatise so named did not include divagations from common decency in its scope and so may have failed to impress the royal mind the fact is that the king on his visit to norwich looking about for somebody to knight intended as usual on such occasions to confer the title on the mayor of the city but this functionary some brewer or grocer perhaps of whom nothing else than this incident is recorded declined the honour whereupon the gap was stopped with dr brown End of footnote. mr john evelyn carrying out a long and cherished plan of seeing one whom he had known and admired by his writings visited him at norwich in sixteen seventy one he found sir thomas among fit surroundings his whole house and garden being a paradise and a cabinet of rarities and that of the best collections especially medals books plants and natural things Footnote. these two distinguished authors were of congenial tastes and both cultivated the same latinistic literary diction their meeting must have occasioned a copious effusion of those long-tailed words in ossetianation which both had so readily at command or made to order it is regrettable that evelyn never completed a work entitled elysium britannicum which he planned and to which brown contributed a chapter of coronary plants it would have taken rank with its author silver among english classics End of footnote here we have the right background and accessories for whitefoot's portrait of the central figure his complexion and hair answerable to his name his stature moderate and habit of body neither fat nor lean but usarkos never seem to be transported with mirth or dejected with sadness always cheerful but rarely merry at any sensible rate seldom heard to break a jest and when he did apt to blush at the levity of it his gravity was natural without affectation his modesty visible in a natural habitual blush which was increased upon the least occasion and oft discovered without any observable cause so free from loquacity or much talkativeness that he was sometimes difficult to be engaged in any discourse though when he was so it was always singular and never trite or vulgar a man so lofty and self-contained might be expected to leave a life so long honourable and beneficent with becoming dignity 
sir thomas's last sickness a brief but very painful one was endured with exemplary patience founded upon the christian philosophy and with a meek rational and religious courage much to the edification of his friend whitefoot one may even see a kind of felicity in his death falling exactly on the completion of his seventy-seventh year he was buried in the church of st peter mancroft where his monument still claims regard as chief among the memorabilia of that noble sanctuary footnote in the course of repairs in august eighteen forty his coffin was broken open by a pickaxe the bones were found in good preservation the fine auburn hair had not lost its freshness it is painful to relate that the cranium was removed and placed in the pathological museum of norwich hospital labelled as the gift of some person name not recalled whose own cranium is probably an object of interest solely to its present proprietor who knows the fate of his own bones we insult not over their ashes says sir thomas the curator of the museum feels that he has a clever joke on the dead man when with a grin he points to a label bearing these words from the hydriotaphia to be knaved out of our graves to have our skulls made drinking bowls and our bones turned into pipes to delight and sport our enemies our tragical abominations escaped in burning burials End of footnote. at the first appearance of brown's several publications they attracted that attention from the learned and thoughtful which they have ever since retained the religio medici was soon translated into several modern languages as well as into latin and became the subject of curiously diverse criticism the book received the distinction of a place in the roman index expurgatorius while from various points of view its author was regarded as a romanist an atheist a deist a pantheist and as bearing the number six 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 somewhere about him a worthy quaker a fellow townsman was so impressed by his tone of quietistic mysticism he felt sure the philosophic doctor was guided by the inward light and wrote sending a godly book and proposing to clinch his conversion in a personal interview such are the perils that environ the man who not only repeats a creed in sincerity but ventures to do so and to utter his own thinking about it from brown's own day to the present time his critics and commentators have been numerous and distinguished one of the most renowned among them being dr johnson whose life of the author prefixed to an edition of the christian morals in seventeen fifty six is a fine specimen of that facile and effective hackwork of which johnson was master in that characteristic way of his half of patronage half of reproof and wholly pedagogical he summons his subject to the bar of his dialectics and according to his lights administers justice he admits that brown has great excellencies and uncommon sentiments and that his scholarship and science are admirable but strongly condemns his style it is vigorous but rugged it is learned but pedantic it is deep but obscure it strikes but does not please it commands but does not allure his tropes are harsh and his combinations uncouth behemoth prescribing rules of locomotion to the swan by how much would english letters have been the poorer if brown had learned his art of johnson notwithstanding such objurgations some have supposed that the style of johnson perhaps without conscious intent was founded upon that of brown a tone of oracular authority an academic latinism sometimes disregarding the limitations of the unlearned reader 
an elaborate balancing of antitheses in the same period these are qualities which the two writers have in common but the resemblance such as it is is skin deep johnson is a polemic by nature and at his best cogent and triumphant in argument his thought is carefully kept level with the apprehension of the ordinary reader while arrayed in a verbal pomp simulating the expression of something weighty and profound brown is intuitive and ever averse to controversy feeling as he exquisitely says that many have too rashly charged the troops of error and remain as trophies unto the enemies of truth a man may be in as just possession of the truth as of a city and yet be forced to surrender calmly philosophic he writes for kindred minds and his concept satisfying his own intellect he delivers them with as little passion as an aeolian harp answering the wind and lingers not for applause or explanation his being those thoughts that wander through eternity he means that we too shall have a glimpse of incomprehensibles and thoughts things which thoughts but tenderly touch how grandly he rounds his pregnant paragraphs with phrases which for stately and compulsive rhythm sonorous harmony and sweetly solemn cadences are almost matchless in english prose and lack only the mechanism of metre to give them the highest rank as verse man is a noble animal splendid in ashes and pompous in the grave solemnizing nativities and deaths with equal lustre nor omitting ceremonies of bravery in the infancy of his nature when personations shall cease and histrionism of happiness be over when reality shall rule and all shall be as they shall be for ever such passages as these and the whole of the fragment on mummies one can scarcely recite without falling into something of that chant which the blank verse of milton and tennyson seems to enforce that the religio medici was the work of a gentleman before his thirtieth year not a recluse nor trained in a cloister but active in a calling which keeps closest touch with the passions and frailties of humanity seems to justify his assertion i have shaken hands with delight in square brackets silicit by way of parting close square brackets in my warm blood and canicular days so uniformly lofty and dignified is its tone and so austere its morality that the book might be taken for the fruit of those later and sadder years that bring the philosophic mind its frank confessions and calm analysis of motive and action had been compared with montaigne's if montaigne had been graduated after a due education in purgatory or if his pedigree had been remotely crossed with a st anthony and he had lived to see the fluctus decumanus gathering in the tide of puritanism the likeness would have been closer the religio medici says coleridge is a fine portrait of a handsome man in his best clothes there is truth in the criticism and if there is no colour of a sneer in it it is entirely true who does not feel when following brown into his study or his garden that here is a kind of cloistral retreat from the commonplaces of the outside world that the handsome man is a true gentleman and a noble friend and that his best clothes are his everyday wear this aloofness of brown's which holds him apart in the still air of delightful studies is no affectation it is an innate quality he thinks his thoughts in his own way and the style is the man 
never more truly than with him. One of his family letters mentions the execution of Charles I as a horrid murder, and another speaks of Cromwell as a usurper, but nowhere in anything intended for the public eye is there an indication that he lived in the most tumultuous and heroic period of English history. Not a word shows that Shakespeare was of the generation just preceding his, nor that Milton and George Herbert and Henry Vaughan, numerous as other parallels in their thought and feeling and in his, were his contemporaries. Constant and extensive as are his excursions into ancient literature, it is rare for him to make any reference to writers of his own time. Yet with all his delight in antiquity and reverence for the great names of former ages, he is keen in the quest for new discoveries. His commonplace books abound in ingenious queries and minute observations regarding physical facts, conceived in the very spirit of our modern school. What is the use of due clause in dogs? He does not instantly answer as a schoolboy in this Darwinian day would, to carry out an analogy. But the mere asking of the question sets him ahead of his age. See too his curious inquiries into the left-footedness of parrots and left-handedness of certain monkeys and squirrels. The epoch-making announcement of his fellow physician Harvey he quickly appreciates at its true value. His piece, De Circles, sang which discovery I prefer to that of Columbus. And here again, a truly surprising suggestion of the great results achieved a century and two centuries later by Jenner and Pasteur, concerning canine madness, whether it holdeth not better at second hand than at first hand, so that if a dog bite a horse, and that horse a man, the evil proves less considerable. He is the first to observe and describe that curious product of the decomposition of flesh known to modern chemists as adiposia. He is full of eager anticipation of the future. Join sense unto reason, he cries, and experiment unto speculation, and so give life unto embryon truths and verities yet in their chaos. What libraries of new volumes after times will behold, and in what a new world of knowledge the eyes of our posterity may be happy, a few ages may joyfully declare. But acute and active as our author's perceptions were, they did not prevent his sharing the then prevalent theory which assigned to the devil, and to witches who were his ministers, an important part in the economy of the world. This belief affords so easy a solution of some problems otherwise puzzling that this degenerate age may look back with envy upon those who held it in serene and comfortable possession. It is to be regretted, however, that the eminent Lord Chief Justice Hale, in 1664, presiding at the trial for witchcraft of two women, should have called Dr. Brown, apparently as amicus curiae, to give his view of the fits which were supposed to be the work of the witches. He was clearly of the opinion that the devil had even more to do with that case than he has with most cases of hysteria, and consequently the witches, it must be said, fared no better in Sir Matthew Hale's court than many of their kind in various parts of Christendom about the same time. But it will be unreasonable for us to hold the ghost of Sir Thomas deeply culpable, because, while he showed in most matters an exceptionally enlightened liberality of opinion and practice, in this one particular he declined to deny the scientific dictum of previous ages and the popular belief of his own time. The mental attitude of reverent belief in its symbolic value, in which this devout philosopher contemplated the material world, is that of many of those who have since helped most to build the structure of natural science. 
the rapturous exclamation of Linnaeus, My God, I think thy thoughts after thee, comes like an antiphonal response by the man of flowers to these passages in the Religio Medici. This visible world is but a picture of the invisible, wherein, as in a portrait, things are not truly but in equivocal shapes, and as they counterfeit some real substance in that invisible fabric. Things are really true as they correspond unto God's conception, and have so much verity as they hold of conformity unto that intellect in whose idea they had their first determinations. End of section 20section twenty one of the library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six selected excerpts from the religio medici by sir thomas brown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org i could never divide myself from any man upon the difference of an opinion or be angry with his judgment for not agreeing with me in that from which, within a few days, I should dissent myself. I have no genius to disputes in religion, and have often thought it wisdom to decline them, especially upon a disadvantage, or when the cause of truth might suffer in the weakness of my patronage. When we desire to be informed, tis good to contest with men above ourselves, but to confirm and establish our opinions, it is best to argue with judgments below our own, that the frequent spoils and victories over their reasons may settle in ourselves an esteem and confirmed opinion of our own. Every man is not a proper champion for truth, nor fit to take up the gauntlet in the cause of verity many from the ignorance of these maxims and an inconsiderate zeal for truth have too rashly charged the troops of error and remain as trophies unto the enemies of truth a man may be in as just possession of truth as of a city and yet be forced to surrender it is therefore far better to enjoy her with peace than to hazard her on a battle if therefore there rise any doubts in my way i do forget them or at least defer them till my better settled judgment and more manly reason be able to resolve them for i perceive every man's own reason is his best oedipus and will upon a reasonable truce find a way to loose those bonds wherewith the subtleties of error have enchained our more flexible and tender judgments in philosophy where truth seems double-faced there is no man more paradoxical than myself but in divinity i love to keep the road and though not in an implicit yet an humble faith follow the great wheel of the church by which i move not reserving any proper poles or motion from the epicycle of my own brain by these means i leave no gap for heresies schisms or errors as for those wingy mysteries in divinity and airy subtleties in religion which have unhinged the brains of better heads they never stretched the pia mater of mine methinks there be not impossibilities enough in religion for an act of faith the deepest mysteries ours contains have not only been illustrated but maintained by syllogism and the rule of reason i love to lose myself in a mystery to pursue my reason to an o altitudo tis my solitary recreation to pose my apprehension with those involved enigmas and riddles of the trinity with incarnation and resurrection i can answer all the objections of satan and my rebellious reason with that odd resolution i learned of tertullian tertum est quia impossibile est 
I desire to exercise my faith in the difficultest point, for to credit ordinary and visible objects is not faith, but persuasion. Some believe the better for seeing Christ's sepulchre, and when they have seen the Red Sea, doubt not of the miracle. Now, contrarily, I bless myself and am thankful that I live not in the days of miracles, that I never saw Christ nor his disciples. I would not have been one of those Israelites that passed the Red Sea, nor one of Christ's patients on whom he wrought his wonders. Then had my faith been thrust upon me, nor should I enjoy that greater blessing pronounced to all that believe and saw not. Tis an easy and necessary belief to credit what our eye and sense hath examined. I believe he was dead and buried and rose again, and desire to see him in his glory rather than to contemplate him in his cenotaph or sepulchre. Nor is this much to believe, as we have reason. We owe this faith unto history. They only had the advantage of a bold and noble faith who lived before his coming, who upon obscure prophecies and mystical types could raise a belief and expect apparent impossibilities. In my solitary and retired imagination, neque num cum lectulus aut me porticus excepit desum mihi, I remember I am not alone, and therefore forget not to contemplate him and his attributes who was ever with me, especially those two mighty ones, his wisdom and eternity. With the one I recreate, with the other I confound my understanding. For who can speak of eternity without a solecism, or think thereof without an ecstasy? Time we may comprehend. It is but five days older than ourselves, and hath the same horoscope with the world. But to retire so far back as to apprehend a beginning, to give such an infinite start forward as to conceive an end in an essence that we affirm hath neither the one nor the other, it puts my reason to St. Paul's sanctuary. My philosophy dares not to say the angels can do it. God hath not made a creature that can comprehend him. It is a privilege of his own nature. I am that I am, was his own definition unto Moses, and it was a short one to confound mortality that durst question God or ask him what he was. Indeed, he only is. All others have and shall be. But in eternity there is no distinction of tenses, and therefore that terrible term predestination, which hath troubled so many weak heads to conceive and the wisest to explain, is, in respect to God, no precious determination of our states to come, but a definitive blast of his will already fulfilled and at the instant that he first decreed it. For to his eternity, which is indivisible and altogether, the last trump is already sounded, the reprobates in the flame, and the blessed in Abraham's bosom. St. Peter speaks modestly when he saith, A thousand years to God are but as one day. For to speak like a philosopher, those continued instances of time which flow into a thousand years make not to him one moment what to us is to come to his eternity is present his whole duration being but one permanent point without succession parts flux or division the world was made to be inhabited by beasts but studied and contemplated by man. Tis the debt of our reason we owe unto God, and the homage we pay for not being beasts. 
without this the world is still as though it had not been or as it was before the sixth day when as yet there was not a creature that could conceive or say there was a world the wisdom of god receives small honour from those vulgar heads that rudely stare about and with gross rusticity admire his works those highly magnify him whose judicious inquiry into his acts and deliberate research into his creatures return the duty of a devout and learned admiration natura nihil aget frustra nature does nothing in vain is the only indisputable axiom in philosophy there are no grotesques in nature nor anything framed to fill up empty cantons and unnecessary spaces in the most imperfect creatures and such as were not preserved in the ark but having their seeds and principles in the womb of nature are everywhere where the power of the sun is in these is the wisdom of his hand discovered out of this rank solomon chose the object of his admiration indeed what reason may not go to school to the wisdom of bees ants and spiders what wise hand teacheth them to do what reason cannot teach us ruder heads stand amazed at those prodigious pieces of nature whales elephants dromedaries and camels these i confess are the colossi and majestic pieces of her hand but in these narrow engines there is more curious mathematics and the civility of these little citizens more nearly sets forth the wisdom of their maker who admires not regiomontanus his fly beyond his eagle or wonders not more at the operation of two souls in those little bodies than but one in the trunk of a cedar i could never content my contemplation with those general pieces of wonder the flux and reflux of the sea the increase of the nile the conversion of the needle to the north and if studied to match and parallel those in the more obvious and neglected pieces of nature which without further travel i can do in the cosmography of myself we carry with us the wonders we seek without us there is all africa and her prodigies in us we are that bold and adventurous piece of nature which he that studies wisely learns in a compendium what others labour at in a divided piece and endless volume thus there are two books from whence i collect my divinity besides that written one of god another of his servant nature that universal and public manuscript that lies expansed unto the eyes of all those that never saw him in the one have discovered him in the other this was the scripture and theology of the heathens the natural motion of the sun made them more admire him than its supernatural station did the children of israel the ordinary effect of nature wrought more admiration in them than in the other all his miracles surely the heathens knew better how to join and read these mystical letters than we christians who cast a more careless eye on these common hieroglyphics and disdain to suck divinity from the flowers of nature nor do i so forget god as to adore the name of nature which i define not with the schools to be the principle of motion and rest but that straight and regular line that settled and constant course the wisdom of god hath ordained the actions of his creatures according to their several kinds to make a revolution every day is the nature of the sun because of that necessary course which god hath ordained it from which it cannot swerve but by a faculty from that voice which first did give it motion now this course of nature god seldom alters or perverts but like an excellent artist hath so contrived his work that 
with the self-same instrument, without a new creation, he may effect his obscurest designs. Thus he sweeteneth the water with a wood, preserveth the creatures in the ark, which the blast of his mouth might as easily have created. For God is like a skilful geometrician, who, when more easily and with one stroke of his compass he might describe or divide a right line, had yet rather do this in a circle a longer way, according to the constituted and forelaid principles of his art. Yet this rule of his he doth sometimes pervert to acquaint the world with his prerogative, lest the arrogancy of our reason should question his power and conclude he could not. And thus I call the effects of nature the works of God, whose hand and instrument she only is, and therefore to ascribe his actions unto her is to devolve the honour of the principal agent upon the instrument, which, if with reason we may do, then let our hammers rise up and boast they have built our houses, and our pens receive the honour of our writing. I hold there is a general beauty in the works of God, and therefore no deformity in any kind of species whatever. I cannot tell by what logic we call a toad, a bear, or an elephant ugly, they being created in those outward shapes and figures which best express those actions of their inward forms. And having passed that general visitation of God, who saw that all that he had made was good, that is, conformable to his will, which abhors deformity, and is the rule of order and beauty, there is no deformity but in monstrosity, wherein, notwithstanding, there is a kind of beauty, nature so ingeniously contriving the irregular parts that they become sometimes more remarkable than the principal fabric. To speak yet more narrowly, there was never anything ugly or misshapen but the chaos, wherein, notwithstanding, to speak strictly, there was no deformity because no form, nor was it yet impregnated by the voice of God. Now nature is not at variance with art, nor art with nature, they being both servants of his providence. Art is the perfection of nature. Were the world now as it was on the sixth day, there were yet a chaos. Nature hath made one world and art another. In brief, all things are artificial, for nature is the art of God. I have heard some with deep sighs lament the lost lines of Cicero. Others, with as many groans, deplore the combustion of the library of Alexandria. For my own part, I think there be too many in the world, and could with patience behold the urn and ashes of the Vatican, could I, with a few others, recover the perished leaves of Solomon. I would not omit a copy of Enoch's Pillars, had they many nearer authors than Josephus, or did not relish somewhat of the fable. Some men have written more than others have spoken. Pinedo quotes more authors in one work than are necessary in the whole world. Of those three great inventions in Germany, there are two which are not without their incommodities. It is not a melancholy utinam of my own, but the desires of better heads, that there were a general synod, not to unite the incompatible difference of religion, but for the benefit of learning, to reduce it, as it lay at first, in a few and solid orders, and to condemn to the fire those swarms and millions of rhapsodies begotten only to distract and abuse the weaker judgments of scholars, and to maintain the trade and mystery of typographers. Again, I believe that all that use sorceries, incantations, and spells are not witches, or as we term them, magicians. 
i conceive there is a traditional magic not learned immediately from the devil but at second hand from his scholars who having once the secret betrayed are able and do empirically practice without his advice they both proceeding from the principles of nature where actives aptly conjoined to disposed passives will under any master produce their effects thus i think at first a great part of philosophy was witchcraft which being afterward derived to one another proved but philosophy and was indeed no more but the honest effects of nature what invented by us is philosophy learned from him is magic we do surely owe the discovery of many secrets to the discovery of good and bad angels i could never pass that sentence of paracelsus without an asterisk or annotation ascendens astro multa revelat quarentibus magnalia naturae id est opera dei i do think that many mysteries ascribed to our own inventions have been the courteous revelations of spirits for those noble essences in heaven bear a friendly regard unto their fellow natures on earth and therefore believe that those many prodigies and ominous prognostics which forerun the ruins of states princes and private persons are the charitable premonitions of good angels which more careless inquiries term but the effects of chance and nature now besides these particular and divided spirits there may be for aught i know an universal and common spirit to the whole world it was the opinion of plato and it is yet of the hermetical philosophers if there be a common nature that unites and ties the scattered and divided individuals into one species why may there not be one that unites them all however i am sure there is a common spirit that plays within us yet makes no part of us and that is the spirit of god the fire and scintillation of that noble and mighty essence which is the life and radical heat of spirits and those essences that know not the virtue of the sun a fire quite contrary to the fire of hell this is that gentle heat that brooded on the waters and in six days hatched the world this is that irradiation that dispels the mists of hell the clouds of horror fear sorrow and despair and preserves the region of the mind in serenity whosoever feels not the warm gale and gentle ventilation of this spirit though i feel his pulse i dare not say he lives for truly without this to me there is no heat under the tropic nor any light though i dwelt in the body of the sun i believe that the whole frame of a beast doth perish and is left in the same state after death as before it was material done to life that the souls of men know neither contrary nor corruption that they subsist beyond the body and outlive death by the privilege of their proper natures and without a miracle that the souls of the faithful as they leave earth take possession of heaven that those apparitions and ghosts of departed persons are not the wandering souls of men but the unquiet walks of devils prompting and suggesting us into mischief blood and villainy instilling and stealing into our hearts that the blessed spirits are not at rest in their graves but wander solicitous of the affairs of the world but that those phantasms appear often and do frequent cemeteries charnel houses and churches it is because those are the dormitories of the dead where the devil like an insolent champion beholds with pride the spoils and trophies of his victory in adam this is that dismal conquest we all deplore that makes us so often cry adam quid fecisti 
i thank god i have not those straight ligaments or narrow obligations to the world as to dote on life or be convulsed and tremble at the name of death not that i am insensible of the dread and horror thereof or by raking into the bowels of the deceased continual sight of anatomies skeletons or cadaverous relics like the spillows or grave makers i am become stupid or have forgot the apprehension of mortality but that marshalling all the horrors and contemplating the extremities thereof i find not anything therein able to daunt the courage of a man much less a well-resolved christian and therefore am not angry at the error of our first parents or unwilling to bear a part of this common fate and like the best of them to die that is to cease to breathe to take a farewell of the elements to be a kind of nothing for a moment to be within one instant of a spirit when i take a full view and circle of myself without this reasonable moderator and equal piece of justice death i do conceive myself the miserablest person extant were there not another life that i hope for all the vanities of this world should not entreat a moment's breath from me could the devil work my belief to imagine i could never die i would not outlive that very thought i have so abject a conceit of this common way of existence this retaining to the sun and elements i cannot think this to be a man or to live according to the dignity of humanity in expectation of a better i can with patience embrace this life yet in my best meditations do often defy death i honour any man that contemns it nor can i highly love any that is afraid of it this makes me naturally love a soldier and honour those tattered and contemptible regiments that will die at the command of a sergeant for a pagan there may be some motives to be in love with the life but for a christian to be amazed at death i see not how he can escape this dilemma that he is too sensible of this life or hopeless of the life to come i am naturally bashful nor hath conversation age or travel been able to affront or enharden me yet i have one part of modesty which i have seldom discovered in another that is to speak truly i am not so much afraid of death as ashamed thereof tis the very disgrace and ignominy of our natures that in a moment can so disfigure us that our nearest friends wife and children stand afraid and start at us the birds and beasts of the field that before in a natural fear obeyed us forgetting all allegiance begin to prey upon us this very conceit hath in a tempest disposed and left me willing to be swallowed up in the abyss of waters wherein i had perished unseen unpitied without wandering eyes tears of pity lectures of mortality and none had said quantum mutatus ab illo not that i am ashamed of the anatomy of my parts or can accuse nature for playing the bungler in any part of me or my own vicious life for contracting any shameful disease upon me whereby i might not call myself as wholesome a morsel for the worms as any men commonly set forth the torments of hell by fire and the extremity of corporal afflictions and describe hell in the same method that mahomet doth heaven this indeed makes a noise and drums in popular ears but if this be the terrible piece thereof it is not worthy to stand in diameter with heaven whose happiness consists in that part that is best able to comprehend it that immortal essence that translated divinity and colony of god the soul 
surely though we place hell under earth the devil's walk and purlieu is about it men speak too popularly who place it in those flaming mountains which to grosser apprehensions represent hell the heart of man is the place where the devil dwells in i feel sometimes a hell within myself lucifer keeps his court in my breast legion is revived in me there are as many hells as anaxarchus conceited worlds there was more than one hell in magdalen when there were seven devils for every devil is a hell unto himself he holds enough of torture in his own ubi and needs not the misery of circumference to afflict him and thus a distracted conscience here is a shadow or introduction unto hell hereafter who can but pity the merciful intention of those hands that do destroy themselves the devil were it in his power would do the like which being impossible his miseries are endless and he suffers most in that attribute wherein he is impassable his immortality i thank god and with joy i mention it i was never afraid of hell nor ever grew pale at the description of that place i have so fixed my contemplations on heaven that i have almost forgot the idea of hell and am afraid rather to lose the joys of the one than endure the misery of the other to be deprived of them is a perfect hell and needs methinks no addition to complete our afflictions that terrible term hath never detained me from sin nor do i owe any good action to the name thereof i fear god yet am not afraid of him his mercies make me ashamed of my sins before his judgments afraid thereof these are the forced and secondary method of his wisdom which he useth but as the last remedy and upon provocation a course rather to deter the wicked than incite the virtuous to his worship i can hardly think there was ever any scared into heaven they go the fairest way to heaven that would serve god without a hell other mercenaries that crouch unto him in fear of hell though they term themselves the servants are indeed but the slaves of the almighty that which is the cause of my election i hold to be the cause of my salvation which was the mercy and beneplacit of god before i was or the foundation of the world before abraham was i am is the saying of christ yet it is true in some sense if i say it of myself for i was not only before myself but adam that is in the idea of god and the decree of that synod held from all eternity and in this sense i say the world was before the creation and at an end before it had a beginning and thus i was dead before i was alive though my grave be england my dying place was paradise and eve miscarried of me before she conceived of cain now for that other virtue of charity without which faith is a mere notion and of no existence i have ever endeavoured to nourish the merciful disposition and humane inclination i borrowed from my parents and regulate it to the written and prescribed laws of charity and if i hold the true anatomy of myself i am delineated and naturally framed to such a piece of virtue for i am of a constitution so general that it consorts and sympathizeth with all things i have no antipathy or rather idiosyncrasy in diet humour air anything i wonder not at the french for their dishes of frogs snails and toadstools nor at the jews for locusts and grasshoppers but being amongst them make them my common viands and i find they agree with my stomach as well as theirs i could digest 
a salad gathered in a churchyard as well as in a garden. I cannot start at the presence of a serpent, scorpion, lizard, or salamander. At the sight of a toad or viper I find in me no desire to take up a stone to destroy them. I feel not in myself those common antipathies that I can discover in others. Those national repugnances do not touch me, nor do I behold with prejudice the French, Italian, Spaniard, or Dutch, but where I find their actions in balance with my countrymen's, I honour, love, and embrace them in the same degree. I was born in the eighth climate, but seem for to be framed and constellated unto all. I am no plant that will not prosper out of a garden. All places, all airs, make unto me one country. I am in England, everywhere, and under any meridian. I have been shipwrecked, yet am not an enemy with the sea or winds. I can study, play, or sleep in a tempest. In brief, I am averse from nothing. My conscience would give me the lie if I should absolutely detest or hate any essence but the devil or so at least abhor anything but that we might come to composition. If there be any among those common objects of hatred I do contemn and laugh at, it is that great enemy of reason, virtue and religion, the multitude, that numerous piece of monstrosity which taken asunder seem men and the reasonable creatures of God but confused together make but one great beast, and a monstrosity more prodigious than Hydra. It is no breach of charity to call these fools. It is a style all holy writers have afforded them, set down by Solomon in canonical scripture, and a point of our faith to believe so. Neither in the name of multitude do I only include the base and minor sort of people, there is a rabble even amongst the gentry, a sort of plebeian heads, whose fancy moves with the same wheel as these, men in the same level with mechanics, though their fortunes do somewhat gild their infirmities, and their purses compound for their follies. I must give no alms to satisfy the hunger of my brother, but to fulfil and accomplish the will and command of my God. I draw not my purse for his sake that demands it, but his that enjoined it. I believe no man upon the rhetoric of his miseries, nor to content mine own commiserating disposition, for this is still but moral charity, and an act that oweth more to passion than reason. He that relieves another upon the bare suggestion and bowels of pity doth not do this so much for his sake as for his own. For by compassion we make others' misery our own, and so by relieving them we relieve ourselves also. It is as erroneous a conceit to redress other men's misfortunes upon the common considerations of merciful natures, that it may be one day our own case, for this is a sinister and politic kind of charity where we seem to bespeak the pities of men in the like occasions. And truly, I have observed that those professed animosinaries, though in a crowd or multitude, do yet direct and place their petitions on a few and selected persons. There is surely a physiognomy which those experienced and master mendicants observe, whereby they instantly discover a merciful aspect and will single out a face wherein they spy the signatures and marks of mercy. For there are mystically in our faces certain characters which carry in them the motto of our souls, wherein he that cannot read ABC may read our natures. I hold, moreover, that there is a phytonomy or physiognomy, not only of men, but of plants and vegetables, and in every one of them some outward figures which hang as signs or bushes of their inward forms. The finger of God hath left an inscription upon all his works, not graphical or composed of letters, 
but of their several forms constitutions parts and operations which aptly joined together do make one word that doth express their natures by these letters god calls the stars by their names and by this alphabet adam assigned to every creature a name peculiar to its nature now there are besides these characters in our faces certain mystical figures in our hands which i dare not call mere dashes strokes a la volée or at random because delineated by a pencil that never works in vain and hereof i take more particular notice because i carried that in mine own hand which i could never read or discover in another aristotle i confess in his acute and singular book of physiognomy hath made no mention of chiromancy yet i believe the egyptians who were nearer addicted to those abstruse and mystical sciences had a knowledge therein to which those vagabond and counterfeit egyptians did after pretend and perhaps retained a few corrupted principles which sometimes might verify their prognostics it is a common wonder of all men how among so many millions of faces there shall be none alike now contrary i wonder as much how there shall be any he that shall consider how many thousand several words have been carelessly and without study composed out of twenty-four letters with all how many hundred lines there are to be drawn in the fabric of one man shall easily find that this variety is necessary and it will be very hard that they shall so concur as to make one portrait like another let a painter carelessly limb out a million of faces and shall find them all different yea let him have his copy before him yet after all his art there will remain a sensible distinction for the pattern or example of everything is the perfectest in that kind whereof we still come short though we transcend or go beyond it because herein it is wide and agrees not in all points unto its copy nor doth the similitude of creatures disparage the variety of nature nor any way confound the works of god for even in things alike there is diversity and those that do seem to accord do manifestly disagree and thus is man like god for in the same things that we resemble him we are utterly different from him there was never anything so like another as in all points to concur there will ever some reserved difference slip in to prevent the identity without which two several things would not be alike but the same which is impossible naturally amorous of all that is beautiful i can look a whole day with delight upon a handsome picture though it be but of an horse it is my temper and i like it the better to affect all harmony and sure there is music even in the beauty and the silent note which cupid strikes far sweeter than the sound of an instrument but there is music wherever there is harmony order or proportion and thus far we may maintain the music of the spheres for those well-ordered motions and regular paces though they give no sound unto the ear yet to the understanding they strike a note most full of harmony whatever is harmonically composed delights in harmony which makes me much distrust the symmetry of those heads which declaim against all church music for myself not only from my obedience but my particular genius i do embrace it for even that vulgar and tavern music which makes one man merry and another mad strikes in me a deep fit of devotion and a profound contemplation of the first composer there is something in it of divinity more than the ear discovers it is an hieroglyphical and shadowed lesson of the whole world and creatures of god such a melody to the ear as the whole world well understood would afford the understanding in brief 
it is a sensible fit of that harmony which intellectually sounds in the ears of god it unties the ligaments of my frame takes me to pieces dilates me out of myself and by degrees methinks resolves me into heaven i will not say with plato the soul is an harmony but harmonical and hath its nearest sympathy unto music thus some whose temper of body agrees and humours the constitution of their souls are born poets though indeed all are naturally inclined unto rhythm there is surely a nearer apprehension of anything that delights us in our dreams than in our waked senses without this i were unhappy for my awaked judgment discontents me ever whispering unto me that i am from my friend but my friendly dreams in the night requite me and make me think i am within his arms i thank god for my happy dreams as i do for my good rest but there is a satisfaction in them unto reasonable desires and such as can be content with a fit of happiness and surely it is not a melancholy conceit to think that we are all asleep in this world and that the conceits of this life are as mere dreams to those of the next as the phantasms of the night to the conceits of the day there is an equal delusion in both and the one doth but seem to be the emblem or picture of the other we are somewhat more than ourselves in our sleeps and the slumber of the body seems to be but the waking of the soul it is the legation of sense but the liberty of reason and our waking conceptions do not match the fancies of our sleeps at my nativity my ascendant was the watery sign of scorpius i was born in the planetary hour of saturn and i think i have a piece of that leaden planet in me i am in no way facetious nor disposed of the mirth and galliard eyes of company yet in one dream i can compose a whole comedy behold the action and apprehend the jests and laugh myself awake at the conceits thereof were my memory as faithful as my reason is then fruitful i would never study but in my dreams and this time also i would choose for my devotions but our grosser memories have then so little hold of our abstracted understandings that they forget the story and can only relate to our waked souls a confused and broken tale of that that hath passed aristotle who hath written a singular tract of sleep hath not methinks thoroughly defined it nor yet galen though he seemed to have corrected it for those noctambulos and night-walkers though in their sleep do yet enjoy the action of their senses we must therefore say that there is something in us that is not in the jurisdiction of morpheus and that those abstracted and ecstatic souls to walk about in their own corpse as spirits with the bodies they assume wherein they seem to hear see and feel though indeed the organs are destitute of sense and their natures of those faculties that should inform them thus it is observed that men sometimes upon the hour of their departure do speak and reason above themselves for then the soul beginning to be freed from the ligaments of the body begins to reason like herself and to discourse in a strain above mortality end of section twenty one section twenty two of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 22, Selected Excerpts from Christian Morals and Urn Burial, by Sir Thomas Brown. 
from Christian morals. When thou lookest upon the imperfections of others, allow one eye for what is laudable in them, and the balance they have from some excellency which may render them considerable. While we look with fear or hatred upon the teeth of the viper, we may behold his eye with love. In venomous natures something may be amiable. Poisons afford antipoisons. Nothing is totally or altogether uselessly bad. Notable virtues are sometimes dashed with notorious vices, and in some vicious tempers have been found illustrious acts of virtue, which makes such observable worth in some actions of King Demetrius, Antonius, and Ahab, as are not to be found in the same kind in Aristides, Numera, David. Constancy, generosity, clemency, and liberality have been highly conspicuous in some persons, not marked out in other concerns, for example, or imitation. But since goodness is exemplary in all, if others have not our virtues, let us not be wanting in theirs, nor scorning them for their vices whereof we are free be condemned by their virtues wherein we are deficient. There is dross, alloy, and embasement in all human tempers, and he flieth without wings, who thinks to find ophir or pure metal in any. For perfection is not, like light, centred in any one body, but like the dispersed seminalities of vegetables at the creation, scattered through the whole mass of the earth, no place producing all and almost all some. So that it is well if a perfect man can be made out of many men, and to the perfect eye of God, even out of mankind. Time which perfects some things, imperfects also others. Could we intimately apprehend the ideated man and as he stood in the intellect of God upon the first exertion by creation, we might more narrowly comprehend our present degeneration and how widely we are fallen from the pure exemplar and idea of our nature. For after this corruptive elongation from a primitive and pure creation we are almost lost in degeneration and Adam hath not only fallen from his creator, but we ourselves from Adam, our Tycho and primary generator. If generous honesty, valour and plain dealing be the cognizance of thy family or characteristic of thy country, hold fast such inclinations sucked in with thy first breath and which lay in the cradle with thee, Fall not into transforming degenerations which, under the old name, create a new nation. Be not an alien in thine own nation, bring not Orontes into Tiber. Learn the virtues, not the vices of thy foreign neighbours, and make thy imitation by discretion, not contagion. Feel something of thyself in the noble acts of thy ancestors, and find in thine own genius that of thy predecessors. Rest not under the expired merits of others. Shine by those of thine own. Flame not like the central fire which enlighteneth no eyes, which no man seeth, and most men think there is no such thing to be seen, Add one ray unto the common lustre, and not only to the number, but the note of thy generation. And prove not a cloud, but an asterisk in thy region. Since thou hast an alarum in thy breast, which tells thee thou hast a living spirit in thee above two thousand times in an hour, dull not away thy days in slothful supinity and the tediousness of doing nothing. To strenuous minds there is an inquietude in over-quietness, and no laboriousness in labour. And to tread a mile after the slow pace of a snail or the heavy measures of the lazy of Brasilia, 
were a most tiring penance and worse than a race of some furlongs at the olympics the rapid courses of the heavenly bodies are rather imitable by our thoughts than our corporeal motions yet the solemn motions of our lives amount unto a greater measure than is commonly apprehended some few men have surrounded the globe of the earth yet many in the set locomotions and movements of their days have measured the circuit of it and twenty thousand miles have been exceeded by them move circumspectly not meticulously but rather carefully solicitous than anxiously solicitudinous think not there is a lion in the way nor walk with leaden sandals in the paths of goodness but in all virtuous motions let prudence determine thy measures strive not to run like hercules a furlong in a breath festination may prove precipitation deliberating delay may be wise cunctation and slowness no slothfulness despise not the obliquities of younger ways nor despair of better things whereof there is yet no prospect who would imagine that diogenes who in his younger days was a falsifier of money should in the after course of his life be so great a contemner of metal some negroes who believe the resurrection think that they shall rise white even in this life regeneration may imitate resurrection our black and vicious tinctures may wear off and goodness clothe us with candour good admonitions knock not always in vain there will be signal examples of god's mercy and the angels must not want their charitable rejoices for the conversion of lost sinners figures of most angles do nearest approach unto circles which have no angles at all some may be near unto goodness who are conceived far from it and many things happen not likely to ensue from any promises of antecedencies culpable beginnings have found commendable conclusions and infamous courses pious retractions detestable sinners have proved exemplary converts on earth and may be glorious in the apartment of mary magdalene in heaven men are not the same through all divisions of their ages time experience self-reflections and god's mercies make in some well-tempered minds a kind of translation before death and men to differ from themselves as well as from other persons here of the old world afforded many examples to the infamy of latter ages wherein men too often live by the rule of their inclinations so that without any astral prediction the first day gives the last men are commonly as they were or rather as bad dispositions run into worser habits the evening doth not crown but sourly conclude the day if the almighty will not spare us according to his merciful capitulation at sodom if his goodness please not to pass over a great deal of bad for a small pittance of good or to look upon us in the lump there is slender hope for mercy or sound presumption of fulfilling half his will either in persons or nations they who excel in some virtues being so often defective in others few men driving at the extent and amplitude of goodness but computing themselves by their best parts and others by their worst are content to rest in those virtues which others commonly want which makes this speckled face of honesty in the world and which was the imperfection of the old philosophers and great pretenders unto virtue who well declining the gaping vices of intemperance incontinency violence and oppression were yet blindly peccant in iniquities of closer faces were envious malicious contemners scoffers censurers 
and stuffed with vivid vices no less depraving the ethereal particle and diviner portion of man for envy malice hatred are the qualities of satan close and dark like himself and where such brands smoke the soul cannot be white vice may be had at all prices expensive and costly iniquities which make the noise cannot be every man's sins but the soul may be foully inclinated at a very low rate and a man may be cheaply vicious to the perdition of himself having been long tossed in the ocean of the world he will by that time feel the indraught of another unto which this seems but preparatory and without it of no high value he will experimentally find the emptiness of all things and the nothing of what is past and wisely grounding upon the true christian expectations finding so much past will wholly fix upon what is to come he will long for perpetuity and live as though he made haste to be happy the last may prove the prime part of his life and those his best days which he lived nearest heaven live happy in the elysium of a virtuously composed mind and let intellectual contents exceed the delights wherein mere pleasurists take their paradise bear not too slack reins upon pleasure nor let complexion or contagion betray thee unto exorbitancy of delight make pleasure thy recreation or intermissive relaxation not thy diana life and profession voluptuousness is as insatiable as covetousness tranquillity is better than jollity and to appease pain than to invent pleasure our hard entrance into the world our miserable going out of it our sicknesses disturbances and sad encounters in it do clamorously tell us we came not into the world to run a race of delight but to perform the sober acts and serious purposes of man which to omit were foully to miscarry in the advantage of humanity to play away an uniterable life and to have lived in vain forget not the capital end and frustrate not the opportunity of once living dream not of any kind of metempsychosis or transanimation but into thine own body and that after a long time and then also unto wail or bliss according to thy first and fundamental life upon a curricle in this world depends a long course of the next and upon a narrow scene here an endless expansion hereafter in vain some think to have an end of their beings with their lives things cannot get out of their natures or be or not be in despite of their constitutions rational existences in heaven perish not at all and but partially on earth that which is thus once will in some way be always the first living human soul is still alive and all adam hath found no period since the stars of heaven do differ in glory since it hath pleased the almighty hand to honour the north pole with lights above the south since there are some stars so bright that they can hardly be looked upon some so dim that they can scarcely be seen and vast numbers not to be seen at all even by artificial eyes read thou the earth in heaven and things below from above look contentedly upon the scattered difference of things and expect not equality in lustre dignity or perfection in regions or persons below where numerous numbers must be content to stand like lacteous or nebulous stars little taken notice of or dim in their generations all which may be contentedly allowable in the affairs and ends of this world 
and in suspension unto what will be in the order of things hereafter and the new system of mankind which will be in the world to come when the last may be the first and the first the last when lazarus may sit above caesar and the just obscure on earth shall shine like the sun in heaven when personations shall cease and histrionism of happiness be over when reality shall rule and all shall be as they shall be for ever from hydriotaphia or urn burial in the jewish hypogeum and subterranean cell at rome was little observable beside the variety of lamps and frequent draughts of the holy candlestick in authentic draughts of antony and jerome we meet with thigh bones and death's heads but the cemeterial cells of ancient christians and martyrs were filled with draughts of scripture stories not declining the flourishes of cypress palms and olive and the mystical figures of peacocks doves and cocks but iterately affecting the portraits of enoch lazarus jonas and the vision of ezekiel as hopeful draughts and hinting imagery of the resurrection which is the life of the grave and sweetens our habitations in the land of moles and pismires the particulars of future beings must needs be dark unto ancient theories which christian philosophy yet determines but in a cloud of opinions a dialogue between two infants in the womb concerning the state of this world might handsomely illustrate our ignorance of the next whereof methinks we yet discourse in plato's den and are but embryon philosophers pythagoras escapes in the fabulous hell of dante among that swarm of philosophers wherein whilst we meet with plato and socrates cato is to be found no lower place than purgatory among all the set epicurus is most considerable whom men make honest without an elysium who contemned life without encouragement of immortality and making nothing after death yet made nothing of the king of terrors were the happiness of the next world as closely apprehended as the felicities of this it were a martyrdom to live and unto such as consider none hereafter it must be more than death to die which makes us amazed at those audacities that durst be nothing and return into their chaos again certainly such spirits as could contemn death when they expected no better being after would have scorned to live had they known any and therefore we applaud not the judgments of machiavel that christianity makes men cowards or that with the confidence of but half dying the despised virtues of patience and humility have abased the spirits of men which pagan principles exalted but rather regulated the wildness of audacities in the attempts grounds and eternal sequels of death wherein men of the boldest spirits are often prodigiously temerarious nor can we extenuate the valour of ancient martyrs who contemned death in the uncomfortable scene of their lives and in their decrepit martyrdoms did probably lose not many months of their days or parted with life when it was scarce worth the living for Beside that long time past holds no consideration unto a slender time to come, they had no small disadvantage from the constitution of old age, which naturally makes men fearful and complexionally superannuated from the bold and courageous thoughts of youth and fervent years. But the contempt of death from corporal animosity promoteth not our felicity they may sit in the orchestra and noblest seats of heaven who have held up shaking hands in the fire and humanly contended for glory meanwhile epicurus lies deep in dante's hell wherein we meet with tombs enclosing souls which denied their immortalities but whether the virtuous heathen who lived better than he spake or erring in the principles of himself yet 
lived above philosophers of more specious maxims lie so deep as he is placed at least so low as not to rise against christians who believing or knowing that truth have lastingly denied it in their practice and conversation were a query too sad to insist on but all almost apprehensions rested in opinions of some future being which ignorantly or coldly believed begat those perverted conceptions ceremonies sayings which christians pity or laugh at happy are they which live not in that disadvantage of time when men could say little for futurity but from reason whereby the noblest minds fell often upon doubtful deaths and melancholy dissolutions with those hopes socrates warmed his doubtful spirits against that cold potion and cato before he durst give the fatal stroke spent part of the night in reading the immortality of plato thereby confirming his wavering hand unto the animosity of that attempt it is the heaviest stone that melancholy can throw at a man to tell him he is at the end of his nature or that there is no farther state to come unto which this seems progressional and otherwise made in vain without this accomplishment the natural expectation and desire of such a state were but a fallacy in nature unsatisfied considerators would quarrel at the justice of their constitutions and rest content that adam had fallen lower whereby by knowing no other original and deeper ignorance of themselves they might have enjoyed the happiness of inferior creatures who in tranquillity possess their constitutions as having not the apprehension to deplore their own natures and being framed below the circumference of these hopes or cognition of better being the wisdom of god hath necessitated their contentment but the superior ingredient and obscured part of ourselves whereto all present felicities afford no resting contentment will be able at last to tell us we are more than our present selves and evacuate such hopes in the fruition of their own accomplishments ellipsis but the iniquity of oblivion blindly scattereth her poppy and deals with the memory of men without distinction to merit of perpetuity who can but pity the founder of the pyramids erostratus lives that burnt the temple of diana he is almost lost that built it time hath spared the epitaph of adrian's horse confounded that of himself in vain we compute our felicities by the advantage of our good names since bad have equal durations and thersites is like to live as long as agamemnon who knows whether the best of men be known or whether there be not more remarkable persons forgot than any that stand remembered in the known account of time without the favour of the everlasting register the first man had been as unknown as the last and methuselah's long life had been his only chronicle oblivion is not to be hired the greater part must be content to be as though they had not been to be found in the register of god not in the record of man twenty-seven names make up the first story and the recorded names ever since contain not one living century the number of the dead long exceedeth all that shall live the night of time far surpasseth the day and who knows when was the equinox every hour adds unto that current arithmetic which scarce stands one moment and since death must be the lucina of life and even pagans could doubt whether thus to live were to die 
since our longest sun sets at right declensions and makes but winter arches and therefore it cannot be long before we lie down in darkness and have our light in ashes since the brother of death daily haunts us with dying mementos and time that grows old itself bids us hope no long duration diaternity is a dream and folly of expectation footnote two and have our light in ashes according to the custom of the jews who placed a lighted wax candle in a pot of ashes by the corpse darkness and light divide the course of time and oblivion shares with memory a great part even of our living beings we slightly remember our felicities and the smartest strokes of affliction leave but short smart upon us sense endureth no extremities and sorrows destroy us or themselves to weep into stones are fables afflictions induce callosities miseries are slippery or fall like snow upon us which notwithstanding is no unhappy stupidity to be ignorant of evils to come and forgetful of evils past is a merciful provision in nature whereby we digest the mixture of our few and evil days and our delivered senses not relapsing into cutting remembrances our sorrows are not kept raw by the edge of repetitions a great part of antiquity contented their hopes of subsistency with a transmigration of their souls a good way to continue their memories while having the advantage of plural successions they could not but act something remarkable in such variety of beings and enjoying the fame of their past selves making accumulation of glory until their last durations others rather than be lost in the uncomfortable night of nothing were content to recede into the common being and make one particle of the public soul of all things which was no more than to return into their unknown and divine original again egyptian ingenuity was more unsatisfied contriving their bodies in sweet consistencies to attend the return of their souls but all was vanity feeding the wind and folly the egyptian mummies which cambyses or time hath spared avarice now consumeth mummy is become merchandise mizraim cures wounds and pharaoh is sold for balsams ellipsis there is nothing strictly immortal but immortality whatever hath no beginning may be confident of no end which is the peculiar of that necessary essence that cannot destroy itself and the highest strain of omnipotency to be so powerfully constituted as not to suffer even from the power of itself all others have a dependent being and within the reach of destruction but the sufficiency of christian immortality frustrates all earthly glory and the quality of either state after death makes a folly of posthumous memory god who can only destroy our souls and hath assured our resurrection either of our bodies or names hath directly promised no duration wherein there is so much of chance that the boldest expectants have found unhappy frustration and to hold long subsistence seems but escape in oblivion but man is a noble animal splendid in ashes and pompous in the grave solemnizing nativities and deaths with equal lustre nor omitting ceremonies of bravery in the infamy of his nature Ellipsis. life is a pure flame and we live by an invisible sun within us a small fire sufficeth for life great flames seem too little after death while men vainly affected pyres and to burn like sardanapalus 
but the wisdom of funeral laws found the folly of prodigal blazes and reduced undoing fires into the rule of sober obsequies wherein few could be so mean as not to provide wood pitch a mourner and an urn ellipsis while some have studied monuments others have studiously declined them and some have been so vainly boisterous that they durst not acknowledge their graves wherein alaricus seems more subtle who had a river turned to hide his bones at the bottom even Scylla, who thought himself safe in his urn, could not prevent revenging tongues and stones thrown at his monument. Happy are they whom privacy makes innocent, who deal so with men in this world that they are not afraid to meet them in the next, who, when they die, make no commotion among the dead, and are not touched with that poetical taunt of Isaiah. Pyramids arches obelisks were but the irregularities of vain glory and wild enormities of ancient magnanimity but the most magnanimous resolution rests in the christian religion which trampleth upon pride and sits on the neck of ambition humbly pursuing that infallible perpetuity unto which all others must diminish their diameters and be poorly seen in angles of contingency pious spirits who passed their days in raptures of futurity made little more of this world than the world that was before it while they lay obscure in the chaos of preordination and night of their forebeings and if any have been so happy as truly to understand christian annihilation ecstasis exolution liquefaction transformation the kiss of the spouse gustation of god and ingression into the divine shadow they have already had a handsome anticipation of heaven the glory of the world is surely over and the earth in ashes unto them end of section twenty two Section 23 of the Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 23, selected excerpts from A Fragment on Mummies, A Letter to a Friend, and Pseudoxia Epidemica, by Sir Thomas Brown from a fragment on mummies why is egypt prodigal of her embalments wrapped up her princes and great commanders in aromatical folds and studiously extracting from corruptible bodies their corruption ambitiously look forward to immortality from which vainglory we have become acquainted with many remnants of the old world who could discourse unto us of the great things of yore and tell us strange tales of the son of Mizraim and ancient braveries of Egypt? Wonderful indeed are the preserves of time which open unto us mummies from crypts and pyramids and mammoth bones from caverns and excavations, whereof man hath found the best preservation appearing unto us in some sort fleshly, while beasts must be fain of an osseous continuance in what original this practice of the egyptians had root divers authors dispute while some place the origin hereof in the desire to prevent the separation of the soul by keeping the body untabified and alluring the spiritual part to remain by sweet and precious odours but all this was but a fond inconsideration the soul having broken its reader's note ellipsis is not stayed by bands and cloths, nor to be recalled by sabean odours but fleeth to the place of the invisibles the ubi of spirits and needeth a surer than hermes seal to imprison it to its medicated trunk which yet 
subsists anomalously in its indestructible case and like a widow looking for her husband anxiously awaits its return readers note ellipsis that mummy is medicinal the arabian dr harley delivereth and divers confirms but of the particular uses thereof there is much discrepancy of opinion while hoffmannus prescribes the same to epileptics johann de Meralto commends the use thereof to gouty persons bacon likewise extols it as a styptic and Uncanius considers it of efficacy to resolve a coagulated blood. Meanwhile, we hardly applaud Francis I of France, who always carried mummies with him as a panacea against all disorders, and were the efficacy thereof more clearly made out, scarce conceive the use thereof allowable in physic, exceeding the barbarities of Cambyses, and turning old heroes into unworthy potions shall egypt lend out her ancients unto chirurgeons and apothecaries and chaos and semiticus be weighed unto us for drugs treat of chamneys and amosis in electuaries and pills and be cured by cannibal mixtures surely such a diet is dismal vampirism and exceeds in horror the black banquet of domitian not to be paralleled except in those arabian feasts wherein ghouls feed horribly but the common opinion of the virtues of mummy bred great consumption thereof and princes and great men contended for this strange panacea wherein jews dealt largely manufacturing mummies from dead carcasses and giving them the names of kings while specifics were compounded from crosses and gibbet leavings they wanted not a set of arabians who counterfeited mummies so accurately that it needed great skill to distinguish the false from the true queasy stomachs would hardly fancy the doubtful potion wherein one might so easily swallow a cloud for his juno and defraud the fowls of the air while in conceit enjoying the concerts of canopus those dark caves and mummy repositories are satan's abodes wherein he speculates and rejoices on human vainglory and keeps those kings and conquerors whom alive he bewitched whole for that great day wherein he will claim his own and marshal the kings of nihilus and thebes in sad procession unto the pit death that fatal necessity which so many would overlook or blinkingly survey the old egyptians held continually before their eyes their embalmed ancestors they carried about at their banquets as holding them still a part of their families and not thrusting them from their places at feasts they wanted not likewise a sad preacher at their tables to admonish them daily of death surely an unnecessary discourse while they banqueted in sepulchres whether this were not making too much of death as tending to assuefaction some reason there is to doubt but certain it is that such practices would hardly be embraced by our modern gourmand who like not to look on the faces of mortua or be elbowed by mummies yet in those huge structures and pyramidal immensities of the builders were off so little as known they seemed not so much to raise sepulchres or temples to death as to contemn and disdain it astonishing heaven with their audacities and looking forward with delight to their interment in those eternal piles of their living habitations they made little account conceiving of them but as aspedia or inns while they adorned the sepulchres of the dead and planting thereon lasting bases defied the crumbling torches of time and the misty vaporousness of oblivion yet all were but babel vanities time sadly overcometh all things and is now dominant and sitteth upon a sphinx and looketh unto memphis and old thebes 
while his sister oblivion reclineth semi-somnus on a pyramid gloriously triumphing making puzzles of titanian erections and turning old glories into dreams history sinketh beneath her cloud the traveller as he paceth amazedly through those deserts asketh of her who builded them and she mumbleth something but what it is he heareth not egypt itself is now become the land of obliviousness and doteth her ancient civility is gone and her glory hath vanished as a phantasma her youthful days are over and her face hath become wrinkled and tetric she poureth not upon the heavens astronomy is dead unto her and knowledge maketh other cycles canopus is afar off memnon resoundeth not to the sun and nihilus heareth strange voices her monuments are but hieroglyphically sempiternal osiris and anubis her avaruncus deities have departed while Horus yet remains dimly shadowing the principle of vicissitude and the affluxion of things but receiveth little oblation readers note According to Wikipedia, the Dictionary of National Biography and various scholarly online sources, the extract just read, the fragment on mummies, is not by Thomas Brown, but is a highly successful literary hoax, perpetrated in 1838 by James Crossley. End of reader's note. From a letter to a friend. He was willing to quit the world alone and altogether, leaving no earnest behind him for corruption or aftergrave, having small content in that common satisfaction to survive or live in another, but amply satisfied that his disease should die with himself, nor revive in a posterity to puzzle physic and make sad mementos of their parent hereditary. Ellipsis in this deliberate and creeping progress unto the grave he was somewhat too young and of too noble a mind to fall upon that stupid symptom observable in divers persons near their journey's end and which may be reckoned among the mortal symptoms of their last disease that is to become more narrow-minded miserable and tenacious unready to part with anything when they are ready to part with all, and afraid to want, when they have no time to spend. Meanwhile, physicians who know that many are mad but in a single depraved imagination and one prevalent discipiency, and that beside and out of each single delirium a man may meet with sober actions and good sense in bedlam, cannot but smile to see the heirs and concerned relations congratulating themselves on the sober departure of their friends and though they behold such mad covetous passages content to think they die in good understanding and in their sober senses avarice which is not only infidelity but idolatry either from covetous progeny or questory education had no root in his breast who made good works the expression of his faith and was big with desires unto public and lasting charities and surely where good wishes and charitable intentions exceed abilities the oracle beneficiency may be more than a dream they build not castles in the air who would build churches on earth and though they leave no such structures here may lay good foundations in heaven in brief his life and death were such as I could not blame them who wished the like, and almost to have been himself. Almost, I say, for though we may wish the prosperous appurtenances of others, or to be another in his happy accidents, yet so intrinsical is every man unto himself, that some doubt may be made whether any would exchange his being, or substantially become another man. 
he had wisely seen the world at home and abroad and thereby observed under what variety men are deluded in the pursuit of that which is not here to be found and although he had no opinion of reputed felicities below and apprehended men widely out in the estimate of such happiness yet his sober contempt of the world brought no democratism or cynicism no laughing or snarling at it as well understanding there are not felicities in this world to satisfy a serious mind and therefore to soften the stream of our lives we are fain to take in the reputed contentions of this world to unite with the crowd in their beatitudes and to make ourselves happy by consortion opinion or coexistimation for strictly to separate from received and customary felicities and to confine under the rigour of realities were to contract the consolation of our beings into two uncomfortable circumscriptions not to be content with life is the unsatisfactory state of those who destroy themselves who being afraid to live run blindly upon their own death which no man fears by experience and the stoics had a notable doctrine to take away the fear thereof that is in such extremities to desire that which is not to be avoided and wish what might be feared and so made evils voluntary and to suit their own desires which took off the terror of them but ancient martyrs were not encouraged by such fallacies who though they feared not death were afraid to be their own executioners and therefore thought it more wisdom to crucify their lusts than their bodies to circumcise than stab their hearts and to mortify than kill themselves his willingness to leave this world about that age when most men think they may best enjoy it though paradoxical unto worldly years was not strange unto mine who have so often observed that many though old oft stick fast unto the world and seem to be drawn like carcasses oxen backward with great struggling and reluctancy unto the grave the long habit of living makes mere men more hardly to part with life and all to be nothing but what is to come to live at the rate of the old world when some could scarce remember themselves young may afford no better digested death than a more moderate period many would have thought it an happiness to have had their lot in life in some notable conjuncture of ages past but the uncertainty of future times has tempted few to make a part in ages to come and surely he that hath taken the true altitude of things and rightly calculated the degenerate state of this age is not likely to envy those that shall live in the next much less three or four hundred years hence when no man can comfortably imagine what face this world will carry and therefore since every age makes a step into the end of all things and the scripture affords so hard a character of the last times quiet minds will be content with their generations and rather bless ages past than be ambitious of those to come though age had set no seal upon his face yet a dim eye might clearly discover fifty in his actions and therefore since wisdom is the grey hair and an unspotted life old age although his years came short he might have been said to have held up with longer livers and to have been solomon's old man and surely if we deduct all those days of our life which we might wish unlived and which abate the comfort of those we now live if we reckon up only those days which god hath accepted of our lives a life of good years will hardly be a span long the son in this sense may outlive the father and none be climacterically old he that early arriveth unto the parts and prudence of age is happily old without the uncomfortable attendance of it 
and tis superfluous to live unto grey hairs when in a precocious temper we anticipate the virtues of them in brief he cannot be accounted young who outliveth the old man he that hath early arrived unto the measure of a perfect stature in christ hath already fulfilled the prime and longest intention of his being and one day lived after the perfect rule of piety is to be preferred before sinning immortality although he attained not unto the years of his predecessors yet he wanted not those preserving virtues which confirm the thread of weaker constitutions cautelous chastity and crafty sobriety were far from him those jewels were paragon without flaw hair ice or cloud in him which affords me a hint to proceed in these good wishes and few mementos unto you some relations whose truth we fear from pseudoxia epidemica many other accounts like these we meet sometimes in history scandalous unto christianity and even unto humanity whose verities not only but whose relations honest minds do deprecate for his sins heteroclital and such as want either name or precedent there is oft times a sin even in their histories we desire no records of such enormities sins should be accounted new so that they may be esteemed monstrous they admit of monstrosity as they fall from their rarity for men count it venial to err with their forefathers and foolishly conceive they divide a sin in its society the pens of men may sufficiently expatiate without these singularities of villainy for as they increase the hatred of vice in some so do they enlarge the theory of wickedness in all this is one thing that may make latter ages worse than were the former for the vicious examples of ages past poison the curiosity of these present affording a hint of sin unto seducible spirits and soliciting those unto the imitation of them whose heads were never so perversely principled as to invent them in this kind we commend the wisdom and goodness of galen who would not leave unto the world too subtle a theory of poisons unarming thereby the malice of venomous spirits whose ignorance must be contented with sublimate and arsenic for surely there are subtler venerations such as will invisibly destroy and like the basilisks of heaven in things of this nature silence commendeth history it is the veniable part of things lost wherein there must never rise a pancerolus nor remain any register but that of hell end of section twenty three Section 24 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 24. Selected Poems by William Brown, 1591-1643. Among the English poets, fatuous for their imaginative interpretation of nature, high rank must be given to William Brown, who belongs in the list headed by Spencer, and including Thomas Lodge, Michael Drayton, Nicholas Brayton, George Wither, and Phineas Fletcher. Although he shows skill and charm in style of various kinds of verse, his name rests chiefly upon his largest work, Britannia's Pastorals. This is much wider in scope than the title suggests if one follows the definition given by pope in his discourse on pastoral poetry he says a pastoral is an imitation of the action of a shepherd or one considered under that character the form of this imitation is dramatic or narrated or mixed of both 
the fable simple the manners not too polite nor too rustic the thoughts are plain yet admit a little quickness and passion if we would copy nature it must be useful to take this idea along with us that pastoral is an image of what they call the golden age so that we are not to describe our shepherds as shepherds at this day really are but as they may be conceived then to have been when the best of men followed the employment we must therefore use some allusion to render a pastoral delightful and this consists in exposing the best side only of a shepherd's life and in concealing its miseries in his shepherd's pipe a series of ecluges brown follows this plan but britannia's pastorals contain rambling stories of hamadryads and oreads figures which are too shadowy to seem real yet stand in exquisite woodland landscapes when the story passes to the yellow sands and firth girt rocks washed by the crisp and curling waves from neptune's silver ever shaking breast or when it touches the mysteries of the ocean world over which thetis drives her silver throne the poet's fancy is as delicate as when he reveals in the earthy smell of the woods where the leaves golden and green hide from sight the feathered choir where glow the hips of scarlet berries where is heard the dropping of nuts and where the active bright-eyed squirrels leap from tree to tree the loves hardships and adventures of marina celadine redmond fida philosal alethea mentonia and amyntas do not hold the reader from delight in descriptions of the blackbird and dove calling from the dewy branches crystal streams lisping through banks purple with violets rosy with aglantine or sweet and wild thyme thickets where the rabbits hide sequestered nooks on which the elms and alders throw long shadows circles of green grass made by dancing elves rounded hills shut in by oaks pines birches and laurel where shepherds pipe on oaten straws or shag-haired satyrs frolic and sleep meadows whose carpets of cowslip and mint are freshened daily by nymphs pouring out gentle streams from crystal urns every now and then huntsmen in green dash through his sombre woods with their hounds in full cry anglers are seated by still pools shepherds dance around the maypole and the shepherdesses gather flowers for garlands gloomy caves appear surrounded by hawthorn and holly that outdares cold winter's ire and sheltering old hermits skilled in simples and the secret power of herbs sometimes the poet describes a choir where the tiny wren sings the treble robin redbreast the mean the thrush the tenor and the nightingale the countertenor while droning bees fill in the bass and shows us fairy haunts and customs with a delicacy only equalled by drayton and herrick several lyric songs of high order are scattered through the pastorals and the famous palinode on man is embedded in the third book as follows i truly know how men are born and whither they shall go i know that like to silkworms of one year or like a kind and wronged lover's tear or on the pathless waves a rudder's dint or like the little sparks of a flint or like to thin round cakes with cost perfumed or fireworks only made to be consumed i know that such is man and all that trust in that weak piece of animated dust the silkworm droops the lover's tears soon shed the ship's way quickly lost the sparkle dead the cake burns out in haste the fireworks done and man as soon as these as quickly gone little is known of brown's life he was a native of tavistock devonshire born it is thought in fifteen ninety one the son of thomas brown who is supposed by prince and his worthies of devon to have belonged to a knightly family according to wood who says he had a great mind in a little body he was sent to exeter college oxford about the beginning of the reign of james i leaving oxford without a degree he was admitted in sixteen twelve to the inner temple london and a little later he is discovered at oxford engaged as private tutor to robert dormer afterward earl of carnarvon in sixteen twenty four he received his degree of master of arts from oxford he appears to have settled in dorking and after sixteen forty nothing more is heard of him wood thinks he died in sixteen forty five but there is an entry in the tavistock register dated march twenty seventh sixteen forty three and reading william brown was buried on that day 
that he was devoted to the streams dales and downs of his native devonshire is shown in the pastorals where he sings hail thou my native soil thou blessed plot whose equal all the world affordeth not show me who can so many crystal rills such sweet clothed valleys or spiring hills such wood ground pastures quarries wealthy mines such rocks in whom the diamond fairy shines and in another place he says and tavy in my rhymes challenge adieu let it thy glory be that famous drake and i were born by thee the first book of Britannia's pastorals was written before its author was twenty and was published in sixteen thirty one the second book appeared in sixteen sixteen and both were reprinted in sixteen twenty five the third book was not published during brown's life the shepherd's pipe was published in sixteen fourteen and the inner temple mask written on the story of ulysses and circe for representation in sixteen fourteen was first published in thomas davy's edition of brown's work three volumes seventeen seventy two two critical editions of value have been brought out in recent years one by w carew hazlitt london eighteen sixty eight to sixty nine and the other by gordon goodwin and a h bullen eighteen ninety four in the third song of the second book says mr bullen in his preface there is a description of a delightful grove perfumed with odiferous buds and herbs of price where fruits hang in gallant clusters from the trees and birds tune their notes to the music of running water so fair a pleasance that you are fain where you last walked to turn and walk again a generous reader might apply that description to brown's poetry he might urge that breezes which blew down these leafy alleys and over those trim parterres were not more grateful than the fragrance exhaled from the pastorals that the brooks and burbs babble and twitter in the printed pages not less blithely than in that western paradise what so pleasant as to read of may games true love knots and shepherds piping in the shade of pixies and fairy circles of rustic bridles and junketings of angling hunting the squirrel nut gathering of such subjects william brown treats singing like the shepherd in the arcadia as though he would never grow old he was a happy poet it was his good fortune to grow up among wholesome surroundings whose gracious influences sank into his spirit he loved the hills and dales round tavistock and lovingly described them in his verse frequently he indulges in descriptions of sunrise and sunset they leave no vivid impression but charm the reader by their quiet beauty it cannot be denied that his fondness for simple homely images sometimes led him to sheer fatuity and candid admirers must also admit that despite his study of simplicity he could not refrain from hunting as the manner was after far-fetched outrageous conceits brown is a poet's poet drayton wither herbert and john davies of hereford wrote his praises mrs browning includes him in her vision of poets where she says drayton and brown with smiles they drew from outward nature still kept new from their own inward nature true milton studied him carefully and just as his influence is perceived in the works of keats so it is found in comus and lycidas brown acknowledges spencer and sidney as his masters and his work shows that he loved chaucer and shakespeare circe's charm song from the inner temple mask son of erebus and night high away and aim thy flight where consort none other fowl than the bat and sullen owl where upon thy limber grass poppy and mandragoras with like simples not a few hang for ever drops of dew where flows lethe without coil softly like a stream of oil hie thee hither gentle sleep with this greek no longer keep thrice i charge thee by my wand thrice with molly from my hand do i touch ulysses eyes and with the jaspis then arise sagest greek the hunted squirrel from britannia's pastorals then as a nimble squirrel from the wood ranging the hedges for his filbert food sits pertly on a bough his brown nuts cracking and from the shell the sweet white kernel taking 
till with their crooks and bags a sort of boys to share with him come with so great a noise that he is forced to leave a nut nigh broke and for his life leap to a neighbour oak thence to a beech thence to a row of ashes whilst through the quagmires and red water plashes the boys run dabbling through thick and thin one tears his hose another breaks his shin this torn and tattered hath with much ado got by the briars that hath lost his shoe this drops his band that headlong falls for haste another cries behind for being last with sticks and stones and many a sounding hula the little fool with no small sport they follow whilst he from tree to tree from spray to spray gets to the woods and hides him in his dray as careful merchants do expecting stand from britannia's pastorals as careful merchants do expecting stand after long time and merry gales of wind upon the place where their brave ships must land so wait i for the vessel of my mind upon a great adventure it is bound whose safe return will valued be at more than all the wealthy prizes which have crowned the golden wishes of an age before out of the east jewels of worth she brings the unvalued diamond of her sparkling eye wants in the treasures of all europe's kings and were it mine they nor their crowns should buy the sapphires ringed on her panting breast run as rich veins of ore about the mould and are in sickness with a pale possessed so true for them i should disvalue gold the melting rubies on her cherry lip are of such power to hold that as one day cupid flew thirsty by he stopped to sip and fastened there could never get away the sweets of candy are no sweets to me where hers i taste nor the perfumes of price robbed from the happy shrubs of araby as her sweet breath so powerful to entice o oh, hasten then if thou be not gone unto that wicked traffic through the main my powerful sigh shall quickly drive thee on and then begin to draw thee back again if in the mean rude waves have it oppressed it shall suffice i ventured at the best song of the sirens from the inner temple mask steer hither steer your winged pines all beaten mariners here lie love's undiscovered mines a prey to passengers perfumes far sweeter than the best which make the phoenix's urn and nest fear not your ships nor any to oppose you save our lips but come on shore where no joy dies till love hath gotten more for swelling waves are panting breasts where never storms arise exchange and be awhile our guests for stars gaze on our eyes the compass love shall hourly sing and as he goes about the ring we will not miss to tell each point he nameth with a kiss then come on shore where no joy dies till love hath gotten more an epistle on parting from epistles dear soul the time is come and we must part yet ere i go in these lines read my heart a heart so just so loving and so true so full of sorrow and so full of you that all i speak or write or pray or mean and which is all i can all that i dream is not without a sigh a thought of you and as your beauties are so they are true seven summers now are fully spent and gone since first i loved loved you and you alone and should mine eyes as many hundreds see yet none but you should claim a right in me a right so placed that time shall never hear of one so vowed or any loved so dear when i am gone if ever prayers moved you relate to none that i so well have loved you for all that know your beauty and desert would swear he never loved that knew to part why part we then that spring 
which but this day met some sweet river in his bed can play and with dimpled cheeks smile at their bliss who never know what separation is the amorous vine with wanton interlaces clips still rough the elm in her kind embraces doves with their doves sit billing in the groves and woo the lesser birds to sing their loves whilst hapless we in griefful absence sit yet dare not ask a hand to lessen it sonnets to celia fairest when by the rules of psalmistry you took my hand to try if you could guess by lines therein if any weight there be ordained to make me know some happiness i wished that those characters could explain whom i will never wrong with hope to win or that by them a copy might be ta'en by you alone what thoughts i have within but since the hand of nature did not set as providently loath to have it known the means to find that hidden alphabet mine eyes shall be the interpreters alone by them conceive my thoughts and tell me fair if now you see her that doth love me there were it not for you here should my pen have rest and take a long leave of sweet posy britannia's swains and rivers far by west should hear no more my oaten melody yet shall the song i sung of them a while unperfect lie and make no further known the happy loves of this our pleasant isle till i have left some record of mine own you are the subject now and writing you i well may versify not poetize here needs no fiction for the grace is true and virtues clip not with base flatteries here should i write what you deserve of praise others might wear but i should win the bays fairest when i am gone as now the glass of time is marked how long i have to stay let me entreat you ere from hence i pass perhaps from you for ever more away think that no common love hath fired my breast no base desire but virtue truly known which i may love and wish to have possessed were you the highest and fairest of any one tis not your lovely eye enforcing flames nor beauteous red beneath a snowy skin that so much binds me yours or makes your fames as the pure light and beauty shrined within yet outward parts i must affect of duty as for the smell we like the rose's beauty End of section 24section twenty five of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by marianne library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six by various authors section twenty five selected poems by henry howard brownell eighteen twenty to eighteen seventy two this poet prominent among those who gained their chief inspiration from the stirring events of the civil war was born in providence rhode island february sixth eighteen twenty and died in east hartford connecticut october thirty first eighteen seventy two he was graduated at trinity college hartford studied law and was admitted to the bar but instead of the legal profession adopted that of a teacher and made his home in hartford which was the residence of his uncle the bishop of connecticut although mr brownell soon became known as a writer of verse both grave and humorous it was not till the coming on of the civil war that his muse found truest and noblest expression with a poet's sensitiveness he foresaw the coming storm and predicted it in verse that has the ring of an ancient prophet and when the crash came he sang of the great deeds of warriors in the old heroic strain many of these poems like annus memorabilis and coming were born of the great passion of patriotism which took possession of him and were regarded only as the visions of a heated imagination but when the storm burst it was seen that he had the true vision as the dreadful drama unrolled brownell rose to greater issues and became the war poet par excellence the vigorous chronicler of great actions 
he was fond of the sea and ardently longed for the opportunity to witness if not to participate in a sea fight his desire was gratified in a singular way he had printed in a hartford paper a very felicitous verification of farragut's general orders in the fight at the mouth of the mississippi this attracted farragut's attention and he took steps to learn the name of the author when it was given commodore farragut he was not then admiral offered mr brownell the position of master's mate on board the hartford and attached the poet to him in the character of a private secretary thus he was present at the fight of mobile bay after the war he accompanied the admiral in his cruise in european waters although brownell was best known to the country by his descriptive poems the river fight and the bay fight which appear in his volume of collected works war's lyrics his title to be considered a true poet does not rest on these only he was unequal in his performance and occasionally was betrayed by grotesque humour into disregard of dignity and finish but he had both the vision and the lyric grace of the builder of lasting verse annus memorabilis congress eighteen sixty to sixty one stand strong and calm as fate not a breath of scorn or hate of taunt for the base or of menace for the strong since our fortunes must be sealed on that old and famous field where the right is set in battle with the wrong tis coming with the loom of Kamsin or simoom the tempest that shall try if we are of god or no its roar is in the city and they there be which cry let us cower and the storm may overblow now nay stand firm and fast that was a spiteful blast this is not a war of men but of angels good and ill tis hell that storms at heaven tis the black and deadly seven sworn gainst the shining ones to work their damned will how the ether glooms and burns as the tide of combat turns and the smoke and dust above it whirl and float it eddies in its streams and certes oft it seems as the sins had the seraphs fairly by the throat but we all have read in that legend grand and dead how michael and his host met the serpent and his crew naught has reached us of the fight but if i have dreamed aright twas a loud one and a long as ever thundered through right stiffly past a doubt the dragon fought it out and his angels each and all did for trophet their devoir there was crack of iron wings and whirl of scorpion stings hiss of bifid tongues and the pit in full uproar but not their oven scrolled in one brief line tis told calm as dew the apocalyptic pen that on the infinite shore their place was found no more god send the like on this our earth amen houghton mifflin and company boston words for the hallelujah chorus old john brown lies a-mouldering in the grave old john brown lies slumbering in his grave but john brown's soul is marching with the brave his soul is marching on glory glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah his soul is marching on he has gone to be a soldier in the army of the lord he is sworn as a private in the ranks of the lord he shall stand at armageddon with his brave old sword when heaven is marching on he shall file in front where the lines of battle form he shall face to front when the squares of battle form time with the column and charge in the storm where men are marching on ah foul tyrants do ye hear him where he comes ah black traitors do ye know him as he comes in thunder of the cannon and roll of the drums as we go marching on men may die and moulder in the dust men may die and arise again from dust shoulder to shoulder in the ranks of the just when heaven is marching on glory 
glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah his soul is marching on coming april eighteen sixty one world are thou ware of a storm hark to the ominous sound how the far-off gales their battle form and the great sea swells feel ground it comes the typhoon of death nearer and nearer it comes the horizon thunder of cannon breath and the roar of angry drums hurtle terror sublime swoop o'er the land to-day so the mist of wrong and crime the breath of our evil time be swept as by fire away Sycara. the wind of an autumn midnight is moaning around my door the curtains wave at the window the carpet lifts on the floor there are sounds like startled footfalls in the distant chambers now and the touching of airy ringers is busy on hand and brow tis thus in the soul's dark dwelling by the moody host unsought through the chambers of memory wander the invisible airs of thought for it bloweth where it listeth with a murmur loud or low whence it cometh whither it goeth none tell us and none may know now wearying round the portals of the vacant desolate mind as the doors of a ruined mansion that creak in the cold night wind and anon an awful memory sweeps o'er it fierce and high like the roar of a mountain forest when the midnight gale goes by then its voice subsides in wailing and ere the dawn of day murmuring fainter and fainter in the distance dies away suspiria noctis reading and reading little is the gain long dwelling with the minds of dead men leaves list rather to the melancholy rain drop dropping from the eaves still the old tale how hardly worth the telling hark to the wind again that mournful sound that all night long around this lonely dwelling moans like a dying hound end of section twenty five Section 26 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6, by various authors. Section 26. Selected Poems by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Part 1. Elizabeth Barrett Browning, 1809-1861. through 1861. Interesting to step back sixty years into the lives of Miss Mitford and her dear young friend Miss Barrett, when the S's of authoresses and poetesses and editresses and hermetesses make the pages sibilant, when books of beauty and keepsakes and the extraordinary methods of Finden's tableau make us wonder that literature survived, when Mr. Kenyon, taking Miss Midford to the giraffes and the diorama, called for, quote, Miss Barrett, a hermitess in Gloucester Place, who reads Greek as I do French, who has published some translations from Aeschylus, and some most striking poems our sweet miss barrett to think of virtue and genius is to think of her of her own life mrs browning writes quote, as to stories my story amounts to the knife grinders with nothing at all for a catastrophe a bird in a cage would have as good a story most of my events and nearly all my intense pleasure have passed in my thoughts End quote. She was born at Burn Hall, Durham, on March 6, 1809, and passed a happy childhood and youth in her father's country house at Hope End, Herefordshire. 
she was remarkably precocious reading homer in the original at eight years of age she said that in those days quote, the greeks were her demigods she dreamed more of agamemnon than of moses her black pony i wrote verses very early at eight years old and earlier but what is less common the early fancy turned into a will and remained with me end quote. at seventeen years of age she published the essay on mind and translated the prometheus of aeschylus some years later the family removed to london and here elizabeth on account of her continued delicate health kept in her room for months at a time the shock following on the death of her brother who was drowned before her eyes in torquay whither she had gone for rest completely shattered her physically now her life of seclusion in her london home began for years she lay upon a couch in a large comfortably darkened room seeing only the immediate members of her family and a few privileged friends and spending her days in writing and study reading miss mitford says almost every book worth reading in almost every language here robert browning met her they were married in eighteen forty six against the will of her father going abroad immediately they finally settled in florence at the casa guidi made famous by her poem bearing the same name their home became the center of attraction to visitors in florence and many of the finest minds in the literary and artistic world were among their friends hawthorne who visited them describes mrs browning as quote, a pale small person scarcely embodied at all and at any rate only substantial enough to put forth her slender fingers to be grasped and to speak with a shrill yet sweet tenuity of voice it is wonderful to see how small she is how pale her cheek how bright and dark her eyes there is not such another figure in the world and her black ringlets cluster down her neck and make her face look whiter she died in florence on the thirtieth of june eighteen sixty one and the citizens of florence placed a tablet to her memory on the walls of casa guidi the life and personality of elizabeth barrett browning seem to explain her poetry it is a life quote, without a catastrophe end quote, except perhaps to her devoted father and it is to this father's devotion that some of mrs browning's poetical sins are due for by him she was so pampered and shielded from every outside touch that all the woes common to humanity grew for her into awful tragedies her life was abnormal and unreal an unreality that passed more or less into everything she did indeed her resuscitation after meeting robert browning would mount into a miracle unless it were realized that nothing in her former life had been quite as woeful as it seemed that mrs browning was a woman of real genius even edward fitzgerald allowed and in speaking of shelley walter savage landor said quote, with the exception of burns he shelley and keats were inspired with a stronger spirit of poetry than any other poet since milton i sometimes fancy that elizabeth barrett browning comes next End quote this is very high praise from very high authority but none too high for mrs browning for her best work has the true lyric ring that spontaneity of thought and expression which comes when the singer forgets himself in his song and becomes tuneful under the stress of the moment's inspiration all of mrs browning's work is buoyed up by her luxurious and overflowing imagination with all its imperfections of technique its lapses of taste and faults of expression it always remains poetry throbbing with passion and emotion and rich in color and sound she wrote because she must her own assertions notwithstanding one cannot think of mrs browning as sitting down in cold blood to compose a poem according to fixed rules of art this is the secret of her shortcomings it is also the source of her strength and in her best work raises her high above those who with more technical skill have less of the true poet's divine fire and overflowing imagination so in the sonnets from the portuguese written at a time when her woman's nature was thrilled to its very depths by the love of her quote, most gracious singer of high poems end quote, and put forth as translations from another writer and tongue in these her imperfections drop away and she soars to marvellous heights of song 
such a lyric outburst as this which reveals with magnificent frankness the innermost secrets of an ardently loving woman's heart is unequalled in literature here the woman poet is strong and sane here she is free from obscurity and mannerisms and from grotesque rhymes she has stepped out from her life of visions and of morbid woes into a life of wholesome reality and of sweet reasonableness their literary excellence is due also to the fact that in the sonnet mrs browning was held to a rigid form and was obliged to curb her imagination and restrain her tendency to diffuseness of expression mr saintsbury goes so far as to say that the sonnet beginning quote, if thou wilt love me let it be for naught except for love's sake only end quote, does not fall far short of shakespeare aurora lee gives rise to the old question is it advisable to turn a three-volume novel into verse yet landor wrote about it quote, i am reading a poem full of thought and fascinating with fancy mrs browning's aurora lee in many places there is the wild imagination of shakespeare i am half drunk with it never did i think i should have a good draught of poetry again End quote ruskin somewhere considered it the greatest poem of the nineteenth century quote, with enough imagination to set up a dozen lesser poets End quote. and stedman calls it quote, a representative and original creation representative in a versatile kaleidoscopic presentment of modern life and issues original because the most idiosyncratic of its author's poems an audacious speculative freedom pervades it which smacks of the new world rather than the old aurora lee is a mirror of contemporary life while its learned and beautiful illustrations make it almost a handbook of literature and the arts although a most uneven production full of ups and downs of capricious and prosaic episodes it nevertheless contains poetry as fine as its author has given us elsewhere and enough spare inspiration to set up a dozen smaller poets the flexible verse is noticeably her own and often handled with as much spirit as freedom End quote. mrs browning herself declared in the most mature of her works quote, and the one into which my highest convictions upon life and art have entered End quote. consider this for it is not in mere death that men die most and after our first girding of the loins in youth's fine linen and fair broidery to run uphill and meet the rising sun we are apt to sit tired patient as a fool while others gird us with the violent bands of social figments feints and formalisms reversing our straight nature lifting up our base needs keeping down our lofty thoughts head downwards on the cross sticks of the world yet he can pluck us from that shameful cross god set our feet low and our foreheads high and teach us how a man was made to walk or this i've waked and slept through many nights and days since then but still that day will catch my breath like a nightmare there are fatal days indeed in which the fibrous years have taken root so deeply that they quiver to their tops whene'er you stir the dust of such a day again passion is but something suffered after all while art sets action on the top of suffering and this nothing is small no lily muffled hum of summer bee but finds some coupling with the spinning stars no pebble at your foot but proves a sphere earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with god but only he who sees takes off his shoes among mrs browning's smaller poems crowned and buried is notwithstanding serious defects of technique one of the most virile things she has written indeed some of her finest lines are to be found in it in the cry of the children and in cowper's grave the pathos is most true and deep lord walter's wife is an even more courageous vindication of the feminine essence than aurora lee and her vision of poets is said to vie in beauty with tennyson's own the fine thought and haunting beauty of a musical instrument with its matchless climax need not be dwelt on 
during her fifteen years residence in florence she threw herself with great enthusiasm into italian affairs and wrote some political poems of varying merit whose interest necessarily faded away when the occasion passed but among those poems inspired by the struggle for freedom casa guidi windows comes close to the sonnets from the portuguese and aurora lee and holds an enduring place for its high poetry its musical sonorous verse and the sustained intellectual vigor of composition her volume of last poems contains among much inferior matter some of her finest and most touching work as a musical instrument the forest recruit and mother and poet peter bain says of her in his great english women quote, in melodiousness and splendor of poetic gift miss browning stands first among women she may not have the knowledge of life the insight into character the comprehensiveness of some but we must all agree that a poet's far more essential qualities are hers usefulness fervor a noble aspiration and above all a tender far-reaching nature loving and beloved and touching the hearts of her readers with some virtue from its depths she seemed even in her life something of a spirit and her view of life's sorrow and shame of its hearty and eternal hope is something like that which one might imagine a spirit's to be whether political or sociological or mystical or sentimental or impossible there is about all that miss browning has written an enduring charm of picturesqueness of romance and of a pure enthusiasm for art art for art she cries and good for god himself the essential good we'll keep our aims sublime our eyes erect although our woman hands should shake and fail this was her achievement her hands did not fail her husband's words will furnish perhaps the best conclusion to this slight study quote, you are wrong he said quite wrong she has genius i am only a painstaking fellow can't you imagine a clever sort of angel who plots and plans and tries to build up something he wants to make you see it as he sees it shows you one point of view carries you off to another hammering into your head the thing he wants you to understand and whilst this bother is going on god almighty turns you off a little star that's the difference between us the true creative power is hers not mine End quote selected poems a musical instrument what was he doing the great god pan down in the reeds by the river spreading ruin and scattering ban splashing and paddling with hooves of a goat and breaking the golden lilies afloat with the dragonfly on the river he tore out a reed the great god pan from the deep cool bed of the river the limpidly water turbidly ran and the broken lilies a dying lay and the dragonfly had fled away ere he brought it out of the river high on the shore sat the great god pan while turbidly flowed the river and hacked and hewed as a great god can with his hard bleak steel at the patient reed till there was not a sign of the leaf indeed to prove it fresh from the river he cut it short did the great god pan how tall it stood in the river then drew the pith like the heart of a man steadily from the outside ring and notched the poor dry empty thing in holes as he sat by the river this is the way laughed the great god pan laughed while he sat by the river the only way since gods began to make sweet music they could succeed then dropping his mouth to a hole in the reed he blew in power by the river sweet 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 o oh pan piercing sweet by the river blinding sweet o oh great god pan the sun on the hill forgot to die and the lilies revived and the dragon fly came back to dream on the river yet half a beast is the great god pan to laugh as he sits by the river making a poet out of a man the true god sigh for the cost and the pain for the reed which grows never more again as a reed with the reeds in the river my heart and i 
enough we're tired my heart and i we sit beside the headstone thus and wish that name were carved for us the moss reprints more tenderly the hard types of the mason's knife as heaven's sweet life renews earth's life with which we're tired my heart and i you see we're tired my heart and i we dealt with books we trusted men and in our own blood drenched the pen as if such colors could not fly we walked too straight for fortune's end we loved too true to keep a friend at last we're tired my heart and i how tired we feel my heart and i we seem of no use in the world our fancies hang gray and uncurled about men's eyes indifferently our voice which thrilled you so will let you sleep our tears are only wet what do we hear my heart and i so tired so tired my heart and i it was not thus in that old time when ralph sat with me neath the lime to watch the sunset from the sky dear love you're looking tired he said i smiling at him shook my head tis now we're tired my heart and i so tired so tired my heart and i though none now takes me on his arm to fold me close and kiss me warm till each quick breath end in a sigh of happy languor now alone we lean upon this graveyard stone uncheered unkissed my heart and i tired out we are my heart and i suppose the world brought diadems to tempt us crusted with loose gems of powers and pleasures let it try we scarcely care to look at even a pretty child or god's blue heaven we feel so tired my heart and i yet who complains my heart and i in this abundant earth no doubt is little room for things worn out disdain them break them throw them by and if before the days grew rough we once were loved used well enough i think we've fared my heart and i from katerina to camoans dying in his absence abroad and referring to the poem in which he recorded the sweetness of her eyes on the door you will not enter i have gazed too long adieu hope withdraws her peradventure death is near me and not you come o lover close and cover these poor eyes you called i ween sweetest eyes were ever seen when i heard you sing that burden in my vernal days and bowers other praises disregarding i but hearkened that of yours only saying in heart playing blessed eyes mine eyes have been if the sweetest his have seen but all changes at this vesper cold the sun shines down the door if you stood there would you whisper love i love you as before death pervading now and shading eyes you sang of that yesterine as the sweetest ever seen yes i think were you beside them near the bed i die upon though their beauty you denied them as you stood there looking down you would truly call them duly for the love's sake found therein sweetest eyes were ever seen and if you looked down upon them and if they looked up to you all the light which has forgone them would be gathered back anew they would truly be as duly love transformed to beauty's sheen sweetest eyes were ever seen but ah me you only see me in your thoughts of loving man smiling soft perhaps and dreamy through the wavings of my fan and unweeding go repeating in your reverie serene sweetest eyes were ever seen 
oh my poet oh my prophet when you praised their sweetness so did you think in singing of it that it might be near to go had you fancies from their glances that the grave would quickly screen sweetest eyes were ever seen no reply the fountain's warble in the courtyard sounds alone as the water to the marble so my heart falls with a moan from love sighing to this dying death forerunneth love to win sweetest eyes were ever seen will you come when i'm departed where all sweetnesses are hid where thy voice my tender-hearted will not lift up either lid cry o oh lover love is over cry beneath the cypress green sweetest eyes were ever seen when the angelus is ringing near the convent will you walk and recall the choral singing which brought angels down our talk spirit shriven i viewed heaven till you smiled is earth unclean sweetest eyes were ever seen when beneath the palace lattice you ride slow as you have done and you see a face there that is not the old familiar one will you awfully murmur softly hear ye watched me morn and e'en sweetest eyes were ever seen when the palace ladies sitting round your gittern shall have said poets sing those verses written for the lady who is dead will you tremble yet dissemble or sing hoarse with tears between sweetest eyes were ever seen sweetest eyes how sweet in flowings the repeated cadence is though you sang a hundred poems still the best one would be this i can hear it twixt my spirit and the earth noise intervene sweetest eyes were ever seen but but now yet unremoved up to heaven they glisten fast you may cast away beloved in your future all my past such old phrases may be praises for some fairer bosom queen sweetest eyes were ever seen eyes of mine what are ye doing faithless faithless praised amiss if a tear be on your showing dropped for any hope of his death has boldness besides coldness if unworthy tears demean sweetest eyes were ever seen i will look out to his future i will bless it till it shine should he ever be a suitor unto sweeter eyes than mine sunshine gild them angels shield them whatsoever eyes to ring be the sweetest his have seen the sleep he giveth his beloved sleep psalm 127 verse 2 of all the thoughts of god that are borne inward into souls afar along the psalmist's music deep now tell me if that any is for gift or grace surpassing this he giveth his beloved sleep what would we give to our beloved the hero's heart to be unmoved the poet's star-tuned harp to sweep the patriot's voice to teach and rouse the monarch's crown to light the brows he giveth his beloved sleep what do we give to our beloved a little faith all undisproved a little dust to overweep and bitter memories to make the whole earth blasted for our sake he giveth his beloved sleep sleep soft beloved we sometimes say who have no tune to charm away sad dreams that through the eyelids creep but never doleful dream again shall break the happy slumber when he giveth his beloved sleep o earth so full of dreary noises o men with wailing in your voices o delved gold the wailers heap o strife o curse that o'er it fall god strikes a silence through you all and giveth his beloved sleep his dews drop mutely on the hill 
his cloud above it saileth still though on its slope men sow and reap more softly than the dew is shed or cloud is floated overhead he giveth his beloved sleep ay men may wonder while they scan a living thinking feeling man confirmed in such a rest to keep but angels say and through the word i think their happy smile is heard he giveth his beloved sleep for me my heart that erst did go most like a tired child at a show that sees through tears the murmurs leap would now its wearied vision close would childlike on his love repose who giveth his beloved sleep and friends dear friends when it shall be that this low brow is gone from me and round my bier ye come to weep let one most loving of you all say not a tear must o'er her fall he giveth his beloved sleep the cry of the children one do ye hear the children weeping o oh my brothers ere the sorrow comes with years they are leaning their young heads against their mothers and that cannot stop their tears the young lambs are bleating in the meadows the young birds are chirping in the nest the young fawns are playing with the shadows the young flowers are blowing toward the west but the young young children o oh my brothers they are weeping bitterly they are weeping in the playtime of the others in the country of the free two do you question the young children in their sorrow why their tears are falling so the old man may weep for his to-morrow which is lost in long ago the old tree is leafless in the forest the old year is ending in the frost the old wound of stricken is the sorest the old hope is hardest to be lost but the young young children o oh my brothers do you ask them why they stand weeping sore before the bosoms of their mothers in our happy fatherland three they look up with their pale and sunken faces and their looks are sad to see for the man's hoary anguish draws and presses down the cheeks of infancy your old earth they say is very dreary our young feet they say are very weak few paces have we taken yet are weary our grave rest is very far to seek ask the aged why they weep and not the children for the outside earth is cold and we young ones stand without in our bewildering and the graves are for the old four true say the children it may happen that we die before our time little alice died last year her grave is shapen like a snowball in the rhyme we looked into the pit prepared to take her was no room for any work in the close clay from the sleep wherein she lieth none will wake her crying get up little alice it is day if you listen by that grave in sun and shower with your ear down little alice never cries could we see her face be sure we should not know her for the smile has time for growing in her eyes and merry go her moments lulled and shrilled in the shroud by the kirk chime it is good when it happens say the children that we die before our time five alas alas the children they are seeking death in life as best to have they are binding up their hearts away from breaking with the cerement from the grave go out children from the mine and from the city sing out children as the little thrushes do pluck your handfuls of the meadow cowslips pretty laugh aloud to feel your fingers let them through but they answer are your cowslips of the meadows like our weeds and near the mine leave us quiet in the dark of the cold shadows from your pleasures fair and fine six for oh say the children we are weary and we cannot run or leap if we cared for any meadows it were merely to drop down in them and sleep our knees tremble sorely in the stooping 
we fall upon our faces trying to go and underneath our heavy eyelids drooping the reddest flower would look as pale as snow for all day we drag our burden tiring through the cold dark underground or all day we drive the wheels of iron in the factories round and round seven for all day the wheels are droning turning their wind comes in our faces till our hearts turn our heads with pulses burning and the walls turn in their places turns the sky in the high window blank and reeling turns the long light that drops adown the wall turn the black flies that crawl along the ceiling all are turning all the day and we with all and all the day the iron wheels are droning and sometimes we pray o oh, ye wheels breaking out in a mad moaning stop be silent for to-day eight ay be silent let them hear each other breathing for a moment mouth to mouth let them touch each other's hands in a fresh wreathing of their tender human youth let them feel that this cold metallic motion is not all the life god fashions or reveals let them prove their living souls against the notion that they live in you or tender you o wheels still all day the iron wheels go onward grinding life down from its mark and the children's souls which god is calling sunward spin on blindly in the dark nine now tell the poor young children o oh my brothers to look up to him and pray so the blessed one who blesseth all the others will bless them another day they answer who is god that he should hear us while the rushing of the iron wheels is stirred when we sob aloud the human creatures near us pass by hearing not or answer not a word and we hear not for the wheels in their resounding strangers speaking at the door is it likely god with angels singing round him hears our weeping any more ten two words indeed of praying we remember and at midnight's hour of harm our father looking upward in the chamber we say softly for a charm we know no other words except our father and we think that in some pause of angels song god may pluck them with the silence sweet together and hold both within his right hand which is strong our father if he heard us he would surely for they call him good and mild answer smiling down the steep world very purely come and rest with me my child eleven but no say the children weeping faster he is speechless as a stone and they tell us of his image is the master who commands us to work on go to say the children up in heaven dark wheel-like turning clouds are all we find do not mock us grief has made us unbelieving we look up for god but tears have made us blind do you hear the children weeping and disproving o oh my brothers what ye preach for god's possible is taught by his world's loving and the children doubt of each twelve and well may the children weep before you they are weary ere they run they have never seen the sunshine nor the glory which is brighter than the sun they know the grief of man without its wisdom they sink in man's despair without its calm are slaves without the liberty in christdom are martyrs by the pang without the palm are worn as if with age yet unretrievingly the harvest of its memories cannot reap are orphans of the earthly love and heavenly let them weep let them weep thirteen they look up with their pale and sunken faces and their look is dread to see for they mind you of their angels in high places with eyes turned on deity how long they say how long o cruel nation will you stand to move the world on a child's heart 
stifle down with a mailed heel its palpitation and tread onward to your throne amid the mart our blood splashes upward o gold heaper and your purple shows your past but the child's sob in the silence curses deeper than the strong man in his wrath End of section 26section 27 of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 6 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six by various authors section twenty seven selected poems of elizabeth barrett browning part two mother and poet on laura savio of turin a poetess and patriot whose sons were killed at ancona and gaeta dead one of them shot by the sea in the east and one of them shot in the west by the sea dead both my boys when you sit at the feast and are wanting a great song for italy free let none look at me yet i was a poetess only last year and good at my art for a woman men said but this woman this who is agonized here the east sea and west sea rhyme on in her head for ever instead what art can a woman be good at oh vain what art is she good at but hurting her breast with the milk teeth of babes and a smile at the pain ah boys how you hurt you were strong as you pressed and i proud by that test what arts for a woman to hold on her knees both darlings to feel all their arms round her throat cling strangle a little to sew by degrees and broider the long clothes and neat little coat to dream and to dote to teach them it stings there i made them indeed speak plain the word country i taught them no doubt that a country is a thing men should die for at need i prated of liberty rights and about the tyrant cast out and when their eyes flashed oh my beautiful eyes i exulted nay let them go forth at the wheels of the guns and denied not but then the surprise when one sits quite alone then one weeps then one kneels god how the house feels at first happy news came in gay letters moiled with my kisses of camp life and glory and how they both loved me and soon coming home to be spoiled in return would fan off every fly from my brow with their green laurel bough there was triumph at turin and cono was free and some one came out of the cheers in the street with a face pale as stone to say something to me my guido was dead i fell down at his feet while they cheered in the street i bore it friends soothed me my grief looked sublime as the ransom of italy one boy remained to be leaned on and walked with recalling the time when the first grew immortal while both of us strained to the height he had gained and letters still came shorter sadder more strong writ now but in one hand i was not to faint one loved me for two would be with me ere long and viva italia he died for our saint who forbids our complaint 
my nanny would add he was safe and aware of the presence that turned off the balls was impressed it was guido himself who knew what i could bear and how twas impossible quite dispossessed to live on for the rest on which without pause up the telegraph line swept smoothly the next news from gaeta shot tell his mother ah ah his their mother not mine no voice says my mother again to me what you think guido forgot are souls straight so happy that dizzy with heaven they drop earth's affections conceive not of woe i think not themselves were too lately forgiven through that love and that sorrow which reconciled so the above and below o christ of the seven wounds who looks through the dark to the face of thy mother consider i pray how we common mothers stand desolate mark whose sons not being christ's die with eyes turned away and no last word to say both boys dead but that's out of nature we all have been patriots yet each house must always keep one twere imbecile hewing out roads to a wall and when italy's made for what end is it done if we have not a son ah 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 when gait has taken what then when the fair wicked queen sits no more at her sport of the fireballs of death crashing souls out of men when the guns of cavalli with final retort have cut the game short when venice and rome keep their new jubilee when your flag takes all heaven for its white green and red when you have your country from mountain to sea when king victor has italy's crown on his head and i have my dead what then do not mock me ah ring your bells low and burn your lights faintly my country is there above the star pricked by the last peak of snow my italy's there with my brave civic pair to disfranchise despair forgive me some women bear children in strength and bite back the cry of their pain in self-scorn but the birth pangs of nations will wring us at length into wail such as this and we sit on forlorn when the man-child is born dead one of them shot by the sea in the east and one of them shot in the west by the sea both both my boys if in keeping the feast you want a great song for your italy free let none look at me a court lady her hair was tawny with gold her eyes were purple with dark her cheeks pale opal burnt with a red and restless spark never was lady of milan nobler in name and in race never was lady of italy fairer to see in the face never was lady on earth more true as woman and wife larger in judgment and instinct prouder in manners and life she stood in the early morning and said to her maidens bring that silken robe made ready to wear at the court of the king bring me the clasps of diamond lucid clear of the moat clasp me the large at the waist and clasp me the small at the throat diamonds to fasten the hair and diamonds to fasten the sleeves laces to drop from their rays like a powder of snow from the eaves gorgeous she entered the sunlight which gathered her up in a flame while straight in her open carriage she to the hospital came in she went at the door and gazing from end to end many and low are the pallets but each is the place of a friend up she passed through the wards and stood at a young man's bed bloody the band on his brow and livid the droop of his head 
art thou a lombard my brother happy art thou she cried and smiled like italy on him he dreamed in her face and died pale with his passing soul she went on still to a second he was a grave hard man whose years by dungeons were reckoned wounds in his body were sore wounds in his life were sorer art thou a romagno her eyes drove lightnings before her austrian and priest had joined to double and tighten the cord able to bind thee o strong one free by the stroke of a sword now be grave for the rest of us using the life overcast to ripen our wine of the present too new in glooms of the past down she stepped to a pallet where lay a face like a girl's young and pathetic with dying a deep black hole in the curls art thou from tuscany brother and seest thou dreaming in pain thy mother stand in the piazza searching the list of the slain kind as a mother herself she touched his cheeks with her hands blessed is she who has borne thee although she should weep as she stands on she passed to a frenchman his arm carried off by a ball kneeling oh more than my brother how shall i thank thee for all each of the heroes around us has fought for his land and line but thou hast fought for a stranger in hate of a wrong not thine happy are all free peoples too strong to be dispossessed but blessed are those among nations who dare to be strong for the rest ever she passed on her way and came to a couch where pined one with a face from venetia white with a hope out of mind long she stood and gazed and twice she tried at the name but two great crystal tears were all that faltered and came only a tear for venice she turned as in passion and loss and stooped to his forehead and kissed it as if she were kissing the cross faint with that strain of heart she moved on then to another stern and strong in his death and dost thou suffer my brother holding his hands in hers out of the piedmont lion cometh the sweetness of freedom sweetest to live or to die on holding his cold rough hands well oh well have you done in noble noble piedmont who would not be noble alone back he fell while she spoke she rose to her feet with a spring that was a piedmontese and this is the court of the king the prospect methinks we do as fretful children do leaning their faces on the window-pane to sigh the glass dim with their own breath stain and shut the sky and landscape from their view and thus alas since god the maker drew a mystic separation twixt those twain the life beyond us and our souls in pain we miss the prospect which we are called unto by grief we are fools to use be still and strong o man my brother hold thy sobbing breath and keep thy soul's large window pure from wrong that so as life's appointment issueth thy vision may be clear to watch along the sunset consummation lights of death de profundis the face which duly as the sun rose up for me with life begun to mark all bright hours of the day with daily love is dimmed away and yet my days go on go on the tongue which like a stream could run smooth music from the roughest stone and every morning with good day make each day good is hushed away and yet my days go on go on the heart which like a staff was one for mine to lean and rest upon the strongest on the longest day with steadfast love is caught away and yet my days go on go on 
the world goes whispering to its own this anguish pierces to the bone and tender friends go sighing round what love can ever cure this wound my days go on my days go on the past rolls forward on the sun and makes all night o oh, dreams begun not to be ended ended bliss and life that will not end in this my days go on my days go on breath freezes on my lips to moan as one alone once not alone i sit and knock at nature's door heart bare heart hungry very poor whose desolated days go on i knock and cry undone undone is there no help no comfort none no gleaning in the wide wheat plains where others drive their loaded wains my vacant days go on go on this nature though the snows be down thinks kindly of the bird in june the little red hip on the tree is ripe for such what is for me whose days so winterly go on no bird am i to sing in june and dare not ask an equal boon good nests and berries red are nature's to give away to better creatures and yet my days go on go on i ask less kindness to be done only to loose these pilgrims shoon too early worn and grimed with sweet cool deathly touch to these tired feet till days go out which now go on only to lift the turf unmown from off the earth where it has grown some cubit space and say behold creep in poor heart beneath that fold forgetting how the days go on a voice reproves me thereupon more sweet than nature's when the drone of bees is sweetest and more deep than when the rivers overleap the shuddering pines and thunder on god's voice not nature's night and noon he sits upon the great white throne and listens for the creature's praise what babble we of days and days the day spring he whose days go on he reigns above he reigns alone systems burn out and leave his throne fair mists of seraphs melt and fall around him changeless amid all ancient of days whose days go on he reigns below he reigns alone and having life in love foregone beneath the crown of sovereign thorns he reigns the jealous god who mourns or rules with him while days go on by anguish which made pale the sun i hear him charge his saints that none among the creatures anywhere blaspheme against him with despair however darkly days go on take from my head the thorn wreath brown no mortal grief deserves that crown o oh, supreme love chief misery the sharp regalia are for thee whose days eternally go on for us whatever's undergone thou knowest willest what is done grief may be joy misunderstood only the good discerns the good i trust thee while my days go on whatever's lost it first was won we will not struggle nor impugn perhaps the cup was broken here that heaven's new wine might show more clear i praise thee while my days go on i praise thee while my days go on i love thee while my days go on through dark and dearth through fire and frost with emptied arms and treasure lost i thank thee while my days go on and having in thy life depth thrown being and suffering which are one as a child drops some pebble small down some deep well and hears it fall smiling so i thy days go on the cry of the human 
there is no god the foolish saith but none there is no sorrow and nature oft the cry of faith in bitter need will borrow eyes which the preacher could not school by wayside graves are raised and lips say god be pitiful who ne'er said god be praised be pitiful o god the tempest stretches from the steep the shadow of its coming the beasts grow tame and near us creep as help were in the human yet while the cloud wheels roll and grind we spirits tremble under the hills have echoes but we find no answer for the thunder be pitiful o god the battle hurtles on the plains earth feels new scythes upon her we reap our brothers for the wains and call the harvest honor draw face to face front line to line one image all inherit then kill curse on by that same sign clay clay and spirit spirit be pitiful o god we meet together at the feast to private mirth betake us we stare down in the wine cup lest some vacant chair should shake us we name delight and pledge it round it shall be ours to-morrow god seraphs do your voices sound as sad in naming sorrow be pitiful o god we sit together with the skies the steadfast skies above us we look into each other's eyes and how long will you love us the eyes grow dim with prophecy the voices low and breathless till death us part o words to be our best for love the deathless be pitiful dear god we tremble by the harmless bed of one loved and departed our tears drop on the lips that said last night be stronger hearted o oh god to clasp those fingers close and yet to feel so lonely to see a light upon such brows which is the daylight only be pitiful o oh god the happy children come to us and look up in our faces they ask us was it thus and thus when we were in their places we cannot speak we see anew the hills we used to live in and feel our mother's smile press through the kisses she is giving be pitiful o oh god we pray together at the kirk for mercy mercy solely hands weary with the evil work we lift them to the holy the corpse is calm below our knee its spirit bright before thee between them worse than either we without the rest of glory be pitiful o oh god and soon all vision waxeth dull men whisper he is dying we cry no more be pitiful we have no strength for crying no strength no need then soul of mine look up in triumph rather lo in the depth of god's divine the son adjures the father be pitiful o oh god romance of the swan's nest little ellie sits alone mid the beeches of a meadow by a stream side on the grass and the trees are showering down doubles of their leaves in shadow on her shining hair and face she has thrown her bonnet by and her feet she has been dipping in the shallow water's flow now she holds them nakedly in her hands all sleek and dripping while she rocketh to and fro little ellie sits alone and the smile she softly uses fills the silence like a speech while she thinks what shall be done and the sweetest pleasure chooses for her future within reach little ellie in her smile chooseth i will have a lover riding on a steed of steeds he shall love me without guile and to him i will discover that swan's nest among the reeds and the steed shall be red roan and the lover shall be noble with an eye that takes the breath and the lute he plays upon shall strike ladies into trouble as his sword strikes men to death 
and the steed it shall be shod all in silver housed in azure and the mane shall swim the wind and the hoofs along the sod shall flash onward and keep measure till the shepherds look behind but my lover will not prize all the glory that he rides in when he gazes in my face he will say o oh, love thine eyes build the shrine my soul abides in and i kneel here for thy grace then i then he shall kneel low with the red roan steed anear him which shall seem to understand till i answer rise and go for the world must love and fear him who my gift with heart and hand then he will arise so pale i shall feel my own lips tremble with a yes i must not say nathless maiden brave farewell i will utter and dissemble light to-morrow with to-day then he'll ride among the hills to the wide world past the river there to put away all wrong to make straight distorted wills and to empty the broad quiver which the wicked bear along three times shall a young foot-page swim the stream and climb the mountain and kneel down beside my feet lo my master sends this gage lady for thy pity's counting what wilt thou exchange for it and the first time i will send a white rosebud for the guerdon and the second time a glove but the third time i may bend from my pride and answer pardon if he come to take my love then the footpage will run then my lover will ride faster till he kneeleth at my knee i am a duke's eldest son thousand serfs do call me master but o oh, love i love but thee he will kiss me on the mouth then and lead me as a lover through the crowds that praise his deeds and when soul tied by one troth unto him i will discover that swan's nest among the reeds little ellie with her smile not yet ended rose up gaily tied the bonnet donned the shoe and went homeward round a mile just to see as she did daily what more eggs were with the two pushing through the elm tree copse winding by the stream light-hearted where the osier pathway leads past the boughs she stoops and stops lo the wild swan had deserted and a rat had gnawed the reeds ellie went home sad and slow if she found the lover ever with his red roan steed of steeds sooth i know not but i know she could never show him never that swan's nest among the reeds the best thing in the world what's the best thing in the world june rose by may dew impearled sweet south wind that means no rain truth not cruel to a friend pleasure not in haste to end beauty not self-decked and curled till its pride is over plain light that never makes you wink memory that gives no pain love when so you're loved again what's the best thing in the world something out of it i think sonnets from the portuguese unlike are we unlike o princely heart unlike our uses and our destinies our ministering two angels look surprise on one another as they strike athwart their wings in passing thou bethink thee art a guest for queens to social pageantries with gauges from a hundred brighter eyes than tears even can make mine to play thy part of chief musician what hast thou to do with looking from the lattice lights at me a poor tired wandering singer singing through the dark and leaning up a cypress tree the chrism is on thine head on mine the dew and death must dig the level where these agree thou hast thy calling to some palace floor most gracious singer of high poems where the dancers will break footing from the care of watching up thy pregnant lips for more 
and dost thou lift this house's latch too poor for hand of thine and canst thou think and bear to let thy music drop here unaware in folds of golden fullness at my door look up and see the casement broken in the bats and owlets builders in the roof my cricket chirps against thy mandolin hush call no echo up in further proof of desolation there's a voice within that weeps as thou must sing alone aloof what can i give thee back o liberal and princely giver who hast brought the gold and purple of thine heart unstained untold and laid them on the outside of the wall for such as i to take or leave withal in unexpected largesse am i cold ungrateful that for these most manifold high gifts i render nothing back at all not so not cold but very poor instead ask god who knows for frequent tears have run the colours from my life and left so dead and pale a stuff it were not fitly done to give the same as pillow to thy head go farther let it serve to trample on if thou must love me let it be for naught except for love's sake only do not say i love her for her smile her look her way of speaking gently for a trick of thought that falls in well with mine and certes brought a sense of pleasant ease on such a day for these things in themselves beloved may be changed or change for thee and love so wrought may be unwrought so neither love me for thine own dear pities wiping my cheeks dry a creature might forget to weep who bore thy comfort long and lose thy love thereby but love me for love's sake that evermore thou mayst love on through love's eternity first time he kissed me he but only kissed the fingers of this hand wherewith i write and ever since it grew more clean and white slow to world greetings quick with its o oh, list when the angels speak a ring of amethyst i could not wear here plainer to my sight than that first kiss the second passed in height the first and sought the forehead and half missed half falling on the hair oh beyond mead that was the chrism of love whose love's own crown with sanctifying sweetness did proceed the third upon my lips was folded down in perfect purple state since when indeed i have been proud and said my love my own I lived with visions for my company instead of men and women years ago and found them gentle mates nor thought to know a sweeter music than they played for me but soon their trailing purple was not free of this world's dust their lutes did silent grow and i myself grew faint and blind below their vanishing eyes then thou didst come to be beloved what they seemed their shining fronts their songs their splendors better yet the same as river water hollowed into fonts met in thee and from out thee overcame my soul with satisfaction of all wants because god's gifts put man's best dreams to shame beloved my beloved when i think that thou wast in the world a year ago what time i sat alone here in the snow and saw no footprint heard the silence sink no moment at thy voice but link by link went counting all my chains as if that so they never could fall off at any blow struck by thy possible hand why thus i drink of life's great cup of wonder wonderful never to feel thee thrill the day or night with personal act or speech nor ever cull some prescience of thee with the blossoms white thou sawest growing atheists are as dull who cannot guess god's presence out of sight because thou hast the power and own'st the grace to look through and behind this mask of me 
against which years have beat thus blanchingly with their reins and behold my soul's true face the dim and weary witness of life's race because thou hast the faith and love to see through that same soul's distracting lethargy the patient angel waiting for his place in the new heavens because nor sin nor woe nor god's infliction nor death's neighbourhood nor all which others viewing turn to go nor all which makes me tired of all self-viewed nothing repels thee dearest teach me so to pour out gratitude as thou dost good i thank all who have loved me in their hearts with thanks and love for mine deep thanks to all who paused a little near the prison wall to hear my music in its louder parts ere they went onward each one to the marts or temple's occupation beyond call but thou who in my voices sink and fall when the sob took it thy divinest art's own instrument didst drop down at thy foot to hearken what i said between my tears instruct me how to thank thee oh to shoot my soul's full meaning into future years that they should lend it utterance and salute love that endures with life that disappears how do i love thee let me count the ways i love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace i love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight i love thee freely as men strive for right i love thee purely as they turn from praise i love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith i love thee with a love i seemed to lose with my lost saints i love thee with the breath smiles tears of all my life and if god choose i shall but love thee better after death a false step sweet thou hast trod on a heart pass there's a world full of men and women as fair as thou art must do such things now and then thou only hast stepped unaware malice not one can impute and why should a heart have been there in the way of a fair woman's foot it was not a stone that could trip nor was it a thorn that could rend put up thy proud underlip twas merely the heart of a friend and yet peradventure one day thou sitting alone at the glass remarking the bloom gone away where the smile in its dimplement was and seeking around thee in vain from hundreds who flattered before such a word as oh not in the main do i hold thee less precious but more thou'lt sigh very like on thy part of all i have known or can know i wish i had only that heart i trod upon ages ago A child's thought of god they say that god lives very high but if you look above the pines you cannot see our god and why and if you dig down in the mines you never see him in the gold though from him all that's glory shines god is so good he wears a fold of heaven and earth across his face like secrets kept for love untold but still i feel that his embrace slides down by thrills through all things made through sight and sound of every place as if my tender mother laid on my shut lids her kisses pressure half waking me at night and said who kissed you through the dark dear guesser cheerfulness taught by reason I think we are too ready with complaint in this fair world of gods had we no hope indeed beyond the zenith and the slope of yon gray bank of sky we might be faint to muse upon eternity's constraint round our aspirant souls but since the scope must widen early it is well to droop for a few days consumed in loss and taint 
oh pusillanimous heart be comforted and like a cheerful traveller take the road singing beside the hedge what if the bread be bitter in thine inn and thou unshod to meet the flints at least it may be said because the way is short i thank thee god End of section 27section twenty eight of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bruce peary library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six section twenty eight biographical note on robert browning eighteen twelve to eighteen eighty nine by e l burlingame robert browning was born at camberwell on may seventh eighteen twelve the son and grandson of men who held clerkships in the bank of england the one for more than forty and the other for full fifty years his surroundings were apparently typical of english moderate prosperity and neither they nor his good but undistinguished family traditions furnish any basis for the theorizing of biographers except indeed in a single point his grandmother was a west indian creole and though only of the first generation to be born away from england seems from the restless and adventurous life led by her brother to have belonged to a family of the opposite type from her husband's whether this crossing of the imaginative westward ho strain of the english blood with the home-keeping type has to do with the production of such intensely vitalized temperaments as robert browning's is the only question suggested by his ancestry it is noticeable that his father wished to go to a university then to become an artist both ambitions repressed by the grandfather and that he took up his bank official's career unwillingly he seems to have been anything but a man of routine to have had keen and wide interests outside of his work to have been a great reader and book collector even an exceptional scholar in certain directions and to have kept till old age a remarkable vivacity with unbroken health altogether a personality thoroughly sympathetic with that of his son to whom this may well have been the final touch of a prosperity calculated to shake all traditional ideas of a poet's youth browning's education was exceptional for an english boy's he left school at fourteen and after that was taught by tutors at home except that at eighteen he took a greek course at the london university his training seems to have been unusually thorough for these conditions though largely self-directed it may be supposed that his father kept a sympathetic and intelligent guidance wisely not too obvious but in the main it is clear that from a very early age browning had deliberately and distinctly in view the idea of making literature the pursuit of his life and that he troubled himself seriously with nothing that did not help to that end while into everything that did he seems to have thrown himself with precocious intensity individual anecdotes of his precocity are told by his biographers but they are flat beside the general fact of the depth and character of his studies and superfluous of the man who had written pauline at twenty-one and paracelsus at twenty-two at eighteen he knew himself as a poet and encountered no opposition in his chosen career from his father whose kindness we must seek as mrs sutherland orr says not only in this first almost inevitable assent to his son's becoming a writer but in the subsequent unfailing readiness to support him in his literary career paracelsus sordello and the whole of bells and pomegranates were published at his father's expense and incredible as it appears brought him no return an aunt mrs silverthorne paid the costs of the earlier pauline from this time of his earliest published work pauline was issued without his name in eighteen thirty three that part of the story of his life known to the public in spite of two or three more or less elaborate biographies is mainly the history of his writings and the record of his different residences 
supplemented by less than the usual number of personal anecdotes to which neither circumstance nor temperament contributed material he had nothing of the attitude of the recluse like tennyson but while healthily social and a man of the world about him he was not one of whom people tell reminiscences of consequence and he was in no sense a public personality little of his correspondence has appeared in print and it seems probable that he will be fortunate to an even greater degree than thackeray in living in his works and escaping the ripping up of the personal chronicler he travelled occasionally in the next few years and in eighteen thirty eight and again in eighteen forty four visited italy in that year or early in eighteen forty five he became engaged to miss elizabeth barrett their acquaintance beginning through a friend her cousin and through letters from browning expressing admiration for her poems miss barrett had then been for some years an invalid from an accident and an enforced recluse but in september eighteen forty six they were married without the knowledge of her father and almost immediately afterward she leaving her sick-room to join him went to paris and then to italy where they lived first in genoa and afterward in florence which with occasional absences was their home for fourteen years mrs browning died there at casa guidi in june eighteen sixty one browning left florence some time afterward and in spite of his later visits to italy never returned there he lived again in london in the winter but most of his summers were spent in france and especially in brittany about eighteen seventy eight he formed the habit of going to venice for the autumn which continued with rare exceptions to the end of his life there in eighteen eighty eight his son recently married had made his home and there on the twelfth of december eighteen eighty nine robert browning died he was buried in westminster abbey on the last day of the year pauline a fragment of a confession browning's first published poem was a psychological self-analysis perfectly characteristic of the time of life at which he wrote it very young full of excesses of mood of real exultation and somewhat less real depression the confession of a poet of twenty-one intensely interested in the ever new discovery of his own nature its possibilities and its relations it rings very true and has no decadent touch in it i am made up of an intensest life a principle of restlessness which would be all have see know taste feel all this is the note that stays in the reader's mind but the poem is psychologically rather than poetically noteworthy except as all beginnings are so and browning's statement in a note in his collected poems that he acknowledged and retained it with extreme repugnance shows how fully he recognized this in paracelsus his next long poem published some two years later the strength of his later work is first definitely felt taking for theme the life of the sixteenth century physician astrologer alchemist conjurer compound of faust and cagliostro mixture of truth-seeker charlatan and dreamer browning makes of it the history of the soul of a feverish aspirant after the finality of intellectual power the knowledge which should be for man the key to the universe the tragedy of its failure and the greater tragedy of its discovery of the barrenness of the effort and the omission from its scheme of life of an element without which power was impotent yet constituted thus and thus endowed i failed i gazed on power till i grew blind power i could not take my eyes from that that only i thought should be preserved increased i learned my own deep error love's undoing taught me the worth of love in man's estate and what proportion love should hold with power in his right constitution love preceding power and with much power always much more love paracelsus is the work of a man still far from maturity but it is browning's first use of a type of poem in which his powers were to find one of their chief manifestations a psychological history 
told with so slight an aid from an external machinery of incidents to use his own phrase or from conventional dramatic arrangement as to constitute a form virtually new this was to be notably the method of sordello which appeared in eighteen forty in a note written twenty-three years later to his friend milsand and prefixed as a dedication to sordello in his collected works he defined the form and its reason most exactly the historical decoration was purposely of no more importance than a background requires and my stress lay on the incidents in the development of a soul little else is worth study this poem with its historical decoration or background from the guelph and ghibelline struggles in italy carries out this design in a fashion that defies description or characterization with its inexhaustible wealth of psychological suggestion its interwoven discussion of the most complex problems of life and thought its metaphysical speculation it may well give pause to the reader who makes his first approach to browning through it and send him back if he begins as is likely with the feeling of one challenged to an intellectual task baffled by the intricacy of its ways and without a comprehension of what it contains or leads to mr augustine burrell says of it we have all heard of the young architect who forgot to put a staircase in his house which contained fine rooms but no way of getting into them sordello is a poem without a staircase the author still in his twenties essayed a high thing for his subject he singled out sordello compassed murkily about with ravage of six long sad hundred years he partially failed and the british public with its accustomed generosity and in order i suppose to encourage the others has never ceased girding at him because forty-two years ago he published at his own charges a little book of two hundred and fifty pages which even such of them as were then able to read could not understand with sordello however ended for many years until he may perhaps be said to have taken it up in a greatly disciplined and more powerful form in the ring and the book and others this type and this length of the psychological poem for browning and now began that part of his work which is his best gift to english literature four years before the publication of sordello he had written one play strafford of which the name sufficiently indicates the subject which had been put upon the stage with some success by macready the forerunner of a noble series of poems in dramatic form most conveniently mentioned here together though not always in chronological order they were the blot on the scutcheon perhaps the finest of those actually fitted for the stage colomb's birthday king victor and king charles the return of the druses luria a soul's tragedy in a balcony and though less on the conventional lines of a play than the others perhaps the finest dramatic poem of them all pippa passes which among the earlier it was published in eighteen forty one is also among the finest of all browning's works and touches the very highest level of his powers interspersed with these during the fifteen years between eighteen forty and eighteen fifty five and following them during the next five appeared the greater number of the single shorter poems which make his most generally recognized his highest and his unquestionably permanent title to rank among the first of english poets manifestly it is impossible and needless to recall any number of these here by even the briefest description and merely to enumerate the chief among them would be to repeat a familiar catalogue except as they illustrate the points of a later general consideration finally to complete the list of browning's works reference is necessary to the group of books of his later years the two self-called narrative poems the ring and the book with its vast length and red cotton nightcap country its fellow in method if not in extent mr burrell it is worth while to quote him again as one who has not merged the appreciator in the adulator calls the ring and the book a huge novel in twenty thousand lines told after the method not of scott but of balzac it tears the hearts out of a dozen characters it tells the same story from ten different points of view it is loaded with detail of every kind and description you are let off nothing but he adds later 
if you are prepared for this you will have your reward for the style though rugged and involved is throughout with the exception of the speeches of counsel eloquent and at times superb and as for the matter if your interest in human nature is keen curious almost professional if nothing man woman or child has been done or suffered or conceivably can be do or suffer is without interest for you if you are fond of analysis and do not shrink from dissection you will prize the ring and the book as the surgeon prizes the last great contribution to comparative anatomy or pathology this is the key of the matter the reader who has learned through his greater work to follow with interest the very analytic exercises and as it were tour de force of browning's mind will prize the ring and the book and red cotton nightcap country even he will prize but little the two adventures of belostion prince hohenstiel schwangau the inn album and one or two others of the latest works in the same genre but he can well do without them and still have the inexhaustible left the attitude of a large part of his own generation toward browning's poetry will probably be hardly understood by the future and is not easy to comprehend even now for those who have the whole body of his work before them it is intelligible enough that the crude preliminary sketch pauline should have given only the bare hint of a poet to the few dozen people who saw that it was out of the common that paracelsus should have carried the information though then beyond a doubt to only a small circle and especially that sordello a clear call to a few should have sounded to even an intelligent many like an exercise in intricacy and to the world at large like something to which it is useless to listen or to look at the other end of his career it is not extraordinary that the work of his last period the ring and the book red cotton nightcap country those wonderful minute studies of human motive made with the highly specialized skill of the psychical surgeon and with the confidence of another balzac in the reader's following power should always remain more or less esoteric literature but when it is remembered that between these lie the most vivid and intensely dramatic series of short poems in english those grouped in the unfortunately diverse editions of his works under the rubrics men and women dramatic lyrics dramatic romances dramatis personae and the rest as well as larger masterpieces of the broad appeal of pippa passes a blot on the scutcheon or in a balcony it is hard to understand and will be still harder fifty years hence why browning has not become the familiar and inspiring poet of a vastly larger body of readers undoubtedly a large number of intelligent persons still suspect a note of affectation in the man who declares his full and intense enjoyment not only his admiration of browning a suspicion showing not only the persistence of the sordello born tradition of obscurity but the harm worked by those commentators who approach him as a problem not all commentators share this reproach but as browning makes bishop blougram say even your prime men who appraise their kind are men still catch a wheel within a wheel see more in a truth than the truth's simple self confuse themselves and beyond question such persons are largely responsible for the fact that for some time to come every one who speaks of browning to a general audience will feel that he has some cant to clear away if he can make them read this body of intensely human essentially simple and direct dramatic and lyrical work he will help to bring about the time when the once popular attitude will seem as unjustifiable as to judge Goethe only by the second part of faust the first great characteristic of browning's poetry is undoubtedly the essential elemental quality of its humanity a trait in which it is surpassed by no other english poetry but that of shakespeare it can be subtle to a degree almost fantastic as can shakespeare's to an extent that familiarity makes us forget but this is in method the stuff of it the texture of the fabric which the swift and intricate shuttle is weaving is always something in which the human being is vitally not merely aesthetically interested 
it deals with no shadows and indeed with few abstractions except those that form a part of vital problems a statement which may provoke the scoffer but will be found to be true a second characteristic which if not a necessary result of this first would at least be impossible without it is the extent to which browning's poetry produces its effect by suggestion rather than by elaboration by stimulating thought emotion and the aesthetic sense instead of seeking to satisfy any one of these especially instead of contenting itself with only soothing the last the comparison of his poetry with for instance tennyson's in this respect is instructive if it is possibly unjust to both and a third trait in browning to make an end of a dangerously categorical attempt to characterize him follows logically from this second its extreme compactness and concentration browning sometimes dwells long even dallies over an idea as does shakespeare turns it shows its every facet and even then it is noticeable as with the greater master that every individual phrase with which he does so is practically exhaustive of the suggestiveness of that particular aspect but commonly he crowds idea upon idea even in his lyrics and strangely enough without losing the lyric quality each thought pressed down to its very essence and each with that germinal power that makes the reading of him one of the most stimulating things to be had from literature his figures especially are apt and telling in the very minimum of words they say it all like the unsurpassable shakespearean example of the dyer's hand and the more you think of them the more you see that not a word could be added or taken away it may be said that this quality of compactness is common to all genius and of the very essence of all true poetry but browning manifested it in a way of his own such as to suggest that he believed in the subordination of all other qualities to it even of melody for instance as may be said by his critics and admitted in many cases by even his strongest admirers but all things are not given to one even among the giants and browning's force with its measure of melody which is often great has its place among others melody with its measure of force open at random here are two lines in a toccata of galuppi's not deficient in melody by any means dear dead women with such hair too what's become of all the gold used to hang and brush their bosoms i feel chilly and grown old this is not villon's ballad of dead ladies nor even tennyson's dream of fair women but a master can still say a good deal in two lines what is called the roughness of browning's verse is at all events never the roughness that comes from mismanagement or disregard of the form chosen he has an unerring ear for time and quantity and his subordination to the laws of his metre is extraordinary in its minuteness of ringing lines there are many of broadly sonorous or softly melodious ones but few and especially if one chooses to go into details of technique he seems curiously without that use of the broad vowels which underlies the melody of so many great passages of english poetry except in the one remarkable instance of how we carried the good news from ghent to aix there is little onomatopoeia and almost no note of the flute no moans of doves in immemorial elms or lucent syrups tinct with cinnamon on the other hand in his management of metres like that of love among the ruins for instance he shows a different side the pure lyrics in pippa passes and elsewhere sing themselves and there are memorable cadences in some of the more meditative poems like by the fireside the vividness and vigor and truth of browning's embodiments of character come it is needless to say from the same power that has created all great dramatic work the capacity for incarnating not a quality or an ideal but the mixture and balance of qualities that make up the real human being there is not a walking phantom among them or a lay figure to hang sentiment on 
a writer in the new review said recently that of all the poets he remembered only shakespeare and browning never drew a prig it is this complete absence of the false note that gives to certain of browning's poems the finality which is felt in all consummate works of art great and small the sense that they convey if not the last word at least the last necessary word on their subject andrea del sarto is in its way the whole problem of the artist ideal the weak will and the inner failure in all times and guises and at the other end of the gamut nobody will ever need again to set forth bishop blougram's attitude or even that of mr sludge the medium of the informing almost exuberant vitality of all the lyric and dramatic poems it is needless to speak that fairly leaps to meet the reader at every page of them and the quality of it is their essential optimism what is he buzzing in my ears now that i come to die do i view the world as a veil of tears ah reverend sir not i the world was never a veil of tears to robert browning man or poet but a world of men and women with plenty of red corpuscles in their blood end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 6. Section 29. Andrea del Sarto, called The Faultless Painter, by Robert Browning but do not let us quarrel any more no my lucrezia bear with me for once sit down and all shall happen as you wish you turn your face but does it bring your heart i'll work then for your friend's friend never fear treat his own subject after his own way fix his own time except to his own price and shut the money into this small hand when next it takes mine will it tenderly oh i'll content him but to-morrow love i often am much wearier than you think this evening more than usual and it seems as if forgive now should you let me sit here by the window with your hand in mine and look a half hour forth on fiesole both of one mind as married people use quietly quietly the evening through i might get up to-morrow to my work cheerful and fresh as ever let us try to-morrow how you shall be glad for this your soft hand is a woman of itself and mine the man's bared breast she curls inside don't count the time lost neither you must serve for each of the five pictures we require it saves a model so keep looking so my serpentining beauty rounds on rounds how could you ever prick those perfect ears even to put the pearl there oh so sweet my face my moon my everybody's moon which everybody looks on and calls his and i suppose is looked on by in turn while she looks no one's very dear no less you smile why there's my picture ready-made there's what we painters call our harmony a common grayness silvers everything all in a twilight you and i alike you at the point of your first pride in me that's gone you know but i at every point my youth my hope my art being all toned down to yonder sober pleasant fiesole there's the bell clinking from the chapel top that length of convent wall across the way holds the trees safer huddled more inside the last monk leaves the garden days decrease and autumn grows autumn in everything eh the whole seems to fall into a shape as if i saw alike my work and self and all that i was born to be and do a twilight piece love we are in god's hand how strange now looks the life he makes us lead so free we seem so fettered fast we are 
i feel he laid the fetter let it lie this chamber for example turn your head all that's behind us you don't understand nor care to understand about my art but you can hear at least when people speak and that cartoon the second from the door it is the thing love so such things should be behold madonna i am bold to say i can do with my pencil what i know what i see what at bottom of my heart i wish for if i ever wish so deep do easily too when i say perfectly i do not boast perhaps yourself are judge who listened to the legates talk last week and just as much they used to say in france at any rate tis easy all of it no sketches first no studies that's long past i do what many dream of all their lives dream strive to do and agonize to do and fail in doing i could count twenty such on twice your fingers and not leave this town who strive you don't know how the others strive to paint a little thing like that you smeared carelessly passing with your robes afloat yet do much less so much less some one says i know his name no matter so much less well less is more lucrezia i am judged there burns a truer light of god in them in their vexed beating stuffed and stopped up brain heart or whate'er else than goes on to prompt this low-pulsed forthright craftsman's hand of mine their works drop groundward but themselves i know reach many a time a heaven that's shut to me enter and take their place there sure enough though they come back and cannot tell the world my works are nearer heaven but i sit here the sudden blood of these men at a word praise them it boils or blame them it boils too i painting from myself and to thyself know what i do am unmoved by men's blame or their praise either somebody remarks morello's outline there is wrongly traced his hue mistaken what of that or else rightly traced and well ordered what of that speak as they please what does the mountain care ah but a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for all is silver-gray placid and perfect with my art the worse i know both what i want and what might gain and yet how profitless to know to sigh had i been two another and myself our head would have o'erlooked the world no doubt yonder's a work now of that famous youth the urbinate who died five years ago tis copied george vasari sent it me well i can fancy how he did it all pouring his soul with kings and popes to see reaching that heaven might so replenish him above and through his art for it gives way that arm is wrongly put and there again a fault to pardon in the drawing's lines its body so to speak its soul is right he meant right that a child may understand still what an arm and i could alter it but all the play the insight and the stretch out of me out of me and wherefore out had you enjoined them on me given me soul we might have risen to raphael i and you nay love you did give all i asked i think more than i merit yes by many times but had you oh with the same perfect brow and perfect eyes and more than perfect mouth and the low voice my soul hears as a bird the fowler's pipe and follows to the snare had you with these these same but brought a mind some women do so had the mouth there urged god and the glory never care for gain the present by the future what is that live for fame side by side with agnolo raphael is waiting up to god all three i might have done it for you so it seems perhaps not all is as god overrules 
beside incentives come from the soul's self the rest avail not why do i need you what wife had raphael or has agnolo in this world who can do a thing will not and who would do it cannot i perceive yet the will's somewhat somewhat too the power and thus we half men struggle at the end god i conclude compensates punishes tis safer for me if the award be strict that i am something underrated here poor this long while despised to speak the truth i dared not do you know leave home all day for fear of chancing on the paris lords the best is when they pass and look aside but they speak sometimes i must bear it all well may they speak that francis that first time and that long festal year at fontainebleau i surely then could sometimes leave the ground put on the glory raphael's daily wear in that humane great monarch's golden look one finger in his beard or twisted curl over his mouth's good mark that made the smile one arm about my shoulder around my neck the jingle of his gold chain in my ear i painting proudly with his breath on me all his court round him seeing with his eyes such frank french eyes and such a fire of souls profuse my hand kept plying by those hearts and best of all this 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 face beyond this in the background waiting on my work to crown the issue with a last reward a good time was it not my kingly days and had you not grown restless but i know tis done and past twas right my instinct said too live the life grew golden and not gray and i'm the weak-eyed bat no sun should tempt out of the grange whose four walls make his world how could it end in any other way you called me and i came home to your heart the triumph was to have ended there then if i reached it ere the triumph what is lost let my hands frame your face in your hair's gold you beautiful lucrezia that are mine raphael did this andrea painted that the romans is the better when you pray but still the other virgin was his wife men will excuse me i am glad to judge both pictures in your presence clearer grows my better fortune i resolve to think for do you know lucrezia as god lives said one day agnolo his very self to raphael i have known it all these years when the young man was flaming out his thoughts upon a palace wall for rome to see too lifted up in heart because of it friend there's a certain sorry little scrub goes up and down our florence none cares how who were he set to plan and execute as you are pricked on by your popes and kings would bring the sweat into that brow of yours to raphael's and indeed the arm is wrong i hardly dare yet only you to see give the chalk here quick thus the line should go ay but the soul he's raphael rub it out still all i care for if he spoke the truth what he why who but michelagnolo do you forget already words like those if really there was such a chance so lost is whether you're not grateful but more pleased well let me think so and you smile indeed this hour has been an hour another smile if you would sit thus by me every night i should work better do you comprehend i mean that i should earn more give you more see it is settled dusk now there's a star morello's gone the watch-lights show the wall the cue-owls speak the name we call them by 
come from the window love come in at last inside the melancholy little house we built to be so gay with god is just king francis may forgive me oft at nights when i look up from painting eyes tired out the walls become illumined brick from brick distinct instead of mortar fierce bright gold that gold of his i did cement them with let us but love each other must you go that cousin here again he waits outside must see you you and not with me those loans more gaming debts to pay you smiled for that well let smiles buy me have you more to spend while hand and eye and something of a heart are left me works my ware and what's it worth i'll pay my fancy only let me sit the gray remainder of the evening out idle you call it and muse perfectly how i could paint were i but back in france one picture just one more the virgin's face not yours this time i want you at my side to hear them that is michelagnolo judge all i do and tell you of its worth will you to-morrow satisfy your friend i take the subjects for his corridor finish the portrait out of hand there there and throw him in another thing or two if he demurs the whole should prove enough to pay for the same cousin's freak beside what's better and what's all i care about get you the thirteen scudi for the rough love does that please you ah but what does he the cousin what does he to please you more i am grown peaceful as old age to-night i regret little i would change still less since there my past life lies why alter it the very wrong to francis it is true i took his coin was tempted and complied and built this house and sinned and all is said my father and my mother died of want well had i riches of my own you see how one gets rich let each one bear his lot they were born poor lived poor and poor they died and i have labored somewhat in my time and not been paid profusely some good son paint my two hundred pictures let him try no doubt there's something strikes a balance yes you loved me quite enough it seems to-night this must suffice me here what would one have in heaven perhaps new chances one more chance four great walls in the new jerusalem meted on each side by the angel's reed for leonard raphael agnolo and me to cover the three first without a wife while i have mine so still they overcome because there's still lucrezia as i choose again the cousins whistle go my love End of section 29section thirty of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by bruce peary library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six section thirty selected poems by robert browning part one a toccata of galuppi's o oh, galuppi baldassaro this is very sad to find i can hardly misconceive you it would prove me deaf and blind but although i take your meaning tis with such a heavy mind have you come with your old music and here's all the good it brings what they lived once thus at venice where the merchants were the kings where st mark's is where the doges used to wed the sea with rings ay because the sea's the street there and tis arched by what you call shylock's bridge with houses on it where they kept the carnival 
i was never out of england it's as if i saw it all did young people take their pleasure when the sea was warm in may balls and masks begun at midnight burning ever to midday when they made up fresh adventures for the morrow do you say was a lady such a lady cheeks so round and lips so red on her neck the small face buoyant like a bell-flower on its bed or the breast superb abundance where a man might base his head well and it was graceful of them they'd break talk off and afford she to bite her mask's black velvet he to finger on his sword while you sat and played toccatas stately at the clavichord what those lesser thirds so plaintive sixths diminished sigh on sigh told them something those suspensions those solutions must we die those commiserating sevenths life might last we can but try were you happy yes and are you still as happy yes and you then more kisses did i stop them when a million seemed so few hark the dominant's persistence till it must be answered to so an octave struck the answer oh they praised you i dare say brave galuppi that was music good alike at grave and gay i can always leave off talking when i hear a master play then they left you for their pleasure till in due time one by one some with lives that came to nothing some with deeds as well undone death stepped tacitly and took them where they never see the sun but when i sit down to reason think to take my stand nor swerve while i triumph o'er a secret wrung from nature's close reserve in you come with your cold music till i creep through every nerve yes you like a ghostly cricket creaking where a house was burned dust and ashes dead and done with venice spent what venice earned the soul doubtless is immortal where a soul can be discerned yours for instance you know physics something of geology mathematics are your pastime souls shall rise in their degree butterflies may dread extinction you'll not die it cannot be as for venice and her people merely born to bloom and drop here on earth they bore their fruitage mirth and folly were the crop what of soul was left i wonder when the kissing had to stop dust and ashes so you creak it and i want the heart to scold dear dead women with such hair too what's become of all the gold used to hang and brush their bosoms i feel chilly and grown old confessions what is he buzzing in my ears now that i come to die do i view the world as a veil of tears ah reverend sir not i what i viewed there once what i viewed again where the physic bottles stand on the table's edge is a suburb lane with a wall to my bedside hand that lane sloped much as the bottles do from a house you could descry o'er the garden wall is the curtain blue or green to a healthy eye to mine it serves for the old june weather blue above lane and wall and that farthest bottle labelled ether is the house or topping all at a terrace somewhat near the stopper there watched for me one june a girl i know sir it's improper my poor mind's out of tune only there was a way you crept close by the side to dodge eyes in the house two eyes except they styled their house the lodge what right had a lounger up their lane but by creeping very close with the good wall's help their eyes might strain and stretch themselves to o's yet never catch her and me together as she left the attic there by the rim of the bottle labelled ether and stole from stair to stair and stood by the rose-wreathed gate 
alas we loved sir used to meet how sad and bad and mad it was but then how it was sweet love among the ruins where the quiet colored end of evening smiles miles and miles on the solitary pastures where our sheep half asleep tinkle homeward through the twilight stray or stop as they crop was the sight once of a city great and gay so they say of our country's very capital its prince ages since held his court in gathered councils wielding far peace or war now the country does not even boast a tree as you see to distinguish slopes of verdure certain rills from the hills intersect and give a name to else they run into one where the domed and daring palace shot in spires up like fires or the hundred gated circuit of a wall bounding all made of marble men might march on nor be pressed twelve abreast and such plenty and perfection see of grass never was such a carpet as this summer-time o'er spreads and embeds every vestige of the city guessed alone stock or stone where a multitude of men breathed joy and woe long ago lust of glory pricked their hearts up dread of shame struck them tame and that glory and that shame alike the gold bought and sold now the single little turret that remains on the plains by the caper overrooted by the gourd overscored while the patching house leek's head of blossom winks through the chinks marks the basement whence a tower in ancient time sprang sublime and a burning ring all round the chariots traced as they raced and the monarch and his minions and his dames viewed the games and i know while thus the quiet colored eve smiles to leave to their folding all our many tinkling fleece in such peace and the slopes and rills in undistinguished gray melt away that a girl with eager eyes and yellow hair waits me there in the turret whence the charioteers caught soul for the goal when the king looked where she looks now breathless dumb till i come but he looked upon the city every side far and wide all the mountains topped with temples all the glades colonnades all the causes bridges aqueducts and then all the men when i do come she will speak not she will stand either hand on my shoulder give her eyes the first embrace of my face ere we rush ere we extinguish sight and speech each on each in one year they sent a million fighters forth south and north and they built their gods a brazen pillar high as the sky yet reserved a thousand chariots in full force gold of course o oh, heart o oh, blood that freezes blood that burns earth's returns for whole centuries of folly noise and sin shut them in with their triumphs and their glories and the rest love is best a grammarian's funeral shortly after the revival of learning in europe let us begin and carry up this corpse singing together leave we the common crofts the vulgar thorps each in its tether sleeping safe in the bosom of the plain cared for till cock crow look out if yonder be not day again rimming the rock row that's the appropriate country there man's thought rarer intenser self-gathered for an outbreak as it ought chafes in the censer leave we the unlettered plain its herd and crop seek we sepulture on a tall mountain sitted to the top crowded with culture all the peaks soar but one the rest excels clouds overcome it no yonder sparkle is the citadels circling its summit thither our path lies wind we up the heights wait ye the warning 
our low life was the levels and the nights he's for the morning step to a tune square chests erect each head where the beholders this is our master famous calm and dead born on our shoulders sleep crop and herd sleep darkling thorpe and croft safe from the weather he whom we convoy to his grave aloft singing together he was a man born with thy face and throat lyric apollo long he lived nameless how should spring take note winter would follow till lo the little touch and youth was gone cramped and diminished moaned he new measures other feet anon my dance is finished no that's the world's way keep the mountainside make for the city he knew the signal and stepped on with pride over men's pity left play for work and grappled with the world bent on escaping what's in the scroll quoth he thou keepest furled show me their shaping theirs who most studied man the bard and sage give so he gowned him straight got by heart that book to its last page learned we found him yea but we found him bald too eyes like lead accents uncertain time to taste life another would have said up with the curtain this man said rather actual life comes next patience a moment grant i have mastered learning's crabbed text still there's the comment let me know all prate not of most or least painful or easy even to the crumbs i'd fain eat up the feast ay nor feel queasy oh such a life as he resolved to live when he had learned it when he had gathered all books had to give sooner he spurned it image the whole then execute the parts fancy the fabric quite ere you build ere steel strike fire from quartz ere mortar dab brick here's the town gate reached there's the market-place gaping before us yea this in him was the peculiar grace hearten our chorus that before living he'd learn how to live no end to learning earn the means first god surely will contrive use for our earning others mistrust and say but time escapes live now or never he said what's time leave now for dogs and apes man has forever back to his book then deeper drooped his head calculus racked him leaden before his eyes grew dross of lead tussus attacked him now master take a little rest not he caution redoubled step to abreast the way winds narrowly not a whit troubled back to his studies fresher than at first fierce as a dragon he soul hydroptic with a sacred thirst sucked at the flagon oh if we draw a circle premature heedless of far gain greedy for quick returns of profit sure bad is our bargain was it not great did not he throw on god he loves the burthen god's task to make the heavenly period perfect the earthen did not he magnify the mind show clear just what it all meant he would not discount life as fools do here paid by instalment he ventured neck or nothing heaven's success found or earth's failure wilt thou trust death or not he answered yes hence with life's pale lure that low man seeks a little thing to do sees it and does it this high man with a great thing to pursue dies ere he knows it that low man goes on adding one to one his hundreds soon hit this high man aiming at a million misses an unit that has the world here should he need the next let the world mind him this throws himself on god and unperplexed seeking shall find him 
so with the throttling hands of death at strife ground he at grammar still through the rattle parts of speech were rife while he could stammer he settled hoti's business let it be properly based aoun gave us the doctrine of the enclitic d dead from the waist down well here's the platform here's the proper place hail to your purlieus all ye high flyers of the feathered race swallows and curlews here's the top peak the multitude below live for they can there this man decided not to live but no bury this man there here here's his place where meteors shoot clouds form lightnings are loosened stars come and go let joy break with the storm peace let the dew send lofty designs must close in like effects loftily lying leave him still loftier than the world suspects living and dying my last duchess ferrara that's my last duchess painted on the wall looking as if she were alive i call that piece a wonder now fra pandolf's hands worked busily a day and there she stands will it please you sit and look at her i said fra pandolf by design for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance the depth and passion of its earnest glance but to myself they turned since none puts by the curtain i have drawn for you but i and seemed as they would ask me if they durst how such a glance came there so not the first are you to turn and ask thus sir twas not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the duchess cheek perhaps fra pandolf chanced to say her mantle laps over my lady's wrists too much or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat such stuff was courtesy she thought and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy she had a heart how shall i say too soon made glad too easily impressed she liked whate'er she looked on and her looks went everywhere sir twas all one my favour at her breast the dropping of the daylight in the west the bough of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her the white mule she rode with round the terrace all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least she thanked men good but thanked somehow i know not how as if she ranked my gift of a nine hundred years old name with anybody's gift who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling even had you skill in speech which i have not to make your will quite clear to such an one and say just this or that in you disgusts me here you miss or there exceed the mark and if she let herself be lessened so nor plainly set her wits to yours for sooth and made excuse e'en then would be some stooping and i choose never to stoop oh sir she smiled no doubt whene'er i passed her but who passed without much the same smile this grew i gave commands then all smiles stopped together there she stands as if alive will it please you rise we'll meet the company below then i repeat the count your master's known munificence is ample warrant that no just pretence of mine for dowry will be disallowed though his fair daughter's self as i avowed at starting is my object nay we'll go together down sir notice neptune though taming a sea-horse thought a rarity which klaus of innsbruck cast in bronze for me up at a villa down in the city as distinguished by an italian person of quality had i but plenty of money money enough and to spare 
the house for me no doubt were a house in the city square ah such a life such a life as one leads at the window there something to see by bacchus something to hear at least there the whole day long one's life is a perfect feast while up at a villa one lives i maintain it no more than a beast well now look at our villa stuck like the horn of a bull just on a mountain edge as bare as the creature's skull save a mere shag of a bush with hardly a leaf to pull scratch my own sometimes to see if the hair is turned wool but the city oh the city the square with the houses why they are stone-faced white as a curd there's something to take the eye houses in four straight lines not a single front awry you watch who crosses and gossips who saunters who hurries by green blinds as a matter of course to draw when the sun gets high and the shops with fanciful signs which are painted properly what of a villa though winter be over in march by rights tis may perhaps ere the snow shall have withered well off the heights you've the brown ploughed land before where the oxen steam and wheeze and the hills over smoked behind by the faint gray olive trees is it better in may i ask you you've summer all at once in a day he leaps complete with a few strong april suns mid the sharp short emerald wheat scarce risen three fingers well the wild tulip at end of its tube blows out its great red bell like a thin clear bubble of blood for the children to pick and sell is it ever hot in the square there's a fountain to spout and splash in the shade it sings and springs in the shine such foam bows flash on the horses with curling fish-tails that prance and paddle and pash round the lady atop in her conch fifty gazers do not abash though all that she wears is some weeds round her waist in a sort of sash all the year long at the villa nothing to see though you linger except yon cypress that points like death's lean lifted forefinger some think fireflies pretty when they mix in the corn and mingle or thrid the stinking hemp till the stalks of it seem a tingle late august or early september the stunning cicala is shrill and the bees keep their tiresome whine round the resinous firs on the hill enough of the seasons i spare you the months of the fever and chill ere you open your eyes in the city the blessed church bells begin no sooner the bells leave off than the diligence rattles in you get the pick of the news and it costs you never a pin by and by there's the travelling doctor gives pills lets blood draws teeth or the pulchinella trumpet breaks up the market beneath at the post office such a scene picture the new play piping hot and a notice how only this morning three liberal thieves were shot above it behold the archbishop's most fatherly of rebukes and beneath with his crown and his lion some little new law of the duke's or a sonnet with flowery marge to the reverend don so-and-so who is dante boccaccio petrarca st jerome and cicero and moreover the sonnet goes rhyming the skirts of st paul has reached having preached us those six lent lectures more unctuous than ever he preached noon strikes here sweeps the procession our lady born smiling and smart with a pink gauze gown all spangles and seven swords stuck in her heart bang wang wang goes the drum tootle te tootle the fife no keeping one's haunches still it's the greatest pleasure in life but bless you it's dear it's dear fowls wine at double the rate they have clapped a new tax upon salt and what oil pays passing the gate it's a horror to think of and so the villa for me not the city beggars can scarcely be choosers but still ah the pity the pity look two and two go the priests then the monks with cowls and sandals 
and then penitents dressed in white shirts a holding the yellow candles one he carries a flag up straight and another a cross with handles and the duke's guard brings up the rear for the better prevention of scandals bang wang wang goes the drum tootlety tootle the fife oh a day in the city square there is no such pleasure in life End of section thirty. Section thirty one of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume six. Section thirty one. Selected Poems by Robert Browning. Part two in three days so i shall see her in three days and just one night but nights are short then two long hours and that is morn see how i come unchanged unworn feel where my life broke off from thine how fresh the splinters keep and fine only a touch and we combine too long this time of year the days but nights at least the nights are short as night shows where her one moon is a hand's breadth of pure light and bliss so life's night gives my lady birth and my eyes hold her what is worth the rest of heaven the rest of earth o oh, loaded curls release your store of warmth and scent as once before the tingling hair did lights and darks outbreaking into fairy sparks when under curl and curl i pried after the warmth and scent inside through lights and darks how manifold the dark inspired the light controlled as early art embrowned the gold what great fear should one say three days that change the world might change as well your fortune and if joy delays be happy that no worse befell what small fear if another says three days and one short night beside may throw no shadow on your ways but years must teem with change untried with chance not easily defied with an end somewhere undescried no fear or if a fear be born this minute it dies out in scorn fear i shall see her in three days and one night now the nights are short then just two hours and that is morn in a year never any more while i live need i hope to see his face as before once his love grown chill mine may strive bitterly we re-embrace single still was it something said something done vexed him was it touch of hand turn of head strange that very way love begun i as little understand love's decay when i sewed or drew i recall how he looked as if i sung sweetly too if i spoke a word first of all up his cheek the color sprung then he heard sitting by my side at my feet so he breathed but ere i breathed satisfied i too at love's brim touched the sweet i would die if death bequeathed sweet to him speak i love thee best he exclaimed let thy love my own foretell i confessed clasp my heart on thine now unblamed since upon thy soul as well hangeth mine was it wrong to own being truth why should all the giving prove his alone i had wealth and ease beauty youth since my lover gave me love i gave these that was all i meant to be just and the passion i had raised to content since he chose to change gold for dust if i gave him what he praised was it strange would he loved me yet on and on while i found some way undreamed paid my debt gave more life and more till all gone he should smile she never seemed mine before what she felt the while must i think love so different with us men he should smile dying for my sake white and pink 
can't we touch these bubbles then but they break dear the pang is brief do thy part have thy pleasure how perplexed grows belief well this cold clay clod was man's heart crumble it and what comes next is it god evelyn hope beautiful evelyn hope is dead sit and watch by her side an hour that is her bookshelf this her bed she plucked that piece of geranium flower beginning to die too in the glass little has yet been changed i think the shutters are shut no light may pass save two long rays through the hinges chink sixteen years old when she died perhaps she had scarcely heard my name it was not her time to love beside her life had many a hope and aim duties enough and little cares and now was quiet now astir till god's hand beckoned unawares and the sweet white brow is all of her is it too late then evelyn hope what your soul was pure and true the good stars met in your horoscope made you of spirit fire and dew and just because i was thrice as old and our paths in the world diverged so wide each was not to each must i be told we were fellow mortals not beside no indeed for god above is great to grant as mighty to make and creates the love to reward the love i claim you still for my own love's sake delayed it may be for more lives yet through worlds i shall traverse not a few much is to learn much to forget ere the time be come for taking you but the time will come at last it will when evelyn hope what meant i shall say in the lower earth in the years long still that body and soul so pure and gay why your hair was amber i shall divine and your mouth of your own geraniums red and what would you do with me in fine in the new life come in the old one's stead i have lived i shall say so much since then given up myself so many times gained me the gains of various men ransacked the ages spoiled the climes yet one thing one in my soul's full scope either i missed or itself missed me and i want and find you evelyn hope what is the issue let us see i loved you evelyn all the while my heart seemed full as it could hold there was place and to spare for the frank young smile and the red young mouth and the hair's young gold so hush i will give you this leaf to keep see i shut it inside the sweet cold hand there that is our secret go to sleep you will wake and remember and understand prospice fear death to feel the fog in my throat the mist in my face when the snows begin and the blasts denote i am nearing the place the power of the night the press of the storm the post of the foe where he stands the arch fear in a visible form yet the strong man must go for the journey is done and the summit attained and the barriers fall though a battle's to fight ere the guerdon be gained the reward of it all i was ever a fighter so one fight more the best and the last i would hate that death bandaged my eyes and forbore and bade me creep past no let me taste the whole of it fare like my peers the heroes of old bear the brunt in a minute pay glad life's arrears of pain darkness and cold for sudden the worst turns the best to the brave the black minutes at end and the elements rage the fiend voices that rave shall dwindle shall blend shall change shall become first a peace out of pain then a light then thy breast o thou soul of my soul i shall clasp thee again and with god be the rest 
the patriot an old story it was roses roses all the way with myrtle mixed in my path like mad the house roofs seemed to heave and sway the church spires flamed such flags they had a year ago on this very day the air broke into a mist with bells the old walls rocked with the crowd and cries had i said good folk mere noise repels but give me your son from yonder skies they had answered and afterward what else alack it was i who leaped at the sun to give it my loving friends to keep not man could do have i left undone and you see my harvest what i reap this very day now a year is run there's nobody on the housetops now just a palsied few at the windows set for the best of the sight is all allow at the shambles gate or better yet by the very scaffold's foot i trow i go in the rain and more than needs a rope cuts both my wrists behind and i think by the feel my forehead bleeds for they fling whoever has a mind stones at me for my years misdeeds thus i entered and thus i go in triumphs people have dropped down dead paid by the world what dost thou owe me god might question now instead tis god shall repay i am safer so one word more to e b b london september eighteen fifty five there they are my fifty men and women naming me the fifty poems finished take them love the book and me together where the heart lies let the brain lie also raphael made a century of sonnets made and wrote them in a certain volume dinted with the silver-pointed pencil else he only used to draw madonnas these the world might view but one the volume who that one you ask your heart instructs you did she live and love it all her lifetime did she drop his lady of the sonnets die and let it drop beside her pillow where it lay in place of raphael's glory raphael's cheek so duteous and so loving cheek the world was wont to hail a painter's raphael's cheek her love had turned a poet's you and i would rather read that volume taken to his beating bosom by it lean and list the bosom beats of raphael would we not than wonder at madonna's her san sisto names and her foligno her that visits florence in a vision her that's left with lilies in the louvre seen by us and all the world in circle you and i will never read that volume guido reni like his own eyes apple guarded long the treasure book and loved it guido reni dying all bologna cried and the world cried too ours the treasure suddenly as rare things will it vanished dante once prepared to paint an angel whom to please you whisper beatrice while he mused and traced it and retraced it peradventure with a pen corroded still by drops of that hot ink he dipped for when his left hand i the hair of the wicked back he held the brow and pricked its stigma bit into the live man's flesh for parchment loosed him laughed to see the writing rankle let the wretch go festering through florence dante who loved well because he hated hated wickedness that hinders loving dante standing studying his angel in there broke the folk of his inferno says he certain people of importance such he gave his daily dreadful line to entered and would seize forsooth the poet says the poet then i stopped my painting you and i would rather see that angel painted by the tenderness of dante would we not than read a fresh inferno you and i will never see that picture while he mused on love and beatrice while he softened o'er his outlined angel in they broke these people of importance 
we and Beecha bear the loss forever. What of Raphael's sonnets, Dante's picture? This. No artist lives and loves that longs not once and only once, and for one only, ah, the prize, to find his love a language, fit and fair and simple and sufficient, using nature that's an art to others, not this one time art that's turned his nature. Ay, of all the artists living, loving, none but would forego his proper dowry. Does he paint? He fain would write a poem. Does he write? He fain would paint a picture. Put to proof art alien to the artists, once, and only once, and for one only. So to be the man, and leave the artist, gain the man's joy, miss the artist's sorrow. Wherefore? Heaven's gift takes earth's abatement. He who smites the rock and spreads the water, bidding drink and live a crowd beneath him, even he the minute makes immortal, proves, perchance, but mortal in the minute, desecrates belike the deed in doing. While he smites, how can he but remember so he smote before in such a peril, when they stood and mocked? Shall smiting help us? When they drank and sneered, a stroke is easy when they wiped their mouths and went their journey throwing him for thanks but drought was pleasant thus old memories mar the actual triumph thus the doing savours of disrelish thus achievement lacks a gracious somewhat over importuned brows becloud the mandate carelessness or consciousness the gesture for he bears an ancient wrong about him, sees and knows again those phalanxed faces, hears yet one time more the customed prelude. How shouldst thou of all men smite and save us? Guesses what is like to prove the sequel. Egypt's flesh-pots, nay, the drought was better. Oh, the crowd must have emphatic warrant there's the sinai forehead's cloven brilliance right arm's rod sweep tongue's imperial fiat never dares the man put off the prophet did he love one face from out the thousands were she jethro's daughter white and wifely were she but the ethiopian bond-slave he would envy yon dumb patient camel keeping a reserve of scanty water meant to save his own life in the desert ready in the desert to deliver kneeling down to let his breast be opened hoard and life together for his mistress i shall never in the years remaining paint you pictures no nor carve you statues make you music that should all express me so it seems i stand on my attainment this of verse alone one life allows me verse and nothing else have i to give you other heights in other lives god willing all the gifts from all the heights your own love yet a semblance of resource avails us shade so finely touched love's sense must seize it take these lines look lovingly and nearly lines i write the first time and the last time he who works in fresco steals a hair-brush curbs the liberal hand subservient proudly cramps his spirit crowds its all in little makes a strange art of an art familiar fills his lady's missal marge with flowerets he who blows through bronze may breathe through silver fitly serenade a slumbrous princess he who writes may write for once as i do love you saw me gather men and women live or dead or fashioned by my fancy enter each and all and use their service speak from every mouth the speech a poem hardly shall i tell my joys and sorrows hopes and fears belief and disbelieving i am mine and yours the rest be all men's karshish cleon norbert and the fifty let me speak this once in my true person not as lippo roland or andrea though the fruit of speech be just this sentence 
pray you look on these my men and women take and keep my fifty poems finished where my heart lies let my brain lie also poor the speech be how i speak for all things not but that you know me lo the moon's self here in london yonder late in florence still we find her face the thrice transfigured curving on a sky imbrued with colour drifted over fiesole by twilight came she our new crescent of a hair's breadth full she flared it lamping samignato rounder twixt the cypresses and rounder perfect till the nightingales applauded now a piece of her old self impoverished hard to greet she traverses the house roofs hurries with unhandsome thrift of silver goes dispiritedly glad to finish what there's nothing in the moon noteworthy nay for if that moon could love a mortal used to charm him so to fit a fancy all her magic tis the old sweet mythos she would turn a new side to her mortal side unseen of herdsman huntsman steersman blank to zoroaster on his terrace blind to galileo on his turret dumb to homer dumb to keats him even think the wonder of the moonstruck mortal when she turns round comes again in heaven opens out anew for worse or better proves she like some portent of an iceberg swimming full upon the ship it founders hungry with huge teeth of splintered crystals proves she as the paved work of a sapphire seen by moses when he climbed the mountain moses aaron nadab and abihu climbed and saw the very god the highest stand upon the paved work of a sapphire like the bodied heaven in his clearness shone the stone the sapphire of that paved work when they ate and drank and saw god also what were seen none knows none ever shall know only this is sure the sight were other not the moon's same side born late in florence dying now impoverished here in london god be thanked the meanest of his creatures boasts two soul sides one to face the world with one to show a woman when he loves her this i say of me but think of you love this to you yourself my moon of poets ah but that's the world's side there's the wonder thus they see you praise you think they know you there in turn i stand with them and praise you out of my own self i dare to phrase it but the best is when i glide from out them cross a step or two of dubious twilight come out on the other side the novel silent silver lights and darks undreamed of where i hush and bless myself with silence oh their raphael of the dear madonnas oh their dante of the dread inferno wrote one song and in my brain i sing it drew one angel born see on my bosom r b end of section thirty one section number thirty two of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume six by various authors section thirty two Orestes Augustus Brownson, eighteen o three to eighteen seventy six, by Charles Dudley Warner. Orestes Brownson, in his time, was a figure of striking originality and influence in American literature and American political, philosophical, and religious discussion. His career was an exceptional one for he was connected with some of the most important contemporaneous movements of thought and passed through several distinct phases presbyterianism universalism socialism of a mild and benevolent kind 
not to be confused with the later fiery and destructive socialism of the reds after sympathizing somewhat with the aims and tendencies of the new england transcendentalists a close intellectual associate of ralph waldo emerson then the apostle of a new christianity finally becoming a roman catholic coming of old connecticut stock on his father's side he was born in vermont september sixteenth eighteen o three and notwithstanding that he was brought up in poverty on a farm with small opportunity for education contrived in later years to make himself a thorough scholar in various directions mastering several languages acquiring a wide knowledge of history reading deeply in philosophy and developing marked originality in setting forth new philosophical views his bent in childhood was strongly religious and he even believed at that period of his life that he held long conversations with the sacred personages of holy scripture yet while in manhood he devoted many years and much of his energy to preaching his character was aggressive and his tone controversial he however revealed many traits of real gentleness and humility and the mixture of rugged strength and tenderness in his character and his work won him a large following in whatever position he took he performed the remarkable feat when the support of american letters was slight of founding and conducting almost single-handed from eighteen thirty eight to eighteen forty three his famous quarterly review which was a power in the land he started it again in eighteen forty four as brownson's quarterly review and resumed it thirty years later in still a third series he died in eighteen seventy six at detroit much of his active career having been passed in boston and some of his later years at seton hall new jersey his various changes of belief have often been taken as an index of vacillation but a simple and candid study of his writings shows that such changes were merely the normal progress of an intensely earnest and sincere mind which never hesitated to avow his honest convictions nor to admit its errors this is a quality which gives brownson his vitality as a mind and an author and he will be found to be consistent with conscience throughout his writings are forceful eloquent and lucid in style with a websterian massiveness that does not detract from their charm they fill twenty volumes divided into groups of essays on civilization controversy religion philosophy scientific theories and popular literature which cover a great and fascinating variety of topics in detail brownson was an intense and patriotic american and his national quality comes out strongly in his extended treatise the american republic eighteen sixty five the best known of his other works is a candid vigorous and engaging autobiography entitled the convert eighteen fifty three saint simonism from the convert if i drew my doctrine of union in part from the eclecticism of cousin i drew my views of the church and of the reorganization of the race from saint simonians a philosophico religious or a politico philosophical sect that sprung up in france under the restoration and figured largely for a year or two under the monarchy of july their founder was claude henry count de st simon a descendant of the du de st simon well known as the author of the memoirs he was born in seventeen sixty entered the army at the age of seventeen and the year after came to this country where he served with distinction in our revolutionary war under boulet after the peace of seventeen eighty three he devoted two years to the study of our people and institutions and then returned to france hardly had he returned before he found himself in the midst of the french revolution which he regarded as the practical application of the principles or theories adopted by the reformers of the sixteenth century 
and popularized by the philosophers of the eighteenth he looked upon that revolution we are told as having only a destructive mission necessary important but inadequate to the wants of humanity and instead of being carried away by it as were most of the young men of his age and his principles he set himself at work to amass materials for the erection of a new social edifice on the ruins of the old which should stand and improve in solidity strength grandeur and beauty for ever the way he seems to have taken to amass these materials was to engage with a partner in some grand speculations for the accumulation of wealth and speculations too it is said not of the most honourable or even the most honest character his plan succeeded for a time and he became very rich as did many others in those troubled times but he finally met with reverses and lost all but the wrecks of his fortune he then for a number of years plunged into all manner of vice and indulged to excess in every species of dissipation not we are told from love of vice any inordinate desire or any impure affection but for the holy purpose of preparing himself by his experience for the great work of redeeming man and securing for him a paradise on earth having gained all that experience could give him in the department of vice he then proceeded to consult the learned professors of l'ecole polytechnique for seven or ten years to make himself master of science literature and the fine arts in all their departments and to place himself at the level of the last attainments of the race thus qualified to be the founder of a new social organization he wrote several books in which he deposited the germs of his ideas or rather the germs of the future most of which have hitherto remained unpublished but now that he was so well qualified for his work he found himself a beggar and had as yet made only a single disciple he was reduced to despair and attempted to take his own life but failed the ball only grazed his sacred forehead his faithful disciple was near him saved him and aroused him into life and hope when he recovered he found that he had fallen into a gross error he had been a materialist an atheist and had discarded all religious ideas as long since outgrown by the human race he had proposed to organize the human race with materials furnished by the senses alone and by the aid of positive science he owns his fault and conceives and brings forth a new christianity consigned to a small pamphlet entitled nuevo christianisme which was immediately published this done his mission was ended and he died may nineteenth eighteen twenty five and i suppose was buried st simon the preacher of a new christianity very soon attracted disciples chiefly from the pupils of the polytechnic school ardent and lively young men full of enthusiasm brought up without faith in the gospel and yet unable to live without religion of some sort among the active members of the sect were at one time pierre leroux jules and michael chevalier lermenier and my personal friend dr poyen who initiated me and so many others in new england into the mysteries of animal magnetism dr poyen was i believe a native of the island of guadeloupe a man of more ability than he usually had credit for of solid learning genuine science and honest intentions i knew him well and esteemed him highly when i knew him his attachment to the new religion was much weakened and he often talked to me of the old church and assured me that he felt at times that he must return to her bosom i owed him many hints which turned my thoughts toward catholic principles and which with god's grace were of much service to me these and many others were in the sect whose chiefs after the death of its founder were bazard a liberal and practical man who killed himself and infantine who after the dissolution of the sect sought employment in the service of the viceroy of egypt 
and occupies now some important post in connection with the french railways the sect began in eighteen twenty six by addressing the working classes but their success was small in eighteen twenty nine they came out of their narrow circle assumed a bolder tone addressed themselves to the general public and became in less than eighteen months a parisian mode in eighteen thirty one they purchased the globe newspaper made it their organ and distributed gratuitously five thousand copies daily in eighteen thirty two they had established a central propagandism in paris and had their missionaries in most of the departments of france they attacked the hereditary peerage and it fell they seemed to be numerous and strong and i believed for a moment in their complete success they called their doctrine a religion their ministers priests and their organization a church and as such they claimed to be recognized by the state and to receive from it a subvention as other religious denominations did but the courts decided that saint simonism was not a religion and its ministers were not religious teachers this decision struck them with death their prestige vanished they scattered dissolved in thin air and went off as carlyle would say into endless vacuity as do sooner or later all shams and unrealities st simon himself who as presented to us by his disciples is a half myth personage seems so far as i can judge by those of his writings that i have seen to have been a man of large ability and laudable intentions but i have not been able to find any new or original thoughts of which he was the indisputable father his whole system if system he had is summed up in the two maxims eden is before us not behind us or the golden age of the poets is in the future not in the past and society ought to be so organized as to tend in the most rapid manner possible to the continuous moral intellectual and physical amelioration of the poorer and more numerous classes he simply adopts the doctrine of progress set forth with so much flash eloquence by condorcet and the philanthropic doctrine with regard to the laboring classes or the people defended by barbeuf and a large section of the french revolutionists his religion was not so much as the theophilanthropy attempted to be introduced by some members of the french directory it admitted god in name and in name did not deny jesus christ but it rejected all mysteries and reduced religion to mere socialism it conceded that catholicity had been the true church down to the pontificate of leo the tenth because down to that time its ministers had taken the lead in directing the intelligence and labors of mankind had aided the progress of civilization and promoted the well-being of the poorer and more numerous classes had leagued itself with the ruling orders and lent all its influence to uphold tyrants and tyranny a new church was needed a church which should realize the ideal of jesus christ and tend directly and constantly to the moral physical and social amelioration of the poorer and more numerous classes in other words the greatest happiness in this life of the greatest number the principle of jeremy bentham and his utilitarian school his disciples enlarged upon the hints of the master and attributed to him ideas which he never entertained they endeavored to reduce his hints to a complete system of religion philosophy and social organization their chiefs i have said were amand bazard and bartholome prosper and fontaine bazard took the lead in what related to the external political and economic organization and infantine in what regarded doctrine and worship the philosophy or theology of the sect or school was derived principally from hegel and was a refined pantheism its christology was the unity 
not union of the divine and human and the incarnation symbolized the unity of god and man or the divinity manifesting himself in humanity and making humanity substantially divine the very doctrine in reality which i myself had embraced even before i had heard of the saint simonians if not before they had published it the religious organization was founded on the doctrine of the progressive nature of man and the maxim that all institutions should tend in the most speedy and direct manner possible to the constant amelioration of the moral intellectual and physical condition of the poorer and more numerous classes socially men were to be divided into three classes artists savants and industrialists or working men corresponding to the psychological division of the human faculties the soul has three powers or faculties to love to know and to act those in whom the love faculty is predominant belong to the class of artists those in whom the knowledge faculty is predominant belong to the class of savants the scientific and the learned and in fine those in whom the act faculty predominates belong to the industrial class this classification places every man in the social category for which he is fitted and to which he is attracted by his nature these several classes are to be hierarchically organized under chiefs or priests who are respectively priests of the artists of the scientific and of the industrials and are priests and all to be subjected to a supreme father pari supreme and a supreme mother mere supreme the economical organization is to be based on the maxims to each according to his capacity and to each according to his work private property is to be retained but its transmission by inheritance or testamentary disposition must be abolished the property is to be held by a tenure resembling that of gavel kind it belongs to the community and the priests chiefs and brehons as the celtic tribes call them to distribute it for life to individuals and to each individual according to his capacity it was supposed that in this way the advantages of both common and individual property might be secured something of this prevailed originally in most nations and a reminiscence of it still exists in the village system among the slavonic tribes of russia and poland and nearly all jurists maintain that the testamentary right by which a man disposes of his goods after his natural death as well as that by which a child inherits from the parent is a municipal not a natural right the most striking feature of the st simonian scheme was the rank and position it assigned to woman it asserted the absolute equality of the sexes and maintained that either sex is incompatible without the other man is an incomplete individual without woman hence a religion a doctrine a social institution founded by one sex alone is incomplete and can never be adequate to the wants of the race or a definite order this idea was also entertained by francis wright and appears to be entertained by all our women's rights folk of either sex the old civilization was masculine not male and female as god made them hence its condemnation the saint simonians therefore proposed to place by the side of their sovereign father at the summit of their hierarchy a sovereign mother the man to be sovereign father they found but a woman to be sovereign mother mare supreme they found not this caused great embarrassment and a split between bazard and enfantine bazard was about to marry his daughter and he proposed to place her marriage under the protection of the existing french laws and fantine opposed his doing so and called it a sinful compliance with the prejudices of the world 
the st simonian society he maintained was a state a kingdom within itself and should be governed by its own laws and its own chiefs without any recognition of those without bazard persisted and had the marriage of his daughter solemnized in a legal manner and for aught i know according to the rites of the church a great scandal followed bazard charged enfantine with denying christian marriage and withholding loose notions on the subject enfantine replied that he neither denied nor affirmed christian marriage that in enacting the existing laws on the subject man alone had been consulted and he could not recognize it as law till woman had given her consent to it as yet the society was only provisionally organized inasmuch as they had not yet found the mere supreme the law on marriage must emanate conjointly from the supreme father and the supreme mother and it would be irregular and a usurpation of the supreme father to undertake alone to legislate on the subject bazard would not submit and went out and shot himself most of the politicians abandoned the association and Pierre and fantine almost in despair dispatched twelve apostles to constantinople to find in the turkish harems the supreme mother after a year they returned and reported that they were unable to find her and the society condemned by the french courts as immoral broke up and broke up because no woman could be found to be its mother and so they ended having risen flourished and decayed in less than a single decade the points in the st simonian movement that attracted my attention and commanded my belief were what it will seem strange to my readers could ever have been doubted its assertion of a religious future for the human race and that religion in the future as well as in the past must have an organization and a hierarchical organization its classification of men according to the predominant psychological faculty in each into artists savants and industrials struck me as very well and the maxims to each according to his capacity and to each according to its works as evidently just and desirable if practicable the doctrine of the divinity in humanity of progress of no essential antagonism between the spiritual and the material and of the duty of shaping all institutions for the speediest and continuous moral intellectual and physical amelioration of the poorer and more numerous classes i already held i was rather pleased than otherwise with the doctrine with regard to property and thought it a decided improvement on that of a community of goods the doctrine with regard to the relation of the sexes i rather acquiesced in than approved i was disposed to maintain as the indian said that woman is the weaker canoe and to assert my marital prerogatives but the equality of the sexes was asserted by nearly all my friends and i remained generally silent on the subject till some of the admirers of harriet martineau and margaret fuller began to scorn equality and to claim for woman superiority then i became roused and ventured to assert my masculine dignity it is remarkable that most reformers find fault with the christian law of marriage and propose to alter the relations which god has established both in nature and the gospel between the sexes and this is generally the rock on which they split women do not usually admire men who cast off their manhood or are unconscious of the rights and prerogatives of the stronger sex and they admire just as little those strong-minded women who strive to excel only in the masculine virtues i have never been persuaded that it argues well for a people when its women are men and its men women yet i trust i always honored and always shall honor woman i raise no question as to woman's equality or inequality with man for comparisons cannot be made between things not of the same kind woman's 
sphere and office in life are as high as holy as important as man's but different and the glory of both man and woman is for each to act well the part assigned to each by almighty god the saint simonian writings made me familiar with the idea of a hierarchy and removed from my mind the prejudices against the papacy generally entertained by my countrymen their proposed organization i saw might be good and desirable if their priests their supreme father and mother could really be the wisest the best not merely the nominal but the real chiefs of society yet what security have i that they will be their power was to have no limit save their own wisdom and love but who would answer for it that these would always be an effectual limit how were these priests or chiefs to be designated and installed in their office by popular election but popular election often passes over the proper man and takes the improper then as to the assignment to each man of a capital proportioned to his capacity to begin life with what certainty is there that the rules of strict right will be followed that wrong will not often be done both voluntarily and involuntarily are your chiefs to be infallible and impeccable still the movement interested me and many of its principles took firm hold of me and held me for several years in a species of mental thraldom insomuch that i found it difficult if not impossible either to refute them or to harmonize them with other principles which i also held or rather which held me and in which i detected no unsoundness yet i imbibed no errors from the st simonians and i can say of them as of the unitarians they did me no harm but were in my fallen state the occasion of much good to me End of section 32